What's up guys? It's your boy Omnis Sensei. Welcome to Star Wars. Reborn as Anakin Skywalker. Part 9. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. The daughter fell unconscious, leaving Anakin to take care of the bodies. But the father was still alive and kicking, not fully dead yet with life force still within him, making Anakin set towards him, with his daughter within his arms. I owe you. The father was struggling. Don't worry. I think I am forced to take care of her now. Anakin replied, seeing that the man was still going. You must leave. It would seem that the father had no ill will and instead seemed to focus more on the fact that this place would probably be destroyed. The girls back with Jabitha had in fact gotten all they needed by being here, for they experienced things within themselves that would help them all confront some inner demons. For Anakin, he had also benefited as well. But the girl's journey may just be starting now someone in particular, Padme, was going through. Some would say as character development comparative to the others. I can't leave just yet. There are still some more interesting things for me to uncover here. Anakin said, I can make it painless. Easy and simple. I can take your life here. Anakin gave his offer, for he disliked seeing the old man suffering. You careful of what your heart, yes. I know. I am well aware of things to come and know very well I am supposed to do. Don't worry, for I shall still complete the will of the Force, for it did help me come into this world. For that, I am willing to help it out with its small problem. Anakin replied while slinging the daughter onto his back, so he could reach down towards the father. I may not be able to save your life, but know that everything will be alright. Anakin could supercharge him with life force, but he doubts that is what the old man wants. Thank you. You have brought balance to this place through the death of my son, through the death of myself and through the alignment in my daughter. You have completed the prophecy. The father managed to gasp out painfully. Quiet now. Anakin then with a snap of his fingers, took the father's life forever allowing the man to rest in peace. Of course, he wasn't so cruel as to not allow the father and the son a chance to go back to the force. They had both been guided by Anakin, off of this planet, and into the energy field known as the Force, so that they may become one with the Force. Right now it is time to get a move on, Anakin thought to himself, as he took in the sight of what he had created. A utopia of sorts that would implode in on itself within an immeasurable but very short amount of time. It would have always come to an end, simply disappearing from the universe to never be seen again, meaning that this was a one-time trip. The amazing things seen here would not be seen again. That is unless Anakin has a say in it all, which he does, but it is sometimes better to let go of the past for one to move forward much easier. Feeling the daughter on his back, he thought to himself, how am I going to explain this? I never intended for this to happen. He sighed mentally, for he was probably going to be berated for brining along yet another girl, when truly he could have brought along so much more by now. He just didn't. What happened? Back where the girls were. Within Jabitha they had taken a back seat when all of this had happened. They had no idea what was going on. But they were not scared as of this moment, for this was something similar to what they are familiar with feeling through the Force. It was Anakin's doing. With everything becoming white, even the night and day cycles. Becoming messed up dirt or whatever was happening. Ahsoka and Padme had explained to everyone what this meant and possibly what's going on. But it didn't matter. Anakin had gotten what he wanted, and it was time to leave, but not before the girls all get what they need as well. While a transformation had taken place on the planet, it had not become so bare that nothing existed here anymore, and instead there was a few things that could still help everyone. I am back. Anakin called out from the cave, which lead to Jabitha starting up on her own, and coming outside of the cave to a good and proper view of the world, for it had become something new. The girls got out of the ship, surprised at the changes that had taken place, but even more so surprised at the person that Anakin was holding. Who is that? Isla was the first to question, and she thought internally to herself. I knew it. I knew it was for another woman. It isn't what it looks like. Anakin was kind of in a rough spot, for it was exactly what it looks like, and because of proximity, everyone here would be able to tell that she was connected to Anakin through a diet as well. How could they not know, when they could sense each other as well? I think it looks like and feels like what I thought would be happening. Isla glared at him, but otherwise didn't care too much, and the other girls were also frustrated. But again, it didn't matter much to them in this instance, since he had already gotten all of them, 
What was one more? Of course, they would try and monopolize Anakin for themselves, and make sure he doesn't keep going around and picking up strays. Well, her father and brother are dead now. So, Anakin tried to explain, but left it there for there was no explaining this. There was, but it wasn't like it would make it any better. And instead he looked at everyone, and could tell that they also held some interest in the events that had passed. Back on Coruscant, Sidious after taking care of Dooku, had decided that it was about time he dealt with the Separatists. He may have been wiser in keeping Tyrannus alive, but it was a plan move to remove the leadership of the Separatists, so that they would fall in line with what Sidious wants. My, 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 look what we have here. Sidious moved over to the ship Dooku was on, and would scour it himself, but he wasn't that sort of person. He was instead someone that got others to do his dirty work for him, and he hardly had to deal with things like this himself. Keeping his hands clean, he could avoid the responsibility of any of the failures that could happen in the case of him getting involved. One could say that this was a trait inherent or in combination with his training under Plagueis had brought to him, a trauma of sorts that ensured that if he ever did wrong, he would have flashbacks to any punishments he had received. You too, go in and search the ship. Sidious commanded his two new apprentices, Ferris Olin, now known as Darth Verdrit, and Jar Jar Binks, now known as Darth Imabas. Imabas and Verdrit would search everything within the ship, looking for anything that was of use. An example of such things, were the things that Dooku had that allowed for him to communicate with those that were considered his assassins. That is right, Sidious was fully intending to take whatever or whoever Dooku had under his command under his own, for he had fully forsaken the principal rule of two. Sidious held no care for traditions and things like that, because if it didn't benefit himself in some way, then he might as well get rid of it. The rule of two was not doing him any good in this instance, and instead it was restricting his ability to do anything. Master? The first to come out was Olin, seemingly out of breath as Sidious did encourage in fighting between his two new apprentices. He wanted them to hate each other, for even if he didn't care for the rule of two, he would still use it to his advantage. With having two apprentices, he will have them fight it out in the end, and then the winner will become his true and only real apprentice. Yes. What have you found? Sidious asked as he allowed Ferris to approach him. Here, master. A communication device. Imabiz is sorely lacking master, and I would suggest you have him killed. Verdrit was immediately wanting to kill off Imabiz because he got in the way of him doing things. Especially with how clumsy that stupid Gungan was. No, that is quite alright. His clumsiness serves Darth Imabiz well, for with it many would take him to be some idiot. Even if it is true, Sidious was not against verbal abuse and would do much more. Yes, master. Verdrit stepped back and instead got back onto one knee, bowing before Sidious, which only made Sidious all the more happier. Controlling and allowing these two to foster some amount of hatred for each other instead of himself was again allowing himself to wash his hands clean. It was a standard manipulation technique to blame another person for all of their worries or woes, when the person inflicting such pain was in fact the one at fault. But, when Sidious punishes Verdrit, he says it was all Imabuz's fault, and when Sidious had begun torturing Imabuz, he blamed it on the fault of Verdrit. Bask in the glory of how insidious Sidious is. Imabiz stepped out of the ship and seemed to have a scare across his right arm, a result of the scuffle that had happened within. Or it was the result of his clumsiness either way. It didn't matter for this would only fuel Imabiz's hate for Verdrit and vice versa. You two may go now. I have things to do myself. Sidious then started to leave these two knowing that anything could happen between the two. But he had trained them well enough to where they wouldn't start attacking each other when he was within the room, but once he was out, anything could happen. From what Sidious understood, however, was that the two had some level of mutual understanding between the two of them, allowing Sidious to keep an eye on the two. He wanted to pit them against each other, not have them become friends, and then turn on him, the both of them. That would be disastrous, and instead he would even make up things to torture the both of them without preamble. Now I can finally start moving things along Sidious thought to himself as he held up the communication device. Speaking into it, Sidious probes for who this could connect to. He wants to first contact the assassins under Tyrannus and transfer their command to himself. Hello, he speaks, but there is no reply, which could mean anything, but he decides that if they shall not answer him, then he shall move on and try again some other time. Next it to start contacting all of the people within the separatists movement and to secretly make deals, whether this be through the use of money or other things. Hello, I would like to discuss. And he would do so without any trouble to himself, first brining everyone under himself, but he would only speak now. Later on he would need to create several proxies for the real things, instead of exposing himself. He had set up a meeting with the separatists, and they all knew about it and had even accepted, due to Dooku's input on the manor. Thus making the process all the more easier for himself to change the minds of all of these people, greedy, 
greedy and indulgent wastrels that waste their time on a fight that they were cornered into. Fasidius is the true mastermind behind everything, but if he revealed that, then it would only backfire on him once he brings them to the negotiation table. They would all accept readily, and without trying to go against what he is offering, for the things he offered under the table as another person, would more than make up for it. WH where am I? The daughter woke up within an unfamiliar space. She had gone through a change during the process of merging with the energies from the one Anakin had inserted into her. You're finally awake. A voice spoke to her, and the daughter saw someone that was sitting down just next to her. She was beautiful, or at least as such, because her own beauty standards were kind of skewered, due to living alone for such a long time. She only had herself, her father and her brother to gain an accurate depiction of beauty, and she didn't even think about these things before, because that was just the way she is, or that is how she was until Anakin had come, and now she was becoming more and more self-conscious, specifically around Anakin, for she didn't want to embarrass herself around him. Where am I? The daughter questioned the person who was beside her. I think some proper introductions are in order. My name is Barris Skywalker. Barris just couldn't avoid adding the last name when introducing herself, even when just saying her first name was all someone needed. Skywalker? So you are the Chosen One's wife? The daughter seemed oddly upset, but at the same time out of it, considering that she knew of Padme, and of her being Anakin's wife as well. I am but one, Barris replied. But one? The daughter was confused, but she also felt physically weird as well. What is wrong with me? She didn't know and asked Barris, for she felt smaller than she was. I don't know what you are talking about. Anakin brought you here and you were completely the way you are now. Perhaps if you were a bit more accurate. Barris leaned in, so that the daughter knew that Barris didn't know what she was talking about. I I feel smaller. The daughter had the same clothing and everything else, even the same glowing nature that she had as well. Except instead of glowing all of the time it was more like the glow would come on and off. I don't know anything about becoming smaller, but you are also kind of like a flickering light as well. Barris gestured pointing out to the daughter all around the room they were in was flickering, not fast, but in a slow, methodical dimming, and then brightening of light. Oh the daughter was surprised, for this was most definitely not normal. Yeah. This has been happening for a few minutes now, Barris said looking around as the light within the room continued its display. How do I stop it? The daughter asked. But how the hell is Barris supposed to know? How am I supposed to know? I don't know by the way. Where is the chosen one? The daughter had to ask, her situation not really all that important for herself. And instead she was much more interested in what Anakin was doing in this moment. I suggest you focus on yourself for now, Barris replied. Anakin had gone along with the girls to head towards the well of the far side, for while Anakin had sucked the planet, that didn't mean it had become something the Force was unable to pass through anymore. Once it was gone, that was it, and he would rather everyone help him get everything he needs, but also at the same time use this place as something like a training ground. The only people to stay behind on Jabitha was Barris, the daughter and Isla, given that she was pregnant, and Anakin most definitely didn't want her doing anything too strenuous. Even though she would technically be able to still do things even in her current state, meaning that she wouldn't have to worry at all about the fetus of the child. Anakin was just being cautious, and Isla understood that, which is why she allowed herself to stay behind. And it wasn't like there was nothing to do here as well, for while Barris stayed behind with the daughter, because she was the most knowledgeable on force healing techniques other than Anakin, where the daughter would need to be checked on. I want to see how much I have shrunk. The daughter now seemed intent on focusing on herself now. Okay, I can do that. Barris got up and used a role purpose device that would allow her to do something like this. While height wasn't all that important in most things with medical procedure, it would still have something of importance to look at. More specifically things to do outside of the medical aspects, and may be important for other things. Let's see here the daughter lay on the bed completely and fully still while simultaneously emanating that light and at the same time having some inner thoughts to herself. She hadn't really caught up to the fact that her family had died by now, and while Anakin had told everyone on what had happened, he didn't tell anyone to lie to the daughter, should she ask, for she should know of the results of what has happened herself. You measure exactly at 1.9 meters. You are the exact same height as Anakin, Barris said, and this surprised the daughter for she most most certainly taller. There was no way she had just gotten shorter out of nowhere, and then it happened. Flashed of memories referring to the sight of Anakin ravaging the lands, and turning it into the landscape that it is now. White, frozen in time and grey, drab in appearance due to the lack of color that would either give it life or give it death for destruction and creation, was no longer something that existed here. There was nothing, nothing at all, 
Anakin had made sure to eliminate anything that may have spawned here as a result of the continued cycle between the daughter and the son with the father monitoring. Why? There is no telling if there would have been some freaky abomination waiting to exploit the galaxy at large. A super virus pump up by the force, maybe. The well of the dark side was a deep, magma-filled chasm located in the realm of Mortis, where the dark side of the force was channeled. Deep within the realm of Mortis existed the well of the dark side, a deep, magma-filled chasm where the dark side of the force was channeled. Directly below the well leading to the planet's surface sat an island into which was carved an ancient symbol representing the dark side. Magma, or lava, was dangerous fluid, molten rock, often emanating from volcanoes. Lava was extremely hot at thousands of degrees, but when it stopped flowing, the substance cooled and hardened, eventually forming obsidian or dark lava sand. It could also form basalt. Is this Minecraft? Anakin thought to himself as he stood on the obsidian island that if taken from another perspective, it would look like a yin-yang symbol. The magma that used to be was no more, and instead of molten hot lava, orange and red, and most definitely not something safe to swim in, was being swam in by Ahsoka. Sighing, Anakin looked towards the silly apprentice and called out, Stop playing around there. We got to go soon. The lava was not of any color now, and it was like the energy had been sucked out of it, leading it to instantly harden, or at least it should have, but because of this location it did not. Instead it formed a unique pool of moving lava like sand that was lava, but also sand, that could be used to swim in. For it had all of the buoyancy of a liquid like water, while being not heavy at all. It was a strange substance without any really purpose within the universe. But right now it could be used however Anakin wanted. Molded and shaped into anything using the Force. But because of the way this planet was, it was quickly still moving. Time had stopped and this had become the Sands of Time. That is actually a good name. Sands of Time. Anakin thought to himself as he picked up and contained the sand through the use of the Force. Anakin had created a dead zone. But it was not like the Force couldn't exist here. It was just that it would be extremely hard for the energy to recover. If Anakin had made this place a proper and full scar within the Force, his own energy field would also become useless. And while he wouldn't mind too much, it would feel uncomfortable to him. I think that we have everything. What are we gonna do next? Shark walked up to Anakin as she was done exploring this place. She had nothing more to gain from here, and neither did anyone else. Maybe Xana by staying here would start to gain some more power. But this place was unsuitable for everyone else, and maybe even Padme. But her alignment was kind of undecided even with Anakin, knowing that she much more suited the dark side. He wasn't going to force her, and no one else was as well. It wasn't like it was all that dangerous after all, okay? It is. But, with Anakin here Padme was guaranteed to never fully and properly succumb, especially with the diet connection between him and the rest. We can head back soon. But see this lava turn sand. Anakin started to heat the sand up, and it was ineffective. Yeah. Shark nodded, confused where this was going. It is immune to force lightning, meaning that this stuff is probably also immune to other force abilities. The only reason I can use the force on it right now is through manipulating the air through the force instead of just using the energy field itself. Anakin explained as he planned around with the sand making it take various shapes. Isn't this stuff useless for us? Shark questioned. No. This stuff will change the way force sensitives fight with each other if implemented properly. In fact, while it may be useless now, that doesn't mean it won't come in handy later. If I integrate this into myself, what do you think will happen? Anakin was referring to his bio nano suit that was a part of himself. This could both be used as something to train with, something to protect himself, but also as a way to better control himself. More specifically, better control the energy field that he was creating. This sand, the sands of time, would enable two to finally take back some more control over the energy field that I am generating. Then I wouldn't have to further isolate myself from people anymore. Anakin was kind of forced to go into some form of isolation, and only able to interact with the girls connected to him or his mother, or anyone that had gone through the upgrade for the midi-chlorians. As those new midi-chlorians connected better to his own energy field, making them a part of his domain over the Force, the stronger he gets, the more consequences there are for those around him, and while they weren't for his loved ones, it was certainly for himself. He disliked that he would have to stay away from people, not that he didn't mind having to talk to anyone. No, separating himself more and more would make him more and more like the divine entity saw him as untouchable and also misunderstood, for he didn't want to become a god. However, everyone seemed to be elevating himself to such a position, and at some point he had started to change. Mentally he started to change. Not that he would start to become tyrannical and all of that, 
but it was the fact that he could have the potential to mess everything up. He could in an attempt to try and return to the mundane world, destroy it. If he has the potential to destroy planets now, what about in the future? He fears that he would be unable to even touch someone without potentially risking harm. What about his future children, his current lovers and wives and family? The Force may have seen this as a possibility, and that was probably why it was also trying to create dire bonds for him so that he would not become something that was only known as a god, known as a divine entity, something far up into the sky and unreachable, for he didn't want to become like the Mortis gods. He had seen them imprison themselves because of the father's fear of destroying the galaxy, and Anakin didn't want that, so we should try and take some of this stuff back with us. Shark question looking at the silly Ahsoka as well. Preferably I would like to take it all, but I don't know if that is possible. Anakin was making the calculations within his head, also knowing that everyone, even Jabitha, would feel uncomfortable by this stuff. Ahsoka seemed to be the only one who was least concerned about it as she swam in the stuff. Ahsoka, come on now. If you really want a pool of this stuff, then you might as well help us start collecting it. Anakin called out to her, and this seemed to get her attention. Really she seemed excited, and Anakin couldn't deny her fun, so he just nodded his head. Yes. One may question how Anakin was going to collect as much as he could, but he was planning to create a force field within his own room inside of Jabitha, and then create a sub-dimension within the force, and connect it as such, but he would instead of allowing the sand to touch the energy field as it would become destroyed, would instead allow the sand to bounce around, because Anakin would pad the energy field using some air. Time to go back home Anakin looked around and had a brief vision of Vader appear, but instead of black, it was all grayed out, indicating that it too would be lost to the sands of time. I am leaving the order, Qui-Gon stated to everyone within the Jedi High Council, after having discussed things with them about Anakin and his actions. The events currently happening are prior to Anakin and the girls arriving on Mortis, which in turn means that this had already happened even before Dooku, otherwise known as Tyrannus from having nearly died. What do you mean, I am leaving the order? You can't possibly be Kai Adi Mundi stood up, just as others were surprised as well, since this had come out of nowhere. I am. I have seen things on the Emperor within its order, and I have come to a decision. It is final, and I wish to leave. Qui-Gon spoke to everyone within the room with a calm voice that didn't have any hesitation at all. No one knew what to say, for Qui-Gon had not really shown any signs, except the ones that would indicate that someone would want to leave. He stayed with them even when his prodigious student had left, and even after that with the start of the Clone Wars, that weren't really Clone Wars anymore. Qui-Gon was someone, while they didn't heavily rely on or depend on, had done many things for them, and even had and would still have the opportunity to join the Council. However, he did not leave the Order, so too he didn't join the Council, for reasons he himself is aware of. In fact, the Jedi are also aware of Qui-Gon's reasoning, especially since it was Anakin that brought up many of their flaws to them. Wish to leave, you do. Yoda contemplated just what this meant, especially since it would seem that Qui-Gon didn't just come here to announce his decision, something that Jedi just couldn't opt out of when they wanted. The Jedi Order, and thus joining it is a large commitment, and in some cases would make one an unintentional indentured slave, because the Jedi don't simply allow people to leave. Many Jedi, when Anakin left didn't just say they were leaving or wanted to leave, they escaped in a sense. I do. Qui-Gon was going to leave, with or without the Jedi High Council's permission, for he was now needed elsewhere. All of a sudden, Master Yaddle stood up and followed Qui-Gon down to where he was. Master Qui-Gon has made a point. I have seen things myself as well. I wish to renounce the order myself as well. Yaddle spoke, surprising everyone again, that another of their masters, a council member, nonetheless was going to leave as well. Yoda was conflicted here, for while the flaws of the Jedi had been pointed out to him, and he had still not deemed it dangerous enough to change. He had grown old, and had seen many things. Good things from Anakin Skywalker, the Emperor and Emperor and knew deep down that what Anakin was doing, wasn't wrong, and is in fact in line with the idea of balance. He had heard and read the manuscripts that have recorded the Emperor and Order's code, and it spoke of things that were both in line and against the Jedi. It was like it was an amalgamation of things that were taught, and it was something that had evolved from the Jedi. But not just the Jedi, for the dark side was included as well. He saw the teachings, he saw the students, and most importantly above all else was the Force. On Tatrine, the Force flowed like no other he had seen, and not even on Coruscant, where they had recently 
recently expelled the darkness that covered their vision from seeing anything was nothing in comparison. Yoda saw that most of everyone within the room was reliant on him to make the final decision. He was after all the Jedi Grandmaster, so it would only make sense that he was the one to choose whether or not he could allow Qui-Gon and now Yaddle to go. He wasn't exactly an evil person, but one couldn't call Yoda good as well, because while Yoda had done many good things, he also allowed and enabled the Jedi to become the way it is. One shouldn't put all the blame on Yoda however, as he inherited the Order as it was still dying inside and corrupt because of the things that had passed. No matter what Yoda would or could do, wouldn't be able to fix things. Reason you do have. Yoda asked knowing full well the reasoning, but he wanted more for he doesn't exactly want to continue letting people leave even with the guilt he is now starting to feel. No matter how small it is, Yoda started to imagine what it would be like to take someone away from their family. Separating parents and their children from each other was surely a traumatic experience, and with or without the Force, that is just setting up someone to live with negative emotions. I think I have made myself clear, Qui-Gon responded, not willing to go through the entire process of explaining, for it had been done many times before. Just then two other Jedi Masters made themselves known, coming from the doors and entering the council room. These two being Luminara and Julian Quinlan Vos. We would both also like to leave the Order as well. This most definitely is going to be a fun time, isn't it? Qui-Gon thought to himself as now he wasn't alone in his thoughts, and instead, there were two others, no three others that wanted to come along and leave. Luminara and Quinlan had their own reasons for wanting to go and leave, which would in turn have them both going towards the Emperor along with Qui-Gon. It was like the Emperor's order was poaching from the Jedi, and also recruiting from areas of the galaxy that the Jedi wouldn't go to, an example being the Zabrak from Dathoma. Maybe not with him to the Emperor, as that is where he intended to go. It seemed as if something changed in Yoda, something that wasn't negative but wasn't positive as well, for he only said three words that surprised everyone again. It really shouldn't either, as Yoda had let Anakin, the Chosen One, leave as well. You may leave, but Master Yoda Dash Mundi still standing tried to protest, but Yoda wasn't having any of it, as it seemed like he had aged a little bit more than he looked as of this moment. No. May go, you can. Stop you all. I cannot. Yoda spoke, but had a little more to say. Change, I will. I see. Jedi, you all are no more. But, Yoda sighed, before making a gesture and not saying any more and having everyone be dismissed. There was much to talk about now, but things would be getting more and more hectic for both the Jedi and the Republic, now that they have more people leaving. Reactions from many would vary, and even Obi-Wan would question himself and the Jedi, for Qui-Gon was leaving to another place that was like the Jedi, but not like the Jedi at the same time. For they didn't become peacekeepers of the galaxy and the Emperor, and they lived completely normal lives, aside from having to learn about the Force, and then go on to do the things that they want. Freedom. Time was starting to move again, as Anakin and the girls had finally left Mortis. But there was something different about all of them, for they were not the same as they once were. In fact, the amount of time spent within the realm of Mortis was around two years, meaning that everyone was older now. The strange thing, however, was that Isla had in fact not given birth, because the time on this planet was entirely strange. While Ahsoka aged and everyone else aged as well, because of their immortality, they would not grow old. But the progress and development of the fetus had stopped. Anakin connected this to two things. The first being Mortis itself, even after having lost its majesty because of him. There were still things here that would leave one wondering. Then there was also the fact that their child was also connected to the Force, and had gone into stasis as such, because he had both cut off, but still allowed the Force to remain on Mortis. This was scary and forced Anakin to start re-evaluating what he should and should not do around Isla for he doesn't want his future child to be harmed. They also created something that would be able to store everything, meaning all of the sand of time within a specialized device, to keep all of it contained until further notice. Anakin most definitely wasn't about to leave, and they had plenty more time before Mortis would be destroyed. He could sense it, and so could the others as well. But unfortunately this training trip was coming to an end despite spending time within. It would seem the time limit on Mortis's expiration date was two years. The time spent on Mortis was like a blip, and upon leaving they had all fallen asleep once again, only to awaken and see that Mortis, or the monolith of Mortis was not there anymore. Some things had changed when it comes to relationships, especially when it came to Xana, for she was starting to come around, and was now a full-on lover of Anakin's. The only thing left to do was marry her to himself, and then it was official. The only two left then after that would be Ahsoka and the daughter, whom everyone decided that she should have another name. Anakin suggested the name, Eve, but didn't elaborate on why this name was chosen, and everyone just went along with it. So did the daughter, 
Now having a name that is separate from how one would be called. She enjoyed the name. But that didn't mean anything for she was rather put off by Anakin. He had after all just killed her entire family. And that was definitely something to put a hamper on the way she feels about him. Because this was not what she had envisioned. Neither had Anakin envisioned this as well. But stuff just happens. More specifically, the Force just happens. So, while two years had passed, Eve had not forgiven Anakin for what he had done, because who would? However, that bond, the Dyad Bond still existed between the both of them, meaning that there was something to the two of them being together. Hell, she had even grown shorter as a result of the Dyad and the gathering of both the dark side and light side within herself. If even the Force ships it, how could Eve go against it? Then there was Ahsoka, whom was starting to develop more and more herself, coming into her adult form, and she was quite tall as well, Montreal's included of course. Anakin hadn't really done anything with her, as well she was now older, around 17 years of age, and fast approaching that 18 mark, he didn't feel it was time for anything just yet. Things would probably happen in the future to allow one to see the development of their relationship any further, but for now one only needs to know is that Anakin had grown closer to everyone. Onto other things, included of which were the progress of the group in terms of capabilities, as with another person added to the diet, everyone benefited. Anakin received an increase to his, and so too did the others as a result, especially with Eve being incredibly powerful herself. Overall, everything was great, or at least somewhat great for Anakin, now had to deal with a woman whose family he had killed. It wasn't exactly something all that great, and would require some time. But now she was forced to begrudgingly come along, for Anakin, and the girls were heading back towards the Emperor. There was no change in time within the galaxy, even with the group having grown throughout two years. There were some things that Anakin had missed however, as he would come to discover and things still happening right this instance that would certainly be of interest. The Senate was aflame with discussion as the people were preparing themselves for the chaos of the negotiations to come as a hot topic. The galaxy as a whole was waiting in anticipation of the things that were happening, as this would decide whether or not the conflict would continue, for no one wanted to live under the constant threat of danger. That didn't mean that those higher up would listen, for war is profitable after all. The Senate was aflame with discussion, as the people were preparing themselves for the chaos of the negotiations to come as a hot topic. The galaxy as a whole was waiting in anticipation of the things that were happening, as this would decide whether or not the conflict would continue, for no one wanted to live under the constant threat of danger. That didn't mean that those higher up would listen, for war is profitable after all, with the galaxy in chaos. The Senate convenes within and starts negotiations with the Separatists. Anakin, now faced with the certainty of his impending and overwhelming power, wishes to create something that would allow him to be in control. Qui-Gon Jinn, and a host of other Jedi, have now left the Jedi Order, heading towards the Emperor to join with that Order. Or is it that Qui-Gon along with the others only head towards the Emperor for other reasons? An example being Luminara and Julian Quinlan Vos, wanting to see their respective former apprentices. The Jedi Order, now left more torn than ever, thankfully, doesn't have to deal with the Separatists, and the Clone Wars for negotiations are about to begin. The Emperor has taken over the huts, and grand reforms have already started to take place, while cracking down on the criminals within. With slavery abolished within the territories of the Republic, Hut space, Separatist space and even the Emperor, the people could look forward to being free again. Not everything is good however, because there is an undercurrent. An undercurrent that threatens to tear down the current peaceful calm before the storm. Yoda, Mason along with the Jedi, are now faced with visions of darkness, while unobscured in the words of Count Dooku, seem to be true. Someone within the Galactic Republic's Senate is controlling things. But their investigation would not turn up with anything, despite regaining their foresight abilities. It is still diminished after many, many years of disuse. There was also something else. Something stirring within the deep dark space, outside the purview of everyone within the known galaxy. Not only that, this stirring was in fact invaders that were beginning their encroachment upon the galaxy. Invaders that were starting with the very outer rims of the galaxy. The first to come in contact with these invaders being the Emperor, and this would spell war for what is to come next. For now, the galaxy would have to deal with its own internal conflicts, with someone planning something behind the scenes as well. That isn't the Sith Lord Sidious. The exterior of the Senate building consisted of a large courtyard known as the Senate Plaza, which displayed several statues of the Republic's ancient founders. The interior held the Galactic Senate Chamber, which could hold 1,024 reposorpods that detached from the chamber wall, and were equipped with voice-amplifying microphones, translators, and hovercams that recorded the various proceedings. At the center of the chamber was a podium where the Supreme Chancellor and the Vice Chair would preside over meetings of the Senate. 
Gentlemen, ladies, any and all in between, we are to welcome out guests for tonight. A voice called out, over the voices of many, various beings that were here to witness the event taking place. It was the Senate, the Galactic Republic's Senate, and everyone was gathered here, awaiting the arrival of the various representatives from the Separatists' movement. Everyone was expecting the leader of this movement, Count Doku. But he was nowhere to be seen at this moment, and the people would be both confused and surprised by what is to come. The Galactic Senate would serve as the primary legislative body of the Galactic Republic. It was responsible for creating laws, mediating disputes, making treaties, and regulating commerce. It possessed the authority to levy taxes, declare war, declare free trade zones, and manage almost every action necessary to preserve the stability of the Republic. Despite its vast authority, it did not prosecute offenders, leaving the judicial system in the hands of the Supreme Court and peacekeeping efforts, largely in the hands of the Judicial Department. The Senate could not order the Jedi Order into action, but could often pressure it into carrying out its directives. This could be seen in the actions taken by those within the Senate to make sure the Jedi participated in the Clone Wars. That was hopefully coming to an end after a few months of skirmishes. Supreme Chancellor was in the middle, smiling ear to ear, as his plans were starting to get back on track with no interference in what was happening at all. However, Palpatine would fail to see that there was someone lurking in the shadows, awaiting his chance to make himself known and expose Palpatine for what he truly is. Following the Battle of Naboo, Sheev Palpatine returned to his homeworld as the new Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. The Queen and the new Chancellor congratulated each other on their respective victories. Palpatine promised Amidala that he would dedicate his Chancellorship to fighting corruption in the Senate. As the Separatist crisis escalated to open war, the Senate approved of junior representative Jar Jar Bink's motion to grant emergency powers to Chancellor Palpatine. The Chancellor publicly vowed to relinquish his wartime authority once the crisis was resolved. But the Sith Lord Darth Tyrannus warned the Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi that the Senate had fallen under the influence of a Dark Lord of the Sith. Grand Master Yoda disregarded Tyrannus's warning as an attempt to confuse the Jedi. As the war progressed, Palpatine's emergency powers eroded the Senate's authority, while amendments to the Galactic Constitution prompted questions even from the Chancellor's own Loyalist Committee. While Palpatine had eroded the Senate's authority, that didn't mean his own choices and actions weren't coming back to him, for by this point of time, all of the clones from the Kaminans had vanished. There were no more clones to fight the war for the Republic anymore, and they had grown dependent on the Emperor. A new you know, reverse card had been used for now instead of the Emperor, because economically in a position that required the Republic, it was now the Republic needing the Emperor, even though the reasons or the leverage vary. The roles have still been reversed, and this is something that the Supreme Chancellor dislikes very much. A tyrant can make anything seem to be the will of the people. A person thought to themselves, the very same person that was here awaiting their chance to expose Sidious. Enough. A voice called out again, this time coming from the centermost platform, that being where Sidious, otherwise known as Sheev Palpatine, the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic was seated alongside his aides. It was exactly Palpatine's aide that had come up to the forefront and had ordered everyone to be silent. I said enough. It was quite the spectacle, for the Senate was unruly, and definitely didn't seem to be under Palpatine's control. But he doesn't need to overtly display something like control over others, and instead could take a step back and allow others to do his work for him. It was very much like Palpatine to do something like this, for he believed himself to be above things like this, especially since reaching such a high position. Palpatine was most definitely not immune to the sways and the laws that other corrupt people like. The only difference between himself and others is the fact he is force-sensitive, a genius manipulator, and he has other goals from everyone else. While everyone else may be concerned about themselves, their well-being or they may even be concerned about the well-being of those underneath them, Palpatine had goals. Grand ambitions and desires with which would only make itself be known once he achieves the status that he wants. Right. Supreme Chancellor, thank you. Palpatine thanked his aide, for it was always good to continue the facade that would soon end. He had been growing ever impatient since the rise of Anakin Skywalker becoming an Emperor, especially since it was before he could become an Emperor himself. Sometimes life is not that fair it didn't matter however because the amount of power that Sidious would hold after this would be immense, and possibly more than what the Emperor holds. Of course, there is always the possibility that something goes wrong, but Palpatine had already considered everything. Even the Jedi thank you everyone for joining me here today. First, I would like to say is that we are going to be putting our orders for Emperor droids on hold, for we do not what may happen next. The Emperor and Tyrant may be unhappy with this, 
But we have already given our reasons for breaking the contract first. Palpatine wanted to try and plant seeds of doubt when it came to the Emperor. He was trying to make sure that the Republic would only turn to him for answers. For he is to be its one and only leader. Once he announces himself the Emperor of a reformed Galactic Republic into an Empire. Now, on to other things. Namely those from the Separatists and how we will negotiate with them. I am happy to inform everyone that the leader, the Separatist scum leader, Count Dooku, has been found missing. And as a result his tyranny has come to an end. This makes it all the more easier for us to discuss things now, as the leaders, representatives of the Separatists have so graciously decided to come here to the Republic to talk things out. Palpatine up till this point had not mentioned anything about giving up his emergency powers. This would come up later. The Senate was excited, for while some here may lose out on the profits one could gain through war, or the shady back deals that could be done for a profit, they would now not have to live under constant pressure of being hunted down and killed. Especially since it seemed like Count Dooku was specifically targeting things and those that would continue to get wealthier, or had some level of power that was corrupt. Obviously the man, Dooku, was not perfect, so he would also hit those that were considered innocent as well. If I may ask, have those Separatists representatives arrived yet? A person, someone from one of the many factions and planets and systems a part of the Republic asked. I am afraid that they have not arrived yet, and have been delayed. Palpatine replied easily and smoothly, for he was the one that created the delay. He was continuously making sure that they would remain loyal to him now, and the only way to do that was through manipulation, money and other means. Thank you. The person replied, stepping down and allowing the conversations around the Senate develop and continue. There were a few factions, but the main factions that were here was a part of Palpatine's, those that suff peace, the neutral faction, and the last but probably most chaotic faction left that focused on profits. In total, that made four main factions to look out for, not considering the smaller factions that didn't come into discussion, or were in fact a smaller part of a larger faction. Everyone had their own agendas and own things that they wanted, which would in turn create a diplomatic situation that is hard to control. For Palpatine however, chaos and disorder only made it all the more easier for himself to control the Senate. Everything came to a halt however, as the Separatists were guided into the Senate's Grand Hall, and everyone was now anticipating what would come next. Welcome. Palpatine got up with a smile on his face, for this was a true genuine smile. One that was unlike what it was when he was acting. That delay doesn't only work for you, master. These thoughts, again came from somewhere within the Senate. But this person would only reveal themselves when the time comes. Now is not the time. Welcome to the Galactic Republic, for I know that most of you are from here. But that doesn't matter anymore, for we shall have hospitable revelations here. The Supreme Chancellor was acting his part, his role in everything, which would only further cement himself and his position. He was the one in power after all. Thank you for welcoming us. After many long hours, the leadership of the Separatists had been changed to better suit Palpatine. But little did he know that this would not only work in his favor, but against it as well. Yes, well now that we are all gathered here, I think that we could start to get onto the right foot. Don't you think? Palpatine had a smile on his face, as his aged and wrinkled face showed an expression that one could describe as either malicious, predatory or magnanimous. Whatever floats someone's boat. Yes, well now that we are all gathered here, I think that we could start to get onto the right foot. Don't you think? Palpatine had a smile on his face, as his aged and wrinkled face showed an expression that one could describe as either malicious, predatory or magnanimous. Thank you for welcoming us here, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. One of the representatives said, but they were not like the ones from before. In fact, Palpatine had all of the representatives replaced with others that he can for sure know are under his control. If he allowed those unstable elements to continue on their path, they would have eventually messed his own plans up. Some would say that he could foresee the future. But that was untrue as he didn't foresee the future, but instead made sure to eliminate elements that would influence what direction he wants to in. If there was a person that would hinder his plans majorly, then he would just have them killed. If there was an organization that would chip away at what he was working towards, he would have their leadership replaced, fully loyal to himself. The fastest and easiest way to get loyalty out of others is to use money. But that is weak. Money is a weak source of binding. So Palpatine needed something else over those he has control over. Some sort of leverage, yes. Yes. It is good to have you all here for peaceful discourse. I feel, just as many others feel, that the fighting between the Republic and Separatists has to end. Palpatine replied, his voice for all to hear. It has to end, for I must end the Jedi, become an Emperor, and then go after the Emperor. Palpatine had big plans and desires. 
The Emperor was becoming too big of a threat for him to continue to forestall and allow the war to continue. It would be detrimental, for he had discovered that the Emperor's territory was only expanding during the short conflict known as the Clone Wars. It would seem that Anakin, through becoming the leader of a massive galactic power, has brought peace to the not-so-peaceful Republic. Funny that it was Anakin's actions that brought more peace to the Republic even though indirectly than what the Jedi had managed to achieve themselves. Not that the Jedi haven't done great things, but they had failed to maintain the peace and stay as peacekeepers. But they couldn't even do that. Now, if everyone would settle down, I do believe we may have some things for us to discuss. Palpatine then started to talk about many things. Things that included what was going to happen from now on. Whether or not the Separatists would be absorbed back into the Republic or not. What types or terms of negotiations would happen, as while it was true people didn't want to fight, there needed to be something that they would gain. People are inherently greedy, because it is something natural for one to want more, as when it comes to anything that could have a price tag put on it, there is never enough. More, 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 more. Feed the beast, and that beast is the Senate, or the Senate members that are looking to benefit from the negotiations, whether this be because they were the ones harmed directly or indirectly from the war. There are also others that wanted to benefit simply because the war was ending, and the spoils went towards the victor. Something that was never established and this type of ending could be considered a white peace. A white peace is a type of peace treaty where nations agree to a cessation of hostilities, and a return to the pre-war situation. No territory changes hands, no money is exchanged, and no calls are given up by either side in the peace treaty. Technically this is what happened, but the Separatists' new leadership was more than willing to give up and rejoin the Republic. Palpatine had made sure of it, while not directly involved, he had specifically looked for the people that are most suitable for him. Those that are most agreeable to situations, that while wouldn't benefit them, they would be obedient. Soon enough Palpatine would allow the original leadership to take charge again, as the current ones are pawns unfortunate. The loss of the Trade Federation is Palpatine like the Federation, especially since they were so loyal to him in the Republic. And not only that, but loyal to him as someone under the new Separatist movement indirectly as well. I will destroy the Emperor. Palpatine made this promise for what felt like the thousandth time, as he really wanted the Emperor to fail. Then there is the Chosen One of the Jedi. But it seemed like he wasn't the chosen one for them after all. In fact, Sidious was growing a fear of the Emperor, and who could possibly be behind it proper. He would never recognize Anakin Skywalker as the true leadership, for while he has done some things, it wouldn't be enough for Palpatine. Most of the things that happened had to be directed by someone else. And while he still had spies within the Emperor before Anakin's takeover, he was able to tell that someone else was directing things behind the scenes. The Empress of the time, Shmai Skywalker, was like a puppet and Palpatine still hadn't discovered who it is. It couldn't be Anakin, for he was someone learning under the Jedi, and he was young when he first came. From what Sidious understood, Anakin Skywalker was but a child, nine years of age. It is ridiculous to think he was that intelligent already, and had the forethought to think of everything even so far to even recognize him as a Sith Lord. He had fooled the Jedi, so he most certainly had fooled the child as well. Sidious both believed and didn't that Anakin is the chosen one, because Anakin didn't adhere to the Jedi. He also didn't seem to have anything else of much power, and also seemed to be manipulated. The talks within the Senate of course was long, long and hard thought out was the demands, terms and everything else made by the Separatists. Even though the current Separatists leaders were but pawns for Palpatine, they had still taken on the mantle of leadership, not knowing they were pawns. They all believed that they were making peace with the Republic, and finally having their criticism heard. They felt as if they were changing something, when in fact they were. But it wasn't a change that they would expect. My friends, I think it is finally time that we begin the signing of this treaty. Palpatine called out as everything seemed to be going exactly to his plans. While he may not have even needed to be here, he still was to put on a show that he is the one in control, the one in charge of the Republic. He could have used his current emergency powers to just veto and allow the conflict to end. But that wasn't what he wanted. Doing that would send the wrong message to the Separatists, because they fully believed themselves to be the good guys. So too did the Republic fully believe themselves to be the good guys as well. When it comes to things like this however, to war, there is no good or bad guys, just the winners and the losers. Even when it comes to this white peace, the Separatists would still be considered the losers, for they were the ones that had started this conflict, but they were the ones to come and end it. It doesn't matter if you benefited the most, like actually benefited the most for the Republic had won in the end. Whatever terms and agreements that were being made were not actually good agreements or terms. In the eyes of the public, they would only see that the Separatists had come to them, and had begged for them to end the war. This is the most important aspect, the people. 
The Confederacy of Independent Systems, also known as the Confederacy, the CIS, the Separatist Confederacy, the Separatist Alliance, the Separatist State, the New Order, the Pro-Secessionists, or colloquially as the Separatists, SEPs, or CPs, was the government and Separatist movement led by Darth Sidious, and his apprentice Count Dooku, formed by various planetary and sectorial governments, as well as some mega-corporations that declared intentions to leave the Galactic Republic, refusing to comply with its excessive taxation and corruption in the Senate during the Separatist crisis. So that was what was given, the excessive taxation was lessened for those a part of the Separatist movement, and then there was the corruption of the Senate, something that was easily covered up by taking control of media companies, and leveraging one's control and power to destroy them into reporting what one wants. In the decades prior to the Clone Wars, the Republic was seen by many as a failing government, plagued by corruption and mindless bureaucracy, that stifled the voices of many constituents represented in the Galactic Senate. Secession grew during the period following the invasion of Naboo, and the commerce guilds and trading corporations became disillusioned with the Republic after the law was passed to place taxation on all trade routes to outlying star systems. Into this critical situation stepped Count Dooku, a former Jedi Master who had become disillusioned with the Republic and the Jedi Order that served it. This charismatic figure stirred up anti-Republic sentiments on many worlds, paving the way for a rebellion against the government. A loose affiliation of separatists was formed, with Dooku at their head pushing for a new government to take the place of the stagnant Republic. Eventually, this separatist movement established itself as the Confederacy of Independent Systems, a body formally opposed to the Galactic Republic. The members of the CIS included the Corporate Alliance, Trade Federation, Commerce Guild, Intergalactic Banking Clan and the Techno Union. Although the Republic recognized that many of its member worlds were in rebellion, it refused to formally acknowledge the existence of the CIS as their common government, deeming that doing so would legitimize it. Now, that didn't matter, or it did for Palpatine had also been quick to the trigger, and instead of calling the Separatists another governmental body, the terms of the agreement within the treaty included that they may never say that they were. This is important for Sidious, since it means the difference between night and day, because acknowledging the sovereignty of someone or something else would only increase that person's or government's influence and power. The Separatists never would have won the war effort, and Sidious had made sure that the puppet leaders knew this. He implanted the idea that they would always lose, for they would as many of their victories and defeats had been manipulated by himself. Sidious was close now, and he would make today be the day he becomes the Emperor. He had waited long enough, as he had the support and had everything prepared to allow himself this position. The Jedi had no chance of standing up against him, for he had too many things under himself and that wasn't even considering that many of the Jedi were leaving constantly at this point. With or without the permission of those within the Order, people were still leaving. I have the Emperor's current Emperor to thank for that. Sidious hated and loved that Anakin's departure played a massive role in the Jedi's fall. The terms from the Republic to the Separatists was that the corporations that made up the Confederacy were imperialized and assimilated into the Imperial War Machine, and most of the Separatist worlds were absorbed into the Empire with many prominent races of the Confederacy enslaved while others, such as the Traditions, allied themselves with the Empire. That is right, Empire, for Sidious was about to reform the Republic. He could have done so a long time ago, but now he was ready to get on with things, and would not be afraid of the retaliation of the Jedi, or even the retaliation of the Public as well, since he had also been pumping out propaganda throughout the Republic. They could not go against his power right from the start, and whatever change the Republic had of ever staying a Republican free was long gone. Once he was elected the Supreme Chancellor it would be, was and is all downhill from there. And now, please sign here. Sidious called out in some excitement, but there seemed to be some disturbance within the Senate building. Stop right there. A voice called out and multiple people within were confused as even the citizens watching the live stream of this peace treaty meeting were also confused. I, Count Dooku and leader of the Separatists, do not approve of this. It would seem that things have just changed for the worse for Sidious that is. Stop right there. A voice called out and multiple people within were confused as even the citizens watching the live stream of this peace treaty meeting were also confused. I, Count Dooku and leader of the Separatists, do not approve of this. What is this? A disturbance. The people within the Senate were confused and started to try and find the voice, especially since it was said it was the Count. The leader of the Separatists had shown up, and he was now here to dispute what is currently happening. Did Count Dooku not want the war to come to an end? Who are you? What are you here? Palpatine's aide stood up and commanded Dooku to reveal himself. Hurry up and come out. Show yourself. There was no way that Dooku would fully come out now, as that could put a stop to what he wants to do. That is to expose Palpatine openly as a Sith, 
by exposing himself as Palpatine's previous apprentice. I have come here today to expose the Supreme Chancellor. Dooku's voice was heard, especially since he had taken advantage of Palpatine's oversight on trying to him his dead body. It was easy tricking and making his way into the systems within the Senate. More specifically the systems that controlled the broadcasting and all of that, for now he could get his revenge in a sense. What are you talking about? The crowd within knew that what was happening was outside of the norm. But no one had left yet, for there is no danger, because there has been no threats. Just someone exclaiming at the top of one's lungs, and calling out to everyone about the corruption of the Supreme Chancellor. To stop this invasion, well, not invasion, but disturbance, Palpatine had called in his Red Guard to start taking care of Dooku. I knew I should have sent someone to check up where his body was. Palpatine thought to himself as he was seething within. He had grown so arrogant to think that his rushed offing of Dooku would somehow allow him to fix everything. While he had planned everything, there was no way that it could go perfectly now that Dooku was here exposing himself to everyone. To fully reveal everything, I have prepared something that I think everyone of interest would be interested in. Dooku said, pulling everyone's attention to the various displaying devices that would allow them to watch something. Everyone watched, as they were able to see multiple recordings of Palpatine manipulating and controlling things from behind the scenes. Dooku had started to record his discussions with Palpatine after some point, at the suggestion of Anakin. Why did he trust Anakin so much? It had to do with ideals, specifically in relation to why Anakin had left the Jedi Order, and had even formed something that was better. While Dooku and Anakin didn't meet face to face, there was something between the two that they both understood. Anakin had shown Dooku many things, enough for him to finally switch sides yet again from Sidious to himself. Meaning that he is now on his own side, for he also didn't want to come under the Emperor, as he had no idea what the government was like within the Emperor, just as he had been doing. He was also cautious of Anakin's intentions, for even if he had been trained under his own former apprentice, Kwai Gon Jin, that didn't mean that he was good. However, from the things that Anakin had done, it only showed him more and more that Anakin was someone looking out for the good of the people. Or at least it seemed that way for he had even gone into hut space and fought against them or more specifically slavery. Dooku was not a politician, but over the few months being a leader, he had gained an understanding of the job through this. He saw what the war with the hearts was really about, and it wasn't to make them some tributary or even puppet state. It was a war for the liberation and freedom of the people that were being harmed within. If this didn't speak towards Anakin's character, then Dooku didn't know what would. However, Dooku didn't like the idea of an emperor being the sole ruler, even when that ruler was Anakin, because he also saw the same dreams and desires from Palpatine, his master that was manipulating and controlling the Republic to his own goals. What is this? Is this not the Supreme Chancellor? And there is was, the grand reveal to Palpatine being the sole controller and manipulator from behind the scenes, which enabled Dooku the ability to continue talking. Everyone was furious or upset, while there may be some that actually like to find this out now, for they may or may not switch sides. Whether that be for or against Palpatine becoming their tyrant is for them to decide. But now that everyone could see, and the very fact that it was unedited only allowed everyone to know just how much they had played into the hands of Sidious. Everyone, including the public that was watching, finally has an answer to the devastation. But of course, Dooku was also to blame as well. It wasn't like he would be let off the hook just because he decided to be a good person here. And the people were now starting to become distrustful. I think there has been some misunderstanding. There is no possible way that this is me. Palpatine had already gone into diplomatic and intricate manipulator mode to sort out the mess that was these recordings. It was not one where he could simply claim it is edited, and most if not everyone would believe him. No, it is something that could not be denied, so he had to come up with some other excuse, or he could try and turn this around to his advantage. Just as much danger there is in walking within fire and the harm of getting burned, there is also a chance that he could walk through this fire and come out unharmed, while making it seem like he had gone into the fire to save some children. People are emotional, whether they want to believe it or not, and Sidious had been manipulating the emotions of others for a long, long time. In fact, I believe that I have been taken for some grand manipulator. I assure everyone that I have not abused the power the people have so graciously decided to use on me. In fact, the reason it seems this way is because I was using this as a chance to gain information on the Separatists, Palpatine said. But it would seem that only a few bought this excuse. How could I put the Republic in harm's way? Am I not the Supreme Chancellor? Palpatine was trying to play on the heartstrings of the people here. I am but an old man that has made some mistakes. I didn't believe that these mistakes would come back to haunt me. Palpatine was laying it on thickly. 
While it may not have drawn anyone back to his side or anything like that, those that were truly evil and corrupt within the Republic had put the pieces together. They were going to fully make use of Palpatine, just as he had made use of everyone. So they would elevate Palpatine when he comes out with the desire to reform the Republic. No one at this point could properly go against him anyway, as he was technically the one in control of the entire army. Whether that be from the Republic or from the Separatists, as the puppet leaders while knowing of Palpatine's intentions, can't do anything. He had already been holding them by the balls, metaphorically speaking, as he had taken their families hostage and stuff like this. In fact, Palpatine had something on mostly everyone that could be used against them. And because of this, the people started to get scared about what Palpatine would do. Would he use his advantage and get everyone to agree with what he wants? Or would he instead self-destruct, but bring down everyone else around him? I have wanted to do this for a long time now. I have seen the Republic growing weak, so I needed to make some way to help us and have a reason to strengthen ourselves. In fact the main reason for this is probably the Emperor. Palpatine was now trying to shift the blame onto others, specifically the Emperor. Don't trust his words. Dooku had finally revealed himself fully, as he had hijacked one of the floating platforms, enabling him to come forward himself. This man is a Sith Lord. He was my Sith Master, someone that I had learned things from. Dooku would most certainly not allow him to gain everything, at the very least. He would try and take away some of that power and split off from the Republic again. But this time it would be much more chaotic and much more split off. There was already some undercurrents to people within every faction deciding to try and split away from the Republic. This had just given everyone the opportunity and excuse that they could use. It was going to be a massive civil war. Does everyone see this man here? This man had betrayed the Jedi. No, in fact it was the Jedi that had betrayed him. Count Dooku, Darth Tyrannus, whatever your name may be. He is an outcast because of the Jedi, but he is also someone that has lost his way. Palpatine was really good at manipulating people, as it could be seen that his acting skills were quite good. The Jedi are a bunch of zealous people that would try to take down my religion. The Sith are not some evil force, as I have come to adopt their beliefs, and it comes under the protection of the Republic's laws. The Jedi cannot do anything against me, for if they do, they will suffer punishments and be charged with crimes by the Republic. By me. Palpatine was starting to pull, twist and turn things around as no one else was willing to talk. I propose that the Republic finally go with some reforms for the Separatists will be absorbed back into the Republic. First we will change everything, going from the Republic into an Empire, for the Republic is in need for some change. Palpatine had already amassed enough power for this. Some people even started to applaud. Is this how democracy dies? Dooku called out to everyone. But no one was stopping for his triad. It is dying with a thunderous applause. Dooku couldn't believe it. Or it should be that he does. But it was still something that was both realistic and insane. The people, no, the Senate members were hyped up, corrupt, and seemed to think that Sidious would lead everyone to greatness. Especially since he had redirected their goals and desire towards the Emperor. However, there are some groups that would go against Sidious at this point. Thankfully Palpatine didn't have a way to better control people, as he had no Death Star, as this would only further cement his position. Now, another civil war will take place, and in absence of the clones or droids, they may very well start using the civilians, and forcing them into becoming a part of the Republic armies. Thank you. Thank you all for your support. Palpatine just had to act his part, but now that he needn't hide away his true face, he could finally start to mess with everyone. Specifically the Jedi first, but blaming them for some atrocities. I have something to reveal. But first we must capture the traitorous war criminal, Count Dooku. Palpatine would save that for later, and instead focus on making Dooku a hunted man. There was nowhere to run or hide. No. Some voices of dissent were happening, and these were the people that were now prepared to leave the Republic. I will never allow this. I am not going to join this corrupt regime. Multiple voices that were heard, declaring themselves to be independent of the Republic turned Empire now. They couldn't stand Palpatine, not the farce that is this democracy anymore, where those that came from Naboo are in fact cheering. They had escaped the political debacle that is the Republic by joining the Emperor. Their current queen, and their favored former queen, Padme, were elevated within the eyes of those within Naboo. Dooku wanted to escape. He was going to escape. But there wasn't much he could do right now, but he could cause a distraction. He had a get out of jail for free card. Quiet. His voice called everyone's attention back onto him, as the Red Guard also came to a halt for Palpatine had gestured for them to not apprehend Dooku just yet. Yes, Count Dooku, you have something to say. Palpatine's smile was most defiantly malicious, but to most it would only seem like an elderly man talking to a youngster even when Dooku is older than Palpatine. The years had not be kind to Palpatine after all. It was at the Force. Either way, he was much older looking than Dooku, 
which would only further increase his weak, innocent old man look. There is something else I would like to show everyone. Doku held up something, a device of some kind. There was some silence for a bit, before Doku activated the device and had a peaceful smile on his face, and then he disappeared. Goodbye. Vanished into nothingness. Everyone else was in an uproar, and this was the chaos that had started. Gone. Doku had declared himself, said many things, showed evidence of Sidious, or Palpatine's misdoings, and had now disappeared. Everyone was now starting to go their own ways, with Palpatine trying to pick up the pieces. However, the damage had already been done, and now the Galactic Republic, now turned Galactic Empire, was now split off into multiple separate territories. Of course, how anyone is going to determine this, no one knows. Then there is the Separatists, that the puppet leaders would have control over. However the people that are all were a part of the Separatists, now know what to do. Specifically, there may only be some people becoming a part of the Republic or Empire again. Rather, there may be multiple rebel groups, the puppet leaders, and even actual members of the Separatist Council, some Separatist loyal worlds, would refuse to be absorbed into the new Galactic Empire. These remnants, some organized and unorganized, would continue to fight again the Republic now turned Empire. The Empire would use these holdouts as justification for expansion of the Imperial Navy. A rebel alliance would now make its appearance soon as well, for the people wanted to be free from the tyrant, Sidious. Many of the still Separatists loyal would end up joining the rebel alliance at its formation. Newt Gunray, Viceroy of the Trade Federation, Poggle the Lesser, Archduke of Geono, Watt Tamba, foreman of the Techno Union, executive of Bactoid Armor Workshop, senator of Skako and Techno Union scientist, San Hill, chairman of the Intergalactic Banking Clan, Shumai, presidente of the Commerce Guild, Pasal Agente, senator of Kariva and magistrate of the Corporate Alliance, Ho Nudo, senator of Ando and leader of the Hyper Communications Cartel. Tikis, Senator of Dak and later the Quarren Isolation League. Rogwa Wadrata, Senator of Aliga and the Felim Sector. The Most High Queen of Zageria Mirage Sintel, Queen of Zageria. These individuals represented eight independent galactic governments. That made up the Confederacy, including the Trade Federation, Techno Union, Intergalactic Banking Clan, Geonosian Industries, Commerce Guild, Corporate Alliance, Hypercommunications Cartel, and Quarren Isolation League. Eight worlds, all the origins of the leading species, were the capitals of the eight separatist governments, including Nemoidia, Skako, Nuinolence, Geonosis. That isn't under their control anymore. Castel, Kariva, Ando and Dak. Although the governments were affiliated with each other into one galactic government against the Galactic Republic, each had played their own part in the Separatist crisis and the Clone Wars that followed. There were many people that came from the Republic into the Separatists' faction, However things were probably starting to separate even more than it already is now. Meaning that the stability within these faction or new governmental bodies would be quite bad. Opportunists would have a field day, now having the power to overtake and try and expand their own influence. Those that are corrupt doesn't even matter now, for things are up in airs, and only those that could truly navigate politics and intrigue included within politics could succeed now. Now one had to consider the military of everything, whether that be the separatists or those that remained or wanted to stay within the republic turned empire. No matter what, Palpatine was smart in getting to have puppet leaders, for even though people knew that he was behind everything, even the war, they couldn't go against his word, for he had the most control over everything. Specifically he could command the military forces of the now Galactic Empire, and even had control over most of the Separatists' leaders. However the original Separatists' leaders would continue on their own way, not caring for what was happening with everyone. The military forces of the CIS was a mix of weapons of war, super weapons, battle droids, organic forces, and natives on different planets under their control. At least half of these forces would now be merged into the Galactic Empire under Sidious, which he would deploy against the Jedi if they remained. The Jedi were going to become outlawed, and he knew just how he would do it. By exposing the Jedi's actual wrongs against people, like their taking of children, and the exploitation of them through legally binding contracts that force children into indentured slavery. Palpatine could make it seem even worse if he wanted to, but he was doing this with the sole purpose of disbanding the Jedi, or at the very least, having everyone hate the Jedi for their actions. The territories of Separatist space would be split in half once again, but then there was Republic space, which is the largest amount of territorial space left. This would be split off into multiple various factions, with Sidious being the largest. 
The territory of the Confederacy of Independent Systems varied in size a great deal during the course of its short history. The Confederacy of Independent Systems at its peak numbered its several thousand star systems, as well as the various commercial factions with the planets they controlled, allied under its banner. He would have the most control over everyone now. Given that it was like this, individualist people would probably have to band together to stand a chance of gaining their true independence. There was no way they would stay with them, or more specifically stay with Palpatine, now the Emperor of the Galactic Empire. Don't leave just yet, for I have started to see the evils of the Jedi. Palpatine wanted everyone to stay so he could release the final blow for the day, specifically towards the Jedi. The Jedi have been doing things wrong for the longest time, and they would even come after me for my beliefs. However, that is not how the Empire would run things. The Jedi would try to have me killed, and may even try to scar me beyond repair. Palpatine was still able to garner support and even sympathy amongst the people, while there was a sentiment for the longest time going against the Jedi. It wasn't like they had just done good things, because there would always be bad apples within an organization that were misled or even did the misleading themselves. EH people of my empire. Sidious addressed the citizens for their power was great as well to be used against the Jedi. While many didn't really take Palpatine's words to heart on the Emperor, they did take to heart his words against the Jedi. The Jedi has taken your children against your will. For this they must be punished and pay for their crimes. The people still within the Senate building at this point were still applauding Palpatine and allowing everyone to know that the Senate was in support of what was happening. Of course the people that had left were now gone and instead were preparing themselves for other things. Like going against the tyranny of Palpatine. In fact, I also wanted to say that we must be prepared to go against our enemies, whether that be our own family. Report immediately to the Imperial Intelligence Agencies, for I need, know the Empire needs your help against the rebels and separatists. That would still go against us. Then there is the previous leader, Count Dooku. I believe him to be working with the Emperor, and for this the Emperor will also be regarded as our enemies. Palpatine of course had to do this, because even though he shouldn't be going against the Emperor right now, he knew that they wouldn't attack the Empire now. They were still doing other things, like trying to enforce their control over the hut spaces. By initiating this now, Palpatine would have an excuse to go after the Emperor even if Dooku didn't team up with the Emperor. It may all be a lie, but he could legitimize this lie when he is the winner, and he only needed it to work against the Emperor for now. He had other work to get to, specifically the takeover of the now separatist territories, along with those that wished to have independence. This was chaos, and he disliked this. While everything had gone to his plan, it at the same time did not go accordingly with his plan. I will win in the end. Sidious thought to himself, with his nature now revealed for everyone to see. With no Death Star, he would be unable to control these dissenting factions anymore, leading to this situation. Who knew that if one took away such a weapon from Sidious's hands, he would be unable to do anything. Run. The Imperials are coming. Someone called out as chaos was happening within the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. The Jedi, now seen as a menace, are forced to either stand their ground here on Coruscant or flee from here, and try and set up somewhere else where they would be allowed. Not all Jedi were good at combat, for even if they trained as such, they could still be killed. Specifically the droids, organic soldiers and various other things that would come after them. Come on, get out of here. We must meet up with any of those from the High Council. Another voice called out as everyone was trying to evacuate. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Palpatine's voice was heard over some intercom. However, the Jedi have also committed many atrocities over the course of that history as well. The Jedi are often called a militant order, but does one know one of the principal differences between the military and the Jedi Order? The military are expected to follow orders, even when they feel those orders are not what's right. The Jedi are expected to do what's right, even when the course of action runs contrary to orders. In times of war, especially when Sith forces were involved, Jedi would sometimes assume military ranks, and govern armies of Republic military units, as was seen in the Mandalorian Wars. The Jedi Civil War, the new Sith Wars, and the Clone Wars. So Jedi indeed became soldiers, not just keepers of the peace. During the new Sith Wars, the Order created the Army of Light, a massive military branch that consisted of the majority of active Jedi. However, most Jedi were not warriors, and instead were a part of other Jedi divisions. Jedi do not fight for peace. That's only a slogan, and is as misleading as slogans always are. Jedi fight for civilization, because only civilization creates peace. We fight for justice because justice is the fundamental bedrock of civilization. An unjust civilization is built upon sand. It does not long survive a storm. Mace Windu had once said, You have chosen the lonely path. The Jedi teach denial of self. That is their weakness. No sentient can long abide that. 
Palpatine's voice spoke out again, poking holes at the Jedi remaining within the temple. Hurry up. Don't worry about what the Sith Lord says. He is only trying to mislead you all. Some initiates, Padawans, Knights, and overall everyone was listening to what Palpatine was saying, playing at their emotions. People were quick to try and bring them out of this trance, and have them continue going towards where everyone else was going to. The Jedi were trying to do something, anything to stop what was happening, as some Jedi were even being gunned down. Jedi were dying left and right, but it wasn't like they were not unprepared, and instead they are very prepared for what is happening. Everyone had been watching what was happening within the Senate building, and everyone was shocked at the discovery. In fact, some people had immediately gone after Sidious, but they hadn't come back. They were passionate, but the High Council had not gone after them, and instead decided to practice caution first. They were not the Jedi they used to be after all, and would need to take things slowly in another way. This is getting more and more chaotic more and more people would think, and also have some feelings of despair over the situation. The Jedi were coming to an end, and there was nowhere for them to go, even if they left Coruscant. No place for them to go to and hopefully recoup. Master Yoda, what are we to do? Mace asked as the High Council of the Jedi were meeting up, but they did not meet up within their normal place, but instead had evacuated towards another area of the Jedi Temple. They were currently holding anyone that had entered the Jedi Temple, but they knew that sooner or later they would be overrun by Palpatine's forces. Leave we must. The Sith Lord Sidious, now revealed he is. Yoda spoke here and started to gesture all of the council members. To the Emperor we will go. The Emperor, we can't and shouldn't go there. Jedi Master Kai Adi Mundi spoke up, not wanting to take refuge within the Empire of Anakin Skywalker. No time for arguments. Let's go now. Gather up everyone that you can, then try to get as many ships as possible for everyone to use. Mace then ordered people to start going and gathering as much Jedi as they could, right from the children initiates to the Padawans, Knights, Masters and everything else in between. Multiple statements would be transmitted throughout the now Galactic Empire to all of the Jedi. That would happen to be within the other divisions. That were not the main division of Jedi. Becoming a Jedi required the most profound commitment and astute mind. The life of a Jedi was one of sacrifice. To hinder transgression, those who showed an aptitude for the Force were taken directly from birth, or soon afterward to train in the Jedi Temple headquarters on Coruscant, or at smaller Jedi enclaves as Padawans. From the beginning of their training, a Jedi was expected to adhere to a strict code. That included concepts such as rational thought, patience, and benevolence. Dark emotions such as hate, anger, and fear were thought to be destructive, leading down the path to the dark side of the Force, so the Jedi were taught to purge such feelings. However, it would seem that right now the Jedi would have to sort of rely on such emotions, because it was in this instance that they would be in fear for their lives. Master Windu, someone came up to Mace as he was directing people towards some star ships under the control of the Jedi. Master Kenobi, Mace turned around and noticed that it was Obi-Wan Kenobi that had come. Leaving me behind are you? Obi-Wan said this with jest as he put down the youngling he had carried all the way over here. He was within some pretty hectic combat with some droids when making his way over here and had saved this child from certain death. Droids do not discriminate upon age and upon Palpatine's orders of execution, he had wanted every single Jedi to die, even the children. I see that you have arrived safely. Board one of the ships now, we have nearly everyone within the temple out of it. Unfortunately, we couldn't save everyone, Mace was angered by this fact, but he still had a duty and that was the safety of the Jedi within the temple. First things first was that he needed to bring everyone out safely as that is his current mission. I would appreciate it if you would help with forestalling the Imperial droids. I got it. Leave it to me. Obi-Wan replied, confirming that he would help out instead of getting on board of a ship and leaving. By the way, where is everyone evacuating to? The Emperor, Mace answered. Are we sure Anakin would like that? Obi-Wan doubted that Anakin would like rescuing the Jedi. But Mace felt differently. Anakin would most certainly not mind saving some people. Mace replied. Have we gotten all of the Jedi Consulars, Guardians and Sentinels? Obi-Wan had to ask for there were a lot of Jedi still probably going to be left behind. The only way they would know where the Jedi were going was if someone broadcasted that the Jedi were headed towards the Emperor, which Palpatine would probably make use of to point towards the Emperor as people that endorse the kidnapping of children and enforcement of indentured slavery. Yes, everyone should be fine and there is no problem. Don't worry about things for now and just hurry up and help me will you? Mace said this aggressively and Obi-Wan complied with Mace's request. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Obi-Wan replied and started to go off in another direction, needing to make sure he stops people from being killed. Upon a Padawan's ascension to knighthood, they faced a choice of continuing down one of three branches of Jedi training, choosing based on preference and personal talents and skills. 
the opportunity to join the ranks of the Jedi Guardian, Jedi Consular, or Jedi Sentinel was open to all who passed the Jedi Trials. In addition to their specialization, the High Council could demand that the members of the Order assume military ranks in order to defend the Republic. Knights preferring to take a physically active stance against the dark side of the Force and all other threats to the Republic pursued the title of Guardian. Brandishing their lightsabers proudly, Guardians focused much of their training on perfecting their sparring and athletic skills as well as the art of unarmed combat. The four skills studied by the Guardians were typically those used for quickly disabling an opponent and aiding in agility and stamina. The most profound masters of this specialization were known as Warrior Master. An example of a Knight or Guardian would be Anakin, but he is more like a specialist of everything and master of it all. However, his main talents would place him within the Knight or Guardian category, especially since this was the main way for a Jedi to be physically active, focusing not on physical force but on mastery of the force and the sharpening of mental skills. The Jedi Knights who became consulars worked closely with the Republic diplomatic corps and medical facilities. Overseen by the Council of Reconciliation, consulars worked as healers, prophets, and researchers, wielding a lightsaber only for self-defense. The most studied masters of this specialization were known as Sage Master. An example of a Jedi consular would be someone like Barris. But since she was with Anakin now in the Emperor, such classification wouldn't apply to her. Knights that sought a balance between the intensive combat training of the Jedi Guardians and the wider philosophical views and teaching responsibilities of the Jedi Consulars. These Jedi ferreted out deceit and injustice, bringing it to light. They were generally employed in scouting missions and were skilled in security, computers, or stealth techniques, and also had diplomatic skills. This was the last pathway for a Jedi, and an example of a person taking this path would be Yoda, because at some point he was a watchman and stuff like that. All three categories and subcategories of Jedi within are important for they all have skills or abilities that Anakin would want to make use of within the Emperor, which means once they arrive he wouldn't allow the Jedi to be formed again under the Emperor. However, what he would allow is their conversion into the Emperor in order. This is why these are important for their skills, abilities, and all of the extra stuff would come in handy to know of. I just hope that we won't have to face too much disaster. Mace thought to himself as he watched people leaving through the atmosphere of Coruscant, as it seemed like the world was coming to an end. It wasn't only the Jedi trying to leave and successfully escaping, and instead it was citizens of the Republic escaping as well. Where they were headed in, no one would know, but the most probable and most safe place a person would want to head towards was the Emperor and their affiliated territories. Or people could be going towards Separatist territories as well or they could be going towards any of the other options within the known galaxy. There were many options for one to go down, and there was no stopping the people from deciding to just up and leave for the governmental system was in chaos. So too would be the rest of the Republic's now turned empire systems within, meaning that it would be and is extremely easy for someone to leave Coruscant at this time, because the people still needed time to get used to the change. The people whose jobs was to stop people from leaving, would have a hard time adjusting to whatever new rules were in place, which would give many people a chance to leave if they wanted. We take what we desire because we can. We can because we have power. We have power because we are Sith. The Sith, also referred to as the Sith Order, was a sect of Force sensitives, who utilized the dark side of the Force. The term Sith originally referred to a species of aliens native to the planets Korriban and Zeist, who were later enslaved and ruled by exiled Dark Jedi from the Galactic Republic. These Dark Jedi had once been members of the Jedi Order, a monastic Force religion dedicated to peace through the use of the light side of the Force. The Dark Jedi, who refused to rely exclusively on the light side, challenged the Jedi by giving in to the dark side, which started the Hundred Year Darkness. However, they had been defeated and subsequently exiled from known space, which led to their discovery of the Sith species. Following centuries of interbreeding and mixing of cultures between the aliens and the exiles, the Sith would no longer be identified by their race, but by their dedication to the ancient Sith philosophy. This religious order would survive in many different incarnations throughout galactic history. The rise of a new leader, or Dark Lord, would often cause drastic reorganizations in the cult. However, the Sith would always be characterized by their lust for power and their desire to destroy the Jedi Order. The Sith were the most infamous of all Dark Side religions, and the members of the cult were often seen as the pinnacle of power within the Dark Side. Throughout their long history, the Sith commanded several empires and initiated many galactic wars. With such great influence, the Sith religion inspired many cults that weren't technically part of the Sith Order, nor did they consist of actual Sith. Instead, they were founded and made up of Sith devotees and other Force sensitives, dedicated to prolonging the teachings and the memory of the Sith. Such cults included the Nadists, the Disciples of Ragnos, and the Krath. There was this saying within the Jedi, and that is, only the Sith deal in absolutes, which was actually quite ironic, 
since the Jedi are people that deal with absolutes themselves. Of course, it wasn't all of the Jedi like this, but it was still something to take note of since by the Jedi's definition to tell whether or not someone has turned to the dark side permanently could be used against them. In the original Sith, the term Sithari translated literally into Lord or Overlord. Over time however, the term became closely associated with the idea of a perfect being who would rise to power and take control of the Sith Order. The prophesied coming of the Sithari was based around the notion that a perfect being would epitomize the teachings of the Sith Code and became free of all restrictions. This being would lead the Sith, but also destroy them, a destruction that would make the Sith Order stronger than before. The identity of the Sithari has been confirmed as Darth Bane, who destroyed the Brotherhood of Darkness in order to remake the Sith through the Rule of Two. The prophecy of the Sithari is very similar to the Jedi's prophecy of the Chosen One, an extremely powerful force sensitive who would lead their order to perfection. Palpatine had believed he had taken on the mantle of the Sithari, but there was something else there that had a much greater presence within the force than he had. Which meant there was someone else that would take on this mantle, or it was already taken by someone else. Someone within the Jedi Temple was walking with a hood obscuring them. Peace is a lie, there is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken, the force shall free me. These were the thoughts of the person walking through the Jedi Temple, and this person came to a stop, seeing a crying girl. Yasa doing alright. The voice of this tall being spoke and it was masculine in nature. It also had a strange accent. Stop right there Sith. It was Obi-Wan that called out and alerted the being that was approaching the youngling girl. Messer friend Obi-Wan. The hood came off to reveal it was Jar Jar. With the hate-filled eyes of the Sith, which surprised Obi-Wan. Jar Jar. Obi-Wan couldn't help but question just what was going on. Messer don't go by Jar Jar Binks anymore. Messer called Darth Imabas. Jar Jar replied, earning a confused look from Obi-Wan. Jar Jar, what have you done? Obi-Wan asked, while keeping his distance, not wanting Jar Jar to do anything rash. Jar Jar had the girl youngling right next to him after all. Messer has decided that Messer Hasa had enough of the ridiculing of Messer's pairs. They mocked Messer, and even if things have changed with those on Naboo, Messer's still seen as a clown. Jar Jar answered, Jar Jar Binks was the first Gungan to represent his people in the Galactic Senate, first serving as a junior representative along with Senator Padme Amidala, and then, after her departure, serving as full senator himself. Like most Gungans, Binks was lanky and spoke basic with a unique accent. Being naive and clumsy, Jar Jar Binks contributed greatly to the fall of the Galactic Republic. He was a general representative and later a senator. Binks was also one of Qui-Gon Jinn's companions during the invasion of Naboo, traveling to distant worlds such as Tatooine and Coruscant, an activity not taken up by many Gungans. On his return to Naboo, he served as a bombard general for a short while in the Gungan Grand Army, and was a joint commander of the Battle of the Great Grass Plains with General Seal. Binks later helped his people colonize the nearby Naboo Moon Omadun. During his career as junior representative, he acted as Amidala's proxy, and proposed giving Supreme Chancellor Palpatine emergency powers in order to deal with the Separatist crisis. Binks would continue his public service even after the departure of Amidala, taking her place as Senator of the Chomel Sector in the newly reformed Imperial Senate. Of course, the Chomel Sector is not under control of the Republic, Imperial Senate or even the Galactic Empire now. It is under the control of the Emperor. However, that doesn't take away from his grand achievements. One only needed to look into Jar Jar's early life to see what it was like. Born to Jar Jar, Binks and his wife in Otogunga, Jar Jar Binks was raised in his family traditions to be a great whaler as his ancestors had been for hundreds of years. Due to his clumsiness and ineptitude, However, Binks was never able to become what his father had wanted him to be. Once, while on an expedition to hunt a whale in the southernmost seas of Naboo, George ordered his son to hold the wheel steady. Binks, however, let go. This caused their ship to crash into the whale, which resulted in the ship sinking to the bottom of the ocean. A month later, George Binks, his wife, and Jar Jar were all stranded on a desert island. When Binks offered to swim for help, a task which would have taken 50 years if it was possible at all, George Binks first called him a fool, telling him that he would be eaten within a day, but then realized this would result in Jar Jar Binks' death, and told him that it was a good idea. Binks was about to jump into the water when George's wife reprimanded him and stopped George from allowing him to do so. Unable to take it anymore, George lamented over what could have been, 
he called his son an imbecile, and attempted to commit suicide, by shooting himself with his blaster pistol, but only grazed his head resulting in it not being lethal. Though what happened to George and his wife is unknown, Binks later found his way back to Otogunga. Of course, all of this was a precursor to what Jar Jar is like in today's age, for he wasn't any less clumsy. In fact, during his training as a Sith apprentice now under Sidious, he had tempered this clumsiness to his advantage, and had then taken all of the negative emotions within himself, and used it to empower himself. The way of the way is to empower oneself through passion, and Jar Jar's greatest passion right now is to repay the Supreme Chancellor, turned Emperor. Palpatine was quite possibly the kindest person to him, and because of this Jar Jar has a lot of trust in Palpatine, whom had revealed himself to be the Sith Lord, that was responsible for the Trade Federation attack a long time ago. Jar Jar, it isn't too late. Turn back now from the path you have taken, and all shall be forgiven. Obi-Wan started to try and persuade the Gungan, but it would be to no avail, as Jar Jar had fully turned to the dark side and was quite talented within this force alignment as well. Right from his supposed clumsiness and ineptitude, Jar Jar was able to cause harm and destruction without even trying, meaning that he was kind of the perfect conduit in which the dark side could be funneled through. Messer friend Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, it is too late, Jar Jar replied, before igniting a lightsaber, and then Jar Jar ignited his second lightsaber, for it seemed like he trained with two lightsabers instead of one. Obi-Wan ignited his own blue lightsaber, in contrast to the red and orange colored lightsabers of Jar Jar. The youngling girl was crying, but started to make her way out of the area as Jar Jar didn't care about the child, and was much more interested in facing off against Obi-Wan. The first to make a move was Jar Jar as Obi-Wan was not an aggressive fighter, and very much relied on patience above all else, which would lead to a long fight. Or would it? Jar Jar sought out his opponent by first using an advanced lightsaber and force technique. Jar Jar threw his orange lightsaber towards Obi-Wan, and then advanced forward with his red one, jumping high into the air, in an attempt to take down Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan would first have to fend off against the thrown lightsaber, which once he did went back towards Jar Jar then got into a position to deflect Jar Jar rapid and mad blows. It would seem that Jar Jar had a lot of hidden strength that was coming out in this instance, for his blows felt very heavy to Obi-Wan. When one considers lightsaber combat, one would think that there is next to weight, and the way the blades are made, would make it silly that deflection, parrying and stuff like that wouldn't work. However, lightsabers were more than just laser swords, as they were enhanced and very much imbued with the Force. Obi-Wan and Jar Jar would exchange blows, and while this was happening, Jar Jar would further draw upon past memories that angered, saddened or had all manners of negative emotions for him to use and empower himself. This would result in Obi-Wan being pushed back step by step. At least the child is safe, however I needed to bring her towards the ships. Obi-Wan would have to refine this girl again later, once Jar Jar is dealt with, because Obi-Wan would unfortunately have to kill Jar Jar. Now that it has come to this, banished in all of Oto Gunga's schools and not able to turn to his parents for guidance, Binks hopped between job after job throughout his youth. His clumsiness inevitably got him fired before sunset. Once, Binks was working as a street-side shudderup musician when a passerby paid him money to stop the music. That is when he was discovered by local lawbreaker Ruse Tarples. Tarples was the leader of a small band of young thieves. Binks was given the job of distracting security patrols, while Tarples and his gang pulled off various scams. Unlike the other thieves, Tarples treated Binks like a valued team member and a friend. This friendship ended when Tarples enlisted in the Gungan Grand Army. The band soon scattered and Binks again began searching for his place in life. Fortunately, Boss Ruganas, ruler of Otogunga, arranged new employment for Binks, partly out of respect for his parents, and partly on the request of now Captain Tarples. When Binks accidentally freed all of the animals in the Otogunga Zoo, Nas sentenced Binks to six months of hard labor in the Quarry Penal Colony. Nas commuted the sentence when Binks saved him from drowning in an out-of-control bongo. Binks also saved the life of Nas's niece, Major Fossa. Fossa pledged a life debt to Binks who was embarrassed by her devotion, but excited about a chance at romance. He was both disappointed and relieved when Boss Nas revoked the life debt on a technicality. Later, Boss Nas threw a lavish party at his mansion and gave Binks a job in the kitchen. However, Binks destroyed the gasser oven. The explosion cracked the bubble wall and flooded the party. Binks tried to save Boss Nas's luxury hayblibber, but ended up crashing it instead. Boss Nas was outraged and decided that he had had enough. In the Gungan High Council Chamber of Judgment, Nas, along with his peers, invoked a Nakombaki law, banishing Binks and preventing him from ever returning to Otogunga upon pain of death. Binks tried to hide in Otogunga, but Captain Tarples found him in Chef Brass Maishu's restaurant scrounging for scraps. 
Tarpals apprehended him and prepared to take him to the surface. However, he was ambushed by Mashu and several thugs. Tarpals was knocked out in the scuffle, but Binks saved him. The hapless Gungan pleaded with Tarpals for clemency, but was ignored. Tarpals then escorted Binks to the shores of the Leonum Swamp, the place of Binks' banishment. This was the end of Jar Jar's life up until he would meet Qui-Gon within the swamps of Naboo, which would lead him down his current path now. Everyone by now had escaped on transport pods, ships or any other transportation device, that had gotten them off of Coruscant. The people were among the first to start fleeing, for they wanted to leave as soon as they could, then followed by others. The Jedi were also leaving as fast as they could, which would result in them heading towards the only known hospitable governmental system within the current state of the galaxy. That space being anywhere within the Emperor. The Jedi had also of course seen Dooku, and his miraculous disappearance because of some device. However, they also couldn't trust Dooku now, even though he has seemingly done away with his Sith Master now, especially since it would seem his Sith Master was after him as well. No, they couldn't trust Republic, now turned Empire space, and they also couldn't trust Separatist or former Separatist spaces. Neither could they head towards any of the independent systems or spaces as well, for even if they knew where they were, the Jedi didn't have any guarantees that they would be safe in these spots. The only place they could hope to have refuge in was the Emperor, announcing public broadcast to all stations. A voice that came through a communication device spoke, and it was addressing everyone. The Great Galactic Republic has come to an end, and instead has been reformed anew as the Great Galactic Empire under the mighty and all-powerful Emperor and leader, Emperor Palpatine. The once Supreme Chancellor has been elected by the Senate as their leader in the new Imperial Senate. That will now serve under the orders of the Emperor. The Jedi have been outlawed within the Galactic Empire, and any speak about what or who the Jedi were has been outlawed. The use of midi-chlorian testing devices has been outlawed, and any equipment found within the Galactic Empire shall be purged and destroyed. Anyone found in position of things that relate back to the Jedi shall face various punishments, including fines up to imprisonment depending on the crime. The announcer went on and on about many things, as the Jedi within their various escape ships listened intently on what was going on. This was quite literally the end of the Jedi, for their organization has officially been disbanded, while unofficially, they were something that was still there, present within the galaxy. Unfortunately, they have been reduced to what was the equivalent to running and hiding rats. On to other news. New laws have been enacted that deal with the economic and political situation of the Galactic Empire at large. The speaker would continue to speak on many, many various things that both related to and didn't relate to the newly formed Imperial Senate, Galactic Empire, and given that Palpatine was now in charge, propaganda for his military recruitment. Sidious knew that he needed an army, as it seemed like the droids given to the Republic for their use had gone offline to be scrapped. It would seem that the Emperor of the Emperor had planned for something like this to happen, which only further infuriated Palpatine to go so far as to declare that they were putting in sanctions against the Emperor. Of course, this would affect both the Emperor and the Galactic Empire. When it comes to their economies, However, the Emperor had become self-sufficient to the point it didn't have to worry about the Republic interfering with its trade. Qui-Gon Jinn, Jedi Master of the Republic, or he had used to be a Jedi Master of the Republic, and now he was just a simple teacher within an academic institution, meant to help those with force powers and abilities on their way to controlling them. That is right, the Emperor Academy. All order was unlike that of the Jedi, and instead was more of a school for all ages. It had to be because there were many people that had potential with the Force, but were not trained in this potential. Sometimes bad things could happen, and sometimes good things could happen because they were not trained. That was just how things were and depending on the person the result of being untrained, either resulted in the twisting and turning of said being or the elevation of their being. When Qui-Gon had first arrived back on the capital of the Emperor and Tatooine, he wasn't expecting too much to be different. However, it was very, very different. The time he had come with the Jedi here to inspect or see what was going on was something important, for if he never came, he would never see things that he should. Specifically the idea and sense of balance within the Force on the planet, and even within the students themselves. Ranging from all ages, they were like beacons of what true balance was, and not the balance of being into one side of the Force. Qui-Gon has had his fair share of troubles with the Force, the Jedi Order and his own feelings, emotions that are connected to himself and the Force as a whole. He had also taken some time to learn of the philosophy here and other such things that were important within this academy. He surprisingly enough also saw some of the Jedi from the Jedi Order were here, and were actually a part of this place. Everyone seemed genuinely happy, or at least it seemed that way, and there was no such thing as blocking off one's emotions. In fact it made sense to Qui-Gon that emotions like anger, fear, sadness, and anything negative was natural. 
Why would sentient, living beings have emotions in the first place? Why would the Force allow for one's emotions to be abused? It was not because emotions, specifically negative emotions, were evil or anything like that, but instead because they can be used. Used to increase one's strength, used in situations that would require the use of such emotions, whether they empower oneself to move forward or empower oneself to run away. I have fear to determine what I am to be scared of, I have anger to determine what I should be angry of, I have sadness to determine what I should be sad of. It was all natural and denying these natural responses to external or even internal stimuli was wrong. I mean when I should be afraid is when something could threaten my life, right? It is only natural to fear for one's life when one should be angry, is when they are facing a conflict or confrontation that would need such anger. An example being something that could also threaten your life. Anger helps a person overcome whatever initial fear to engage in conflict, and increases one's desire to resolve that conflict through physical force. It could also be used to naturally tell someone why they dislike something that is happening to them, or even others. Anger is the gateway to someone's passion. Sadness is also important, for without it people would be unable to tell what to avoid. Specifically what they should that makes them sad. There are many things and many reasons emotions are important for more than what was addressed. However, that was what Qui-Gon had come to discover. He discovered that on the Emperor and stuff like this was taught, but being were also taught to control such emotions. Not like the Jedi, but instead if one needed something like therapy, then they should go get it. Stuff like mental health was a priority it would seem. Of course, at first Qui-Gon may have been apprehensive when going into the secrets of the dark side, a place and area of teaching he most certainly didn't want to head into. There was still some subconscious biases against the dark side from him and it made itself know by his fear of the dark side, and what it could do to someone, what it could do to him and what it has done. That dream he had a long time ago really woke him up to the reality of being a Jedi, and that he would have to face the deaths of those he had killed in the name of peace. Being a Jedi is most certainly not an easy job. He had students here now, whether they be young or old, he was someone that was more experienced, and had a lot of things that most people would want to learn. He leaned towards instructing the classes that included anything to do with the light side of the Force. In fact, the Emperor Academy, or Order, had a lot of people that were more on the light side of the Force because of the influx of Jedi that came here. There are of course people that wish to study the dark side, if they so choose, but the teachers for such things is even lesser than it is on the light side. There was an imbalance within the Academy. However, that imbalance was fixed by Anakin himself. It was much a surprise to Qui-Gon a lot of the things Anakin had hidden from everyone, even himself. Anakin could control multiple, various droids, and through them he could teach swathes of students, whether that be in the areas and classes the Academy currently lacked teachers for, but mostly for the dark side. That was also something that Qui-Gon had to come terms to because he had always believed in the Jedi's prophecy from the Great Holocron. It spoke of many things. However, because of his curiosity, it was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Qui-Gon coming to the Emperor was the first step he needed, and the last step was finding out that the Chosen One didn't necessarily have to be a Jedi, or that they would even destroy the Sith. The Chosen One is simply someone that would bring balance to the Force, and that was it. This was the final stepping stone for Qui-Gon, as if everything else was but a precursor to his decision and change over to leaving the Jedi Order. Sighing, Qui-Gon decided to get up from his meditation, feeling that something important is happening. So he turned on the news within his room. While he is a friend of the royal family here on Tatooine, within the Emperor, he still chose to stay within the Academy's building instead of the palace. He is still used to the lifestyle he had been living up until this point, and it was a preference that he didn't think he was going to change. This just in. The Galactic Republic has now been reformed as the Galactic Empire, under the leadership of the Supreme Chancellor, now turned Emperor Sheev Palpatine. Also, the Emperor has also been revealed to be a Sith, and the news anchor would go on to recount everything that had just happened within the Republic, and the chaos that had begun was something Qui-Gon never expected to happen. The Jedi Order have now been outlawed, and members of the Order have also been branded criminals within the Galactic Empire. What? Qui-Gon stood up at this, for that meant his friends within the Order were in danger. He was just about to leave when his communication device that he had on him started to go off, indicating that someone was trying to contact him. Huh. He moved over towards it and picked it up before activating it. Master Qui-Gon Jin, I am glad that you picked up. The person on the other side was Mace Windu, the other respective teacher for Anakin Skywalker. Master Windu, I didn't expect to be hearing from you, but I assume that things are not exactly going to plan right now, are they? I have seen the news reports and know of what is going on. There is no need to tell me anything. 
However I am confused as to why you would call me now. Qui-Gon replied as he took a seat once again. That is quite alright. However, I haven't called to pick up where we left off, and instead I was calling to ask of you a favor. It would seem that Qui-Gon and Mace were doing something before the two of them had split off, and now he was asking Qui-Gon for a favor. A very important favor. What favor? Qui-Gon was curious and wanted to know. You see the Jedi Order and the entirety of what is left is heading towards the Emperor, as we believe that this is the place we can gain some safety from the Sith Lord's pursuit. It would seem because of the control he has, and the distrust from the Republic's public. We no longer can have a say or stay within the Republic, Mace explained. I figured as much, however I am not seeing where or what this favor is. Qui-Gon was confused. The Jedi Order wishes to stay within the Emperor. However we are unsure if safe passage and shelter would be given to us there. Mace had no clue as to whether or not the Order could stay within the Emperor. However Anakin wouldn't be against it. The only thing he would be against is them trying to take the children of his people against their wills, or coercing them through lies to get more recruits for the Jedi Order to re-establish themselves. Are you saying that the Jedi Order wishes to set up base somewhere within the Emperor? It sounded absurd to Qui-Gon, for the Jedi would most certainly be against what is going on here. However, this could also be a chance. A chance for Qui-Gon to try and persuade the Jedi Order disbanding, and instead being merged into the Emperor Order instead. It was a grand plan, and something that Qui-Gon had permissions to do because of his position within the Emperor Academy for the Gifted. Yes, I am asking you of this favor, as we cannot stay anywhere else within the galaxy. Mace replied giving his confirmation that the Jedi were in a desperate spot, with the High Council having taken a backseat on this one. The only person within the Jedi Order that could help as of this moment was of course Mace Windu, for he had the connections to the Emperor and above everyone else. Even a contact. That being Qui-Gon because they had developed a level of friendship between the two of them, because they had both trained Anakin. Come, I can allow this. Qui-Gon said, as he couldn't just allow innocent people to die. Just because the higher-ups within the Jedi Order were usually very, very bad in what they do. Grinding peace to the galaxy really. Thank you Master Qui-Gon. Mace couldn't help but feel relieved as he felt a lot of pressure. And it seemed like the others on the High Council did not know of what to do. It was Mace's idea to head towards the Emperor after all. And because of this they would live to see another day. Hurry over. May the Force be with you. Qui-Gon said this as while it is a Jedi saying it was something that could be applied to everyone, even the Sith or those that practiced the dark side of the Force. The Force, known to the Quar as the Power of Cosmos, and referred to as the Breath of Jeljula by the Jeljula resident Wise Man of Karu, was a metaphysical, spiritual, binding, and ubiquitous power that held enormous importance for both the Jedi and Sith monastic orders. Known as the Way in ancient times, the Force was viewed in many different aspects, including, but not limited to, the light side of the Force, the dark side of the Force, the living Force, the unifying Force, the cosmic Force and the physical Force. The first two aspects were concerned with the moral compass of the Force as manifested by the conduct and emotions of living creatures, who were themselves part of the fabric of the Force. The light side of the Force was the facet aligned with compassion, selflessness, self-knowledge and enlightenment, healing, mercy and benevolence, while the dark side of the Force was aligned with hatred, fear, covetousness, anger, aggression, jealousy and malevolence. The latter four aspects were defined by prominent Jedi philosophies. The living Force dealt with the energy of living things, the unifying force, with the entirety of time and space, the cosmic force, with life after death, and the physical force, with anything within one's surroundings. Though the force was categorized in this way, no specific abilities or powers were only usable by a follower of a particular path of the force. The force partially existed inside the life forms that used it, and drew energy from their emotions. It was something that was normal and made more and more sense to Qui-Gon, as he also was on a journey of learning, alongside his own students within the Academy. We rejoin Obi-Wan and Jar Jar, otherwise now known as Darth Imabas, back within the Jedi Order's Grand Temple. They were moving at speeds faster than the eye could possibly track, and their lightsabers clashed constantly, leading to the two having a duel between their skills. The way Jar Jar had been trained wasn't based off of aggressiveness or anything that was fast-paced, and instead was more reliant on his clumsiness. That seemed to be a skill in on its own, for it was possible for things to go right, just because Jar Jar did something wrong. In fact, it was in this very instance that Jar Jar was able to push Obi-Wan back quite a bit, for Obi-Wan's patient fighting style was losing out. His energy he had so diligently trained to keep up against opponents was working against him, as Jar Jar was doing things made forced Obi-Wan to improvise and waste more energy. His stamina was fast approaching its limits, while Jar Jar was doing things that seemed reckless, 
however were effective in preserving his own physical stamina. A slip there, a slip here, too even a spinning 12 that practically had no usage. However Jar Jar was able to pull himself out of the slippery slope he was on. He swung his lightsabers and managed to continue pushing Obi-Wan further back from his original position, leading o Obi-Wan needing to rethink his situation, for Jar Jar was managing to get him further and further from his goal, which was the youngling goal right from the start of the right, and by now she had run off, far from the scene happening right now. There are many forms when it comes to lightsaber combat, However, Jar Jar didn't have a form at all, and instead, it seemed like he had become the embodiment of chaos itself. His swings were chaotic, his practice of the Force is chaotic, and most importantly, Jar Jar's way of defense was non-existent, meaning that Obi-Wan should easily be able to find an opening. However, because of the way Jar Jar fought, it was impossible for Obi-Wan to try and do anything. Leaping up into the air and trying to make some distance, Obi-Wan traversed across the place they were within. He further got higher up onto the next building's ledge within the temple, as the railing would provide a proper way for him to climb up onto. Jar Jar of course followed after Obi-Wan in an attempt to get him, however Jar Jar would fail and stumble downwards to the ground. Jar Jar's clumsiness didn't always help him, especially with the way Jar Jar was fighting and now practicing within the Force. The various lightsaber training methods were largely devised by the Jedi Order, with other organizations borrowing elements for their own use. Most of the Jedi training elements were established by the Shai Cho, which would continue to find a niche as a tutorial form, in order to teach students to draw upon the Force rather than rely on their senses. Early level Shai Cho blast deflect training was conducted with a blindfold, forcing the initiate to rely upon his instincts. Later training was conducted through the use of sequences and velocities, the continuous repetition, making the moves instinctive reflexes. These training regimens were carried over to all following lightsaber combat forms, which used similar methods. Jar Jar precisely didn't have any or much training at all. However, what he seemed to like in skill was his innate ability within the Force. Again, Jar Jar kind of acted like some sort of conduit within the Force a conduit for the dark side of the Force and one only need to take a look at his actions, whether that be previous or present to truly know of why this is. Form 3, Suresu, a defensive technique, but effective. Use it if you do not wish to be hit, or if you are facing many opponents with blasters. With a lightsaber blade and enough skill in deflection, it is an excellent offense against blasters. But in other situations, it merely delays the inevitable. Obi-Wan remembered the words said by his master, Qui-Gon, when going over the form of lightsaber technique he was using. It won't work here. I need to think of something else, and then to try and escape this place right away. I also need to find that girl that ran off. Obi-Wan again thought to himself as he extended his senses through the Force, trying to see where the girl had run off to. He also looked towards Jar Jar whom was clumsily getting up off of the ground after failing spectacularly to get up to where Obi-Wan is located. I can't be wasting my time here. I sense that something or someone else is on their way here. Someone that would most certainly put enough pressure on me that I cannot handle. Obi-Wan's senses were definitely telling him that he needed to leave as soon as possible, for there was no way he would be able to face off against two opponents even with his form or style of lightsaber combat. It wouldn't be good especially now that he was running out of energy. The Jar Jar had really pushed him to his limits. The original purpose of the Suresu form was to counter blaster-wielding opponents, as the previous combat styles focused on lightsaber dueling. Becoming the most defensive of the seven forms, Suresu utilized tight moves, subtle dodges and short sweeps designed to provide maximum defensive coverage, leaving the duelist less exposed to ranged fire. Over time, Form 3 came to transcend this basic origin, and become an expression of non-aggressive Jedi philosophy. Suresu utilized motions that occurred very close to the body, in an attempt to achieve near-total protection and expand as little energy as possible while executing moves. Form 3 stress quick reflexes and fast positional transition in order to overcome the rapidity with which a blaster could be fired. This technique minimized the body's exposure, making a well-trained practitioner nearly invincible. Form 3 involved preparation for prolonged battles where the user observed and learned as much as possible about their opponent's or opponent's technique while engaged in combat. Also, by being more capable in lengthy battles, a Ceresi user had the ability to gain control of a combat situation, creating multiple options for the Jedi employing the form. A Form 3 user could choose to kill, disarm, or even reason with their opponent. Truly focused masters of Ceresu were very formidable due to their strong defense technique. However, Form 3 merely facilitated survival rather than victory. Form 3 initiates were more than capable of defending themselves from attack, but they needed a large amount of experience to learn how to effectively counter-attack and entrap opponents. Masters had to maintain an incredibly strong focus on the center of the combat circle, 
Since the defensive tactics of the form included guards and parries engaged very close to the body, Obi-Wan Kenobi should have been able to defend until their opponent made a fault, and then use Jar Jar's mistakes to his advantage. Jedi who left small lapses in their otherwise strong defense, left little room to avoid injury. For Jar Jar however, there seemed to be this ever-pervasive sense of ease that Obi-Wan would never be able to wait long enough for a mistake, an opening that would show itself to him. There is just no way he could do so, not with the way things were happening right now. Moving on from the place Obi-Wan was, he started to head in the girl's direction, for he also knew that most ships from the Jedi had left by now, while he was having a small fight with Jar Jar. It may seem strange, however there was more than just a few people left behind by the Jedi, and there was even a few that had been killed off. There was nothing to suggest that Palpatine would try and go about this in any normal wave or fashion, and instead went for a full-on frontal assault, something that they were able to sense, if only just barely. However, just as with everything that is hastily planned, there were going to be some mistakes that lead to the deaths of a lot of people. Whether this be the Jedi or any other person that was affected by being within the Jedi Temple, it was yet another purging of the Jedi done by Palpatine through the medium of the Republic turned Empire. The first great Jedi purging, which wasn't as devastating as it could have been, had happened at the hands or might of Count Dooku, who otherwise was known as Darth Tyrannus to a few. What is this? Obi-Wan had come across something that seemed disgusting, as the bodies of many, many people lay at the feet of some droids. Well, droids don't have feet however, that was the closest thing to describe just what was in front of himself. There are also several younglings, several children that are surrounded and being taken captive as he hides away, waiting out what was happening. He saw that the droids had successfully captured the Jedi younglings, and because of this Obi-Wan, immediately jumped out and used the force to incapacitate the droids and destroy them. Come on. Obi-Wan said this to get all of the children to start following him, as it was a dangerous situation right now. He couldn't just leave them alone and by themselves, as it would seem that the Jedi were unable to rescue everyone. However, Obi-Wan wasn't going to just give up on these children right in front of him. The younglings of course recognized Obi-Wan and followed after him, all relieved that their savior had come. In fact, Obi-Wan had a reputation within the Jedi Order himself, and because of this he was known by a few people at the very least. When it came to the topic of the Chosen One, then people also couldn't not talk about Obi-Wan or Anakin's masters as well. It was because they were close enough like this and had even been on missions before of importance, especially the Battle of Geonosis that would both change and not change things within the Jedi. Youngling was a term for any child of any species. Force-sensitive younglings who were taken to the Jedi Temple to be trained as Jedi, were known as Jedi younglings. It was mostly used to refer to children of an especially young age, that were or has joined the Jedi Order, whether that be for the good or the bad. Master Kenobi, where are we going? One of the children asked Obi-Wan, as he was now the de facto leader of this small troop of Jedi younglings. He was in charge, but that didn't mean he was the best with children as well. Now, I know this situation is quite dire, However, I would appreciate it if all of you would follow me quietly, and please try to conceal yourselves within the Force. There are those who would be able to sense you. Obi-Wan wasn't about to start taking risks right now, as he had no idea whether or not Jar Jar had the ability to sense Obi-Wan or anyone else with a strong pulse within the Force. Okay. The children listened attentively to Obi-Wan, and quickly adapted to the situation while remaining quite calm. It was only natural as they had been trained as such, and while the Jedi have done things that they shouldn't especially towards these children, it was still better than becoming a well and true proper slave. The Jedi had made the children indentured slaves, however they still had the decency and ability to help train children, when it came to things like conflict, especially things like the situation right now. Imagine, if these children were unable to adapt to the current circumstances, they would either be dead, crying or anything else bad. It was fortunate that Obi-Wan had come along at the right time as well, leaving Jar Jar behind to try and follow him. They continued and would actually fully make their way over towards a starship. However, it would seem like their luck would end right now. Hello there, Jar Jar had shown up, and now he had some backup in the form of Ferris Olin, the other Sith apprentice. Olin. Obi-Wan was surprised to see him here, but knew that it was probably not the time for reunions, especially since he was here as a Sith. Give the younglings to us, and we may consider your escape. Olin said to Obi-Wan, not caring in the slightest, and instead wanted to the Force-sensitive children. I am afraid that I cannot do that. Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber while gesturing for all of the younglings to get on board the starship, which they promptly did. Hello there, Jar Jar had shown up, and now he had some backup in the form of Ferris Olin, the other Sith apprentice. Olin. Obi-Wan was surprised to see him here, 
but knew that it was probably not the time for reunions, especially since he was here as a Sith. Give the younglings to us, and we may consider your escape. Olin said to Obi-Wan, not caring in the slightest, and instead wanted to the Force-sensitive children. I am afraid that I cannot do that. Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber, while gesturing for all of the younglings to get on board the starship, which they promptly did. Rejoining Obi-Wan, Jar Jar and Firas, the three are now about to engage in a standoff against each other as Obi-Wan is protecting the children within the ship, unsure of why the Sith would want them. I cannot exactly hand over these younglings to you too. Obi-Wan had to play this carefully right now, and had to be prepared for whatever is going to happen next. You cannot stop us. Fierce replied as the two, Jar Jar and Fierce were prepared for the fight to begin. I can't believe I am left here to deal with everything here, myself Obi-Wan thought to himself, as he started to think about what to do. He wouldn't have enough time to start up the ship if he got on board to escape those two, and even if he did, they may try and use the force to stop the ship from flying. As the three adult force sensitives were preparing themselves to get into it, the ship holding the children started itself up. What? Jar Jar was surprised, Fierce as well. Then there was Obi-Wan who was very confused about just what was happening. What are you doing in there? Obi-Wan called out to the children within, but he wouldn't get an answer, where instead someone would make their entrance. Someone that was walking, creating a clear distinct noise that would tell anyone that this person was wearing some type of boots. Who are you? Fierce and everyone looked over to discover another distraction had come to the battlefield, that being a woman with short white hair and a strange suit, plus a lightsaber of their own, or what looked like one. Who is me? The girl said this while looking at everyone here, before pointing towards the ship. I think everyone is forgetting about the ship there, right? Obi-Wan turned around and noticed that it was already starting to take off, and he couldn't have that. He had two choices in this instant, staying here to deal with the two Sith, plus the new mysterious person, or to get on board the ship, and find out just what exactly is going on there. Obi-Wan in the end decided to stay here, as there was no way he would be able to stop the Sith from following after him onto the ship. It was either the younglings face the unknown by themselves or face off against the two Sith standing before him, let alone the mysterious girl that looked strange, and most certainly gave off a presence that wasn't exactly normal. Obi-Wan is pretty sure the girl is Force-sensitive as well, and the two Sith could probably sense this as well. The ship left Coruscant, now leaving everyone else here alone. Where Obi-Wan, the mystery girl, Fierus, and Jar Jar Binks. Now what? Obi-Wan asked this as a rhetorical question. Obi-Wan was answered however, by Jar Jar jumping into action by going after Obi-Wan once again. It would seem that Jar Jar wanted to finish what the two had started, for Obi-Wan had retreated, and even seen some more of Jar Jar's embarrassing moments. He had developed a hate for himself and for his flaws, so of course Jar Jar would want to erase everything that reminded himself of such things. This was similar in nature to how Darth Vader was made by Sidious in that Darth Vader had to get rid of his old memories of his old self, to forget or to erase such things for they are seen as a weakness, but for Jar Jar it was much more personal in a sense. For Jar Jar had many moments where his clumsiness was explored and seen by others, meaning that it is something that is actively always going to be around, especially since it has become a part of his fighting style, which would only lead to Jar Jar fueling his hate more and more. Fierus started to make a move as well, but instead of going towards Obi-Wan, he instead faced the girl instead. Your name? Fierus asked, hoping to find out the girl's identity. I used to be simply known as HK-47, now I go by Hatsuko. The mysterious girl identified herself as she bowed a little towards Fierus. I must now go. My job here was to take care of the children and then to leave. She had hacked into the starship's system and then taken control of it herself before forcibly getting the children off of the planet of Coruscant. That was you, huh? Fierus started to step ever closer, but it didn't seem like Hitsuko cared at all, and almost seemed to be anticipating something. Maybe. Now, using my meatbag suit, I am going to have to leave now. Hitsuko said this and started to turn around, however Fierus jumped in front of her once again using the force. Where do you think you are going? Fierus of of course stopped Hatsuko from leaving. Statement. Move meatbag, for your presence is getting in my way. Hatsuko replied as she started to get out her own weapon. A modified blaster pistol that would enable her to shoot people from afar. I don't think I can do that. Fierus jumped up and dived down, trying to create an explosive amount of strength. So he could push through and break whatever defenses Hatsuko has. And this marked the beginning of yet another skirmish but this time with Hatsuko showing off her own shooting skills. Obi-Wan and Jar Jar would go at it again, however their battle would have similar results, with Obi-Wan wasting more energy than what he should, while Jar Jar would keep making mistakes that somehow turn out right. 
Back with Hetsuko, she was using her blasters, but Firas was able to deflect everything. This would annoy Hetsuko, as she had come across an enemy that could ignore her very accurate shots, which would in turn force her to start making a decision to use her other weapon. A personalized looking lightsaber that wasn't really a lightsaber, but instead a combination of things. It was a dagger, with an actual blade not made up of specialized energies but the blade was coated in the lightsaber glow, meaning that it carried over a lightsaber's abilities. But it had a different look, and could most certainly be used in many more circumstances, than what a lightsaber would be used for. It was something of an all-around tool for her to use. This battle would go on for a while, before the two fights would not be separated anymore, and instead everyone would find their own team or side. Well, hello there, I am Obi-Wan Kenobi. You name is... Obi-Wan was back to back with Hatsuko as he asked this. Answer. Hatsuko. She didn't say anything more, as it would likely give away that her presence here was the result of the Emperor. This would give more than enough political reason for Palpatine to start a war against the Emperor, whereas just harboring the Jedi within the Emperor would not mean much in political terms. Right. Now how the hell are we going to get out of the situation? Obi-Wan asked as his physical energy reserves were decreasing rapidly with the way Jar Jar attacked him and he didn't have another stable and practiced lightsaber form, he could reliably switch to in this instance, or would even be good against Jar Jar. Statement. Jump. Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan were on the very ledge of the place they could escape off of, and Hatsuko jumped down, leading to Obi-Wan liking this behavior to someone else he knows. I don't like this. Obi-Wan looked down to see that Hatsuko in fact did have a plan, and decided to throw the resemblance in behavior to the back of his mind. For now, he would find out where or who Hatsuko is later, and would have to focus on other things right now, like jumping. Well Obi-Wan looked at Ferris and Jar Jar as they were now both approaching him. Surrender now. Jedi, and you may be spared from absolute death. Fira spoke very menacingly. I don't think I could do that, but... Obi-Wan turned his lightsaber off and looked between the two of them, trying to see whether there was anyone else within the Jedi Temple left. Other than the dead bodies of several Jedi of course. I will remember this day, and so too will the other Jedi will remember it as well. The Republic will remember and send this message to your master. Good old Chief Palpatine that the Jedi has not died here today. Obi-Wan jumped off, leading to the two Sith to rush forward to have a look at where they were going. Looking off of the ledge they happened to see a ship zoom up past the two of them, and they stare in disbelief, both thinking to themselves that they were foolish to not realize that such a cliche thing would happen. The good old jump off a cliff trick, but instead of falling to one's doom there is something there to save them. See ya. Obi-Wan did a little two-fingered salute to Firas and Jar Jar, which only served to anger the two of them more, where Jar Jar nearly had the gore to try and jump. However, he was stopped by Firas. Don't do it. You are not ready. It would seem that Firas wasn't completely gone from the Jedi ways just yet, as a Sith would not try and save their comrade from death, and instead would probably revel in it. This went to show that Jar Jar was more gone than Firas. Hatsuko and Obi-Wan escaped within the ship, and would be heading off of and outside of the Republic, now turned Empire spaces. They would be going to where all the other Jedi were headed towards, and that is the Emperor. Damn it. I failed my mission Hatsuko would think to herself, as she had failed to accomplish everything she needed to do here, which was to start rounding up and saving everyone she could. It would seem that the leftover Jedi would be dying, with no one to save or help them in this instance because there was no Emperor presence on Coruscant. So where are we headed to? Obi-Wan came inside the ship, saw that Hatsuko was seated and asked. Answer. The Emperor. It worked. Rejoining Count Dooku, previously known as Darth Tyrannus. But now having renounced the title he was no longer a Sith. Even if he still practiced some of the methods or powers that the Sith used. He looked around at the place that he had come to, as the device he had used was something created by Anakin and given to Dooku. It only made sense, because who else had access to teleportation technology within this galaxy, other than the Emperor? So of course this was taken or received by Dooku from Anakin or some kind of affiliate. Where am I? Dooku looked all around as the device that was used wasn't necessarily perfect, and instead would teleport him somewhere random. It was entirely possible that it could have been used to teleport him onto any random planet or ship or even stay within the same spot, only moving a few centimeters. That was the degree of randomness this device was like, because Anakin had yet to perfect something like this. I you. A voice was heard calling out to Dooku as he got up off of the ground, and looked towards the voice, as it was someone that looked to be harmed. However he was all healed up. The lower half of his torso was seemingly cut in half, but it had been sewn back together crudely, leaving a rather large scar. 
that surrounded the person's waistline. The place Duku found himself in was a terrestrial planet. Its surface was covered with refuse, piled over countless generations, so that enormous heaps of trash stood as tall as mountains. The gutted and rotting hulls of ancient starships poked through the more recent garbage, giving the landscape the eerie feel of an industrial graveyard. Huge pools of toxic sludge and the periodic bursts of acid rain made its ruined ecosystem one of the most dangerous in the galaxy. The planet's atmosphere was breathable, though hot and caustic, while foul-smelling fog limited visibility. Answer me, who are you? The voice said again, and as visibility came back to him, Duku was finally able to make out the person. A Zabrak from the looks of it, Duku thought to himself as he studied the man. Duku, now up off of the ground that was absolutely covered by mechanical bits and pieces, was now able to identify himself. My name is Count Duku. He called out to the mysterious person, his reason for being here unknown, and Duku not knowing where they were was certainly a downside. Count Duku, never mind that how did you get here? Do you have a ship? The crazed looking Zabrak was clearly force sensitive, or at least he was force sensitive, according to Duku's senses. I am afraid that I do not have a ship, Duku answered weary, as the force was telling him to be careful around this Zabrak. By this point, the Zabrak had gotten ever closer to Duku. Nothing. The Zabrak looked around and started muttering to himself about things. Peace is a lie, there is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The force shall free me. The Zabrak would repeat this over and over, whilst sometimes getting the order wrong, and messing up what this code was. The Sith code, and because of this, Doku was starting to get an idea of who this person was. If I may, W, what do you want? The Zabrak pushed Doku back a bit, fifth all it would seem of Doku. Just as Doku was told to be cautious of the Zabrak, the Zabrak was also told to be cautious of Doku. Calm yourself. Duku commanded, and it seemed like the Zabrak did calm down for a bit, however his manic eyes told Duku otherwise. Your name do you perhaps remember your name? Name. The Zabrak stared into the metal wastes of the planet they were on and seemed to think to himself. Yes. Are you not Maul? Duku had heard of and knew of Darth Maul, Sidious's previous apprentice, and now Duku is left in a similar state to what Maul is in right now. Maul yes, that sounds correct. The Zabrak accepted the name Maul as his own. It would seem that Maul had lost his memory by coming here, or by whatever had happened to make him be in this state of being. Yes, you used to be known as Darth Maul. The last that was heard of you was your death, but it would seem that your death was not in fact a thing. Dooku said to the amnesiac Maul, Darth Maul, Darth Maul Maul, was having a hard time trying to wrap his mind around just what was going on, as it had been a very, very long time since the disappearance of Maul from the galaxy. Incredibly, Maul managed to survive his defeat at the hands of Kenobi. Through seeding hate, augmented by his indomitable will to live, Maul reached out with the Force, and grabbed hold of an air vent to break his plunge into the shaft's darkness. He continued his fall down the reactor shaft, landing in water. Eventually his still conscious, though cauterized upper body was dumped into a container and taken to Lotho Minor. As he lay submerged, Maul fell at last into unconsciousness, cursing Kenobi. That is correct. Lotho Minor was the planet Duku and Maul was currently on. Can you tell me where we are? Duku wanted to know, but he already had an idea of just where exactly this place was, and he also had a vague idea about how he would go about leaving this place. The device he was given only had energy for one attempt at teleportation, and he could use it again if he had it charged. There was such a feature and built into it because Anakin knew of the randomness and the limited use, he decided that it at least should have a way to build up energy again. If you do not know, I am guessing we are on the planet of Lotho Minor. Dooku at this point still had his guard up, however he was a little more relaxed, as it didn't seem like Maul would be going off into a spree of madness. At least not anytime soon that is. I can help you remember. Dooku had a thing or two about force healing, but of course he was no expert. However, he would be able to restore some memory for Maul. Remember, Maul moved forward approaching Duku this time, still with craze filled eyes. Help me remember, and I don't kill you. Why, of course. Duku wasn't exactly going to argue with a madman. Duku started the process, using the force to help restore some of Maul's sanity, for he was long gone at this point. He could only initially help the man. I am Maul started to get visions, flashbacks of memories in regards to what was happening or what happened to him. Arriving finally at his destination on Lotho Minor, Maul awoke. He activated his lightsaber and carved his way out of the container, screaming with rage. He struggled to move on through the junkyard world. Soon, he encountered insects the size of his arm, and managed to crush one with his own left hand, before using his teeth to rip its leg off. But as he began eating, the Sith Lord heard a scream coming from his right, 
A sly and mysterious anaconda named Molly was slithering away in fright from one of Lotho Miner's gigantic machines, the Fire Breather. Maul threw his lightsaber with the force directly at the Fire Breather's head piercing it through. The machine instantly fell to the ground, the fire from its mouth extinguished. His weapon returned to him, Maul once again blacked out. Molly wrapped the Zabrak in his coils, and brought him into the caves of the planet, which would eventually become his sanctuary. Maul reawakened and, with all of his anger, was able to use the Force to fix up his lower half of his body. Specifically, Maul used the Force to heal heal the damage done, and start to integrate some form of cybernetics attached to his lower half, reattaching his lower half through them. In doing so, he was able to move once again, but he was no medic or even someone with great mechanical skills. So of course there were problems with the fix. Specifically, he felt pain all of the time, and that is the cost of the reformation of his body, even though it was imperfect. It was hidden. It was not visible outside of his body, and instead was within. For 10 to 11 years, Maul's memories were lost, and he was in a state of near madness, eating only the small animals that came to the cave, aided in obtaining shelter and sustenance only by Morley. But the only thing he remembered was Obi-Wan Kenobi, and how he nearly took his legs. I am Darth Maul, and I want revenge. Maul was now much more aware or cognizant of himself now, and was fully prepared to do anything to get his revenge on Obi-Wan. Not only had Obi-Wan nearly taken his legs, he had also nearly taken his life, and while this may be because Obi-Wan was only doing his duty, Maul would not accept such a thing. He would not accept that he had some level of fault or responsibility within this act. Instead, Maul put all the blame on Obi-Wan and the Jedi for everything that had lead up to the events taking place right now. The events that caused him to linger here on this junkyard with nothing much to go on. That is the best that I can do. Now, if you would so kindly help me out. Dooku removed his hand and awaited Maul to say something. I, you never mind. I will escape here and get my revenge on Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Jedi. Maul said this with a large degree of subdued hate. I am not sure that is possible. Why? Maul bite back with some venom. From what I understand, the Jedi by now should be no more, Dooku replied calmly. What? This got Maul's attention, especially since he still wasn't fully healed, and only instead his memories were restored. Well, most of his memories anyway. Tell me what has happened, and how long I was gone for. Okduku would tell Maul about the many things that had happened. But while doing so, they would also go and start to look for ways off of the planet. Specifically, Dooku wanted a source of energy and Maul having taken up residence here, knew exactly where to find some. In exchange, Dooku told Maul about the massive, sweeping changes to everything, the Sith Code. It certainly was interesting. Some have speculated that the Code of the Sith was created in direct contrast with the Jedi Code to illustrate the fundamental philosophical differences between the Orders. This could certainly account for the first line of the Sith Code, discounting the Jedi's proclamation of peace, as well as the similar structure of the two codes, although the Jedi claimed the code spoke only of the Sith's individual wants and desires. Peace is a lie, there is only passion conflict forces one to better oneself. It forces change, growth, adaption, evolution or death. The peace of the Jedi, meaning the lack of conflict, was an agent of stagnation. Conflict however, was seen as the source of progress for both the single beings and the civilizations. The necessity of conflict was a law of the universe, and not just a Sith thinking. Fundamentally, the code of the Sith expressed their rejection of selflessness, and their full embrace of passion and lust. Although some individuals turned to the dark side out of a philosophical ideal, or even wished to wield its violent powers for altruistic purposes, all Sith ended up prisoners of their own crave for power. The deeper nature of the Sith Order was a predatory one. Through passion, I gain strength. It is our goal to be stronger, to achieve our potential and not rest upon our laurels. We are the Seekers, not the Shepherds. The Sith saw themselves as Seekers, challengers of old and stagnant ways, in touch with the laws of nature and the universe. They saw the Jedi as denying their natures and afraid of the truth around them. Some examples are of the Takata hunting prey, feeding on weaker creatures. Passions were what kept all creatures, from the most rudimentary to the most evolved sentient, alive. To think us creatures beyond the need of simple passions is a delusion. They believed that mastery of their passions gave them strength the Jedi lacked. Through strength, I gain power. Without strife, the victory has no meaning. Without strife, one does not advance. Without strife, there is only stagnation. Through power, I gain victory. Unless the victory is achieved by demonstrating that your power is superior, it is only an illusion. Temporary at best. We seek more. The Sith did not believe that victory by any means was desirable, but believed that unless victory proved your superiority, it was an illusion and temporary. 
Though there might be different types of victories, peaceful victory, victory by sacrifice, even a truce. Sith dogma taught that unless the victory was achieved by demonstrating that one's power was superior, it was not true victory. The stronger a Sith became in the Force, the more power he could achieve, but he always had to fight for that power. Through victory, my chains are broken. One who has freed themselves from all restrictions has reached perfection their potential fulfilled. Perfect strength, perfect power, perfect destiny. The true meaning of the line my chains are broken was a subject of argument among many Sith. The chains represented a being's restrictions, not just a Sith, but any being in the universe. The restrictions could be those placed upon a being by someone else, or restrictions that one placed upon oneself. The ultimate goal of any Sith was to free himself from such restrictions, but not in the simplistic meaning of just being able to do whatever he wanted. The Sith desired to free themselves in order to reach perfection and fulfill their potential. They wanted perfect strength, perfect power, and perfect destiny, which, in turn, allowed one to do whatever they wanted for the most part. The person who had these abilities was known as the Sithari. The Sithari was supposed to destroy the Sith, and then make them stronger than ever. This caused many Sith to treat perfection as a goal to work towards, rather than a strict state of being and in that way they were very like the Jedi. General historical consensus has considered Darth Bane to be the Safari. Indeed, Bane destroyed the Sith using the Thought Bomb at the Seventh Battle of Ruasan, 100 years prior to current events, and rebuilt it under the rule of two, which would ultimately lead to Sith domination of the galaxy, in the form of Palpatine's galactic empire. The Force shall free me. The Force is our servant and our master, our teacher and our companion, a weapon and a tool, Know it and you know the universe. Master it and you master the universe. Strive for perfection, and the Force shall reward you. The Sith believed that those who strove for perfection through knowledge and mastery of the Force would be rewarded. The Sith also believed that those who followed their code were free of the mundane restrictions of others, that they strove for a greater purpose, and thus threw off the restrictions normally placed upon individuals by society and other organizations. Sith Lords tried to put the Force itself, in all its aspects, to their service. Sheev Palpatine, Darth Sidious, Supreme Chancellor. None of these mattered for the title he had most importance for was the title of Emperor. Emperor Sheev Palpatine of the Galactic Empire. Not everything had gone exactly to plan, and while democracy wasn't completely gone with the applause of the people, it was going worse than expected. At least I have completed my first goal. Sidious thought to himself as he overlooked the Republic now turned Empire, and he reveled in the feeling of absolute supreme authority he had. Something that he could openly display for all of those to see. He was not able to just say who he is or what he wants proper and true. Of course Palpatine had all of the power given and granted to him by the Republic and their senators themselves. Emergency powers had been the final step in making him the one and true leader within the Republic, allowing him the ability to do anything he wanted. After the meeting within the Senate that had changed everything, with Palpatine now as the Emperor, he had moved and gotten everyone to start hating the Jedi Order. It was best he start here, as while they would be no match for his might, it would be unwise of Palpatine to not see that they could become a threat to his rule. The death of the Jedi was a plan made by him long ago, and it would seem that the Jedi are dying out. But it wasn't exactly what he wanted. Throughout the small amount of time that had passed during the Clone Wars, his clones that were meant to be used against the Jedi had been disappearing, and there was nothing he could do about it. Only come up with some countermeasures against this, and it was something that he was angry about. Then there was the fact the Jedi were slowly dying themselves even with the minimal input he had himself. Specifically, the Jedi Order was becoming no more because they were leaving, and it wasn't because of himself but instead, because of the actions taken by other people, that were a part of the Jedi Order. Anakin Skywalker, the chosen one of the Jedi. Sidious thought to himself about the person that has gotten in his way for the longest time now. It all started with the invasion of Naboo, for if Skywalker did not get involved, everything would have gone accordingly with his plan. However, because of Skywalker's interference, it didn't exactly prevent what he wanted. However, it did slow down and stop some of the things he had wanted to do. Emperor and Emperor, Chosen One, Liberator. None of this shall matter in the face of the dark side of the Force, in the face of overwhelming might and power. Palpatine continued to think to himself about what he would do to Skywalker, once he had him within his grasp, because there were plenty of things that had gotten in his way. Most prominent was the addition of the Emperor and forcing him and the Republic into becoming an Empire, before he is was ready. Not that he was unable to do what he wanted now. However, it would have better to wait a little while longer instead. Even more so, since the clones he had been in developing were gone, vanished and no, where to be seen or heard from. It would be one thing if they were to die because of the war with the Separatists, 
However it was another thing that they would just disappear and vanish into nothingness. Not a single trace of them to be found at all. Where are those two incompetent apprentices of mine Sidious thought about his two Sith apprentices as well. Since he had also sent them towards the Jedi Temple. When he had pointed out the flaws of the Jedi. He had intended to make this something to be used as a reason to outlaw the Jedi within the Republic. Now as the Emperor, he had full control and even reasons, reasonable reasons to go after the Jedi legitimately. His name would go down in history as the one to put the final blow against the Jedi, once and for all. Of course, there was still some problems when trying to execute this plan, for he also wanted to take the Jedi children for himself. They would be useful pawns in his grand scheme of things. Where the Sith Inquisitors created by Dooku, would most probably not fall under him. Dooku had created very loyal pawns and vassals within the Separatist movement, and the Sith Inquisitors was something Palpatine was looking to recreate. Now that Dooku is alive the ones now obviously wouldn't come under him, but instead would go with Dooku. In fact that is exactly what they had all planned to do, as if Dooku had known all along he was going to be killed by Sidious. Which made him wonder just how Dooku could plan for all of this. He had assumed he had Dooku dancing within the palm of his hand. However it would seem that Dooku long held desires and plans. That enabled him to go unseen by his own foresight abilities for so long. Master, a voice spoke to him as Sidious was within his own thoughts. Master, another more annoying voice spoke to Sidious as well. And these two voices were about to be identified. What took you two so long? Sidious said this in the most unkind way possible, for the facade of kindness would only have gotten him so far. I am sorry master, but the Gungan was absolutely useless in the fight because of his inherent clumsiness. The person who spoke was Darth Verdret, otherwise known previously as Ferus Olin, while the being next to him was Darth Imabaz, otherwise known previously as Jar Jar Binks. Mesa saw we master, but Mesa having a hard time adjusting to the dash Jar Jar, started only to be interrupted by Sidious. Silence. The both of you. Have you completed what I asked of the two of you? Sidious asked, wanting to know whether they had collected the Jedi younglings or not, as they would play a part in the destruction of the Jedi, if possible. There was no telling how long it would take him to fight off and kill the Jedi, so Palpatine had decided to create his own Sith Order based around that of the Jedi younglings, and use them to his advantage. If he couldn't destroy the Jedi Order within a reasonable time frame that he would accept, then he would continue to play the long game. I, I am sorry to inform you master, but we didn't collect the children as you have ordered Verdret had to finally say after a short moment of silence between the three Sith individuals. There seemed to be something lingering within the air as Verdret had said his part. Something in the air that was especially dangerous. Sidious turned around from his looking spot and started to zap Verdret with Force Lightning, an ability that was very powerful and very reliant on one's emotions. Not that the Jedi would be unable to do something like this. However because it draws on one's passion it was something the Jedi considered to be Sith in nature. They were not exactly wrong, for the Jedi didn't exactly like the Sith's idea of passion, while the Sith didn't like most of the Jedi abilities as well. After zapping Imabaz, Sidious turned his eyes towards Imabaz and then said, Are you going to say the same thing? Are you a failure as well, my apprentice? Sidious was most definitely angry whilst playing on the mind games, as he wanted these two be two pitted against each other. No, no, Mesa most definitely not a Falurria. Master, allow Mesa to prove to Yalsa that Mesa can recover this situation. Imabaz has had his fair share of being burnt by the lightning generated by Sidious, especially once they had become the apprentice of Sidious. Good good it would seem that at least one of you are competent to recognize your failures properly. Of course Sidious didn't actually care about whether or not they were competent, recognize their failures or anything of the sort. It was all done in an effort to make sure that both of them hated each other, and due to the way Jar Jar, otherwise known as Darth Imabaz was, it made it all the more easier for Ferris to want to kill Jar Jar. However, because Ferris was once trained as a Jedi, there was also some light side within him, and this was seen when he had saved Jar Jar from falling to his death. Now leave both of you. Sidious showed the both of them, as he wanted to get back to doing other more important things. Another failure after the two of his direct apprentices were gone, Sidious wanted to go out and kill to satiate his anger. Things were just not turning out the way he had planned for it to go whether that be the empire he was building or the Jedi. He also had no way to properly control the people of such a vast empire, spanning the entirety of the known galaxy. If Sidious had something that could destroy planets, 
then it would be all the more easier to do what he wanted. However, he had nothing that could be used to his advantage, and instead Sidious only had access to the military of the Republic instead, plus the things granted to him by his allies and supporters. Sidious now turns his eyes towards his enemies within the Republic, still resisting his rule and those within the Separatists' movement, also resisting his absolute and almighty, ironclad fist. The Jedi Order and the Emperor would have to be put on hold within his mind for now, as they were not an aggressive empire. The Emperor Empire was in fact the opposite of aggressive, and instead seemed to be more focused on their economy and defensive capabilities. The only real offensive war they had done was against the Huts, and even then this could be seen as a preemptive strike to make sure the Huts did not come after the Emperor. Soon all shall come under me, the greatest and darkest of the Sith Lords. Darth Sidious, Emperor Sheev Palpatine, the Sathari. Well now what I need to do is approach the Empress Dowager Qui-Gon thought to himself, as he ended the communication with the Jedi, specifically Mace Windu. He needed to meet up with Shmi Skywalker, the current Regent and Empress Dowager of the Emperor, for she also had the power to allow the Jedi to stay. While Qui-Gon held such power, it was only an extension of his power within the Emperor Order, instead of the Emperor Empire itself. Qui-Gon made his way past a lot of things, especially advanced things in the happy populace, or at the very least, what seemed like a happy populace, and made his way over towards Skullker Palace. Renovations were being made and done to Tatooine's cities and locations throughout every day. Skywalker Palace in particular was a place of worship, or at least it was similar to a place of worship, for sometimes people would come and wait outside saying prayers and all towards the place. Skywalker Palace was almost sanctified or holy ground, because this is the very place that God and Savior lived. Not that Qui-Gon cared all too much as he had grown used to this within a small amount of time. It was certainly something off putting but he wasn't one to deny people their rights and everything like that, especially because they were happy. But not only that, their welfare and well-being was looked after by the person they worshipped. They were truly lucky, and the Republic would surely envy their position within the Emperor. Walking towards the palace, he came across the guards and explained himself, which led to Qui-Gon being let into the building. Coming up to the throne room, he was able to see the Empress Dowager, Shmi Skywalker in all her glory, sitting upon the throne for Anakin. It was allowed of course, and he was confused as Anakin wasn't here as well. When he had first arrived Anakin wasn't physically here, and instead spoke to him through a droid. Again, he wasn't here even in such a disastrous situation. Empress Dowager, I dash Qui-Gon spoke up and given the distance he needed to project his voice a little more than the norm. You don't have to say anything, Master Qui-Gon. Shmi got up before walking over towards him, so they could better speak to each other. Everything will be fine, and yes the Jedi Order may stay here. Shmi had grown quite content with everything, and while she may disagree with Anakin's decision to allow the Jedi to stay within the Emperor for a multitude of reasons, especially that they would try and torture her child was among the top of such reasons. However, because Anakin had said it was fine, she would allow it. It wasn't like she could change his mind. What do you mean? Qui-Gon was confused. How did you know Dash Qui-Gon was interrupted however, by another person that had walked through some side doors into the throne room. I'm back, a voice said, and it was masculine in nature. What do you mean? Qui-Gon was confused. How did you know Dash Qui-Gon was interrupted however, by another person that had walked through some side doors into the throne room. I'm back. A voice said, and it was masculine in nature. Qui-Gon looked over and saw the person who had come through the door to be Anakin. Anakin, that is me. Anakin replied as he stepped forward coming closer to where Shmi and Qui-Gon was located. Qui-Gon was getting on in years. However he still looked younger than what his actual age would suggest. In fact, for most Force-sensitive beings they could live longer because the Force would enable and keep them alive. But when how? Qui-Gon was quite confused. No need to get confused now. I was just out for a small while. And that is why my mother was here in place of me. Anakin said, seeing the confusion on Qui-Gon's face. Well, it wasn't only me but the other girls as well. Where did you go? Qui-Gon asked, having gotten over his confusion and deciding that being confused right now wouldn't be for the best. Nowhere important. What is important however is why did you come here? Anakin replied and asked his question, having an idea of why Qui-Gon would be here. Well you have surely heard of the reports about the Galactic Republic now, haven't you? Qui-Gon asked with an unsure tone. Yes, I have. Anakin was always connected to the giant network and systems in place for the Emperor to thrive. Of course, he didn't need to operate the entirety of the systems in place himself, and had the help of the artificial intelligence Siri. Siri was kind of a godsend at least to Anakin, for she had the capabilities to operate many things without him. He was still within the system of course, 
However, Siri was becoming more and more capable in being able to do things, specifically in regards to any inherent systems in place within the Emperor. The many offices of government relied on Siri, and the many logistic problems were also handled by Siri. Many of the things done by Siri was in a way a staple within the Emperor's infrastructure. Without Siri, Anakin would have less freedom to do things. And because of this, Anakin was able to have more and more fun or spend time with his family and friends. I am aware of the things happening within the galaxy. Anakin was also aware of other things taking place as well. In particular, that the Emperor had to continually enforce its rulership within Hut space. There were many within that area that got in the way of Anakin and the Emperor's hold of such a space. Criminal activity was still rampant. But a lot of the main bases for criminal stunts was taken care of. And while Hut space is kind of a puppet state right now, it would take time to fully reform the place. Or more specifically reform the current leadership of Hut Space, that being the Huts. Anakin wasn't going to just slaughter and annihilate all of the Huts simply because they inherited a system that incentivized them to continue doing it. Genocide really wasn't his thing, but he was prepared for the worst scenarios, and sometimes evil acts must be committed for the growth of the people or anyone really. Without adversity, the Huts would continue to stay as they are. Now with Anakin and the Emperor as their adversity, they would try and do things and not be content anymore. I have come here to speak on behalf of the Jedi Order. I request of you, Emperor Skywalker, that the Jedi Order be allowed to stay here on Tatooine, or somewhere within the Emperor, for they are being hunted by the new Galactic Empire, under the rule of the Sith Lord, Darth Sidious. Qui-Gon spoke. The Jedi wished to seek refuge. Shmai asked as while she was against the Jedi, she also didn't like to turn down others. When they are in need of help, a lot of things may have changed. However, Shmai was still the same kind and loving person that she is. Yes, the Jedi have escaped and most of the transport ships they have used has already escaped the Galactic Empire. While everything is going crazy within Coruscant, the Jedi had made the split decision to leave immediately. Qui-Gon said, It would seem that the gift I left behind helped them out then. Anakin said, Gift. Qui-Gon questioned as he was unaware. And so too was everyone else unaware that Anakin had in some way helped the Jedi out. Yeah. While you were still with them, didn't you notice that your foresight abilities have seemed to become better again? Anakin asks. I did notice something like that, and I am pretty sure a lot of the others did as well. No one knew why it started, but it does coincide with your departure from the Jedi Order. Qui-Gon replied thinking back and remembering the strangeness that surrounded that time in particular. It was because of the Nexus hidden underneath the temple, and I am unsure if you guys figured it out but I took care of the problem then. It was clouded the vision of the Jedi, and because of this, it got in the way of your abilities, especially since you all were mostly aligned with the light side of the Force. The Force Nexus there was aligned with the dark side, as the Jedi Temple was built on the Temple of the Sith. Anakin said, something hidden underneath a Sith Temple that the Jedi decided to cap off through their own construction of the Jedi Temple. It is quite silly of the past Jedi to think covering the problem would get rid of it. Anakin continued, well that is interesting Quiet Gon didn't have any rebuttal at that, and instead internally agreed with what Anakin had said. He was unaware of the Nexus, and so was the rest of the current Jedi as well. Completely unaware and even if they were aware of this dark side force nexus they still wouldn't have a way to combat this anyway the jedi order can stay here of course i wouldn't just turn them away even if i disagree anakin said before continuing however i would like for them to not do things that i do not want them to be doing as while freedom is something important their actions would go against laws within the emperor if the jedi are to try and still recruit the people from the emperor they will no longer have my permission to stay within the emperor there are consequences to one's actions, and the Jedi taking children babies of a young age is something I disagree with. The Jedi will be doing none of that. The Jedi will have to follow my rules, and follow the laws of the Emperor. Anakin continued, Is that acceptable? I am sure that the Jedi will comply with these requests. Qui-Gon said, They are not requests. These are demands and if the Jedi cannot respect this, then I'm afraid that I cannot allow them to stay. Anakin replied, Okay, okay, I will relay this information to them, and I am sure that they would be happy to accept the offer. Qui-Gon accepted what Anakin said, and decided that it was his time to leave the throne room, as it seemed like the mother and son duo wanted to talk about something. Later on in the day, Anakin had received a communication request from Dooku. The relationship between Dooku and Anakin was a strange one, as Anakin is the student of Dooku's student. Not only that, they also kept minimal contact over things that related to alliances, trade agreements, sanctions and anything related to governmental bodies. 
Doku was the leader or head of the separatist faction, and because of this and their closeness with the Emperor and not relations closeness but instead distance closeness, the two governmental bodies would have some talks. Usually with some small things here and there, and nothing too important as in relation to the greater scheme of things. Anakin however had set up some secret and hidden communications between himself and Doku, where the two of them would talk on a great many things, especially to do with the force and the nature of the people, their wants, their desires and Anakin's outlook on many things. Doku was of course intrigued and readily wanted to continue stuff like this with Anakin, especially since Anakin was another higher level figure within the Jedi Order that had left. Doku kind of connected with Anakin on another level, where Doku and Anakin were sort of the same or alike. Because of this, Anakin had a big influence on the way Doku looked at things, and Doku's planning to eventually take down Sidious only became more and more pronounced. Anakin shared information with Doku on many things however, Anakin would also advise Doku to not go around killing people as well. Anakin disliked that Doku would turn into a Dumbledore-like figure, for the greater good doesn't necessarily mean it is actually good. The path to hell is paved with good intentions, after and and Doku had some time to reflect on many things. Anakin knew that some Jedi dying was just going to be the norm within the galaxy, as the Force was out of balance. However, Anakin still wanted to save as many as he could. The only way he knew of how to do this is to either go to the Sith and try and create more and more Sith. Or, Anakin would create an academy or order of his own like the one that he has now, and start the process of conversion. Converting both dark side and light side users to an ideology and system that enforces balance within the Force, and allows for people to be free in their exploration of the Force. Of course, there will always be outliers wanting to go outside of the balance way of things. So Anakin modified the old system in place by the Jedi, and made it so even the extremes are taken into account. Sometimes, when one goes to one extreme, they would go so far they would become the extreme of the other end, without even realizing it. Greetings, Anakin said as he saw Dooku appear before him through the communication device. Greetings, Emperor Skywalker. While the two of them could be considered friendly, they were still not exactly friends. It is better to say the two of them maintained a relationship that was like business partners instead of actual friends. It was best this way. But now that things have changed especially Dooku and his build up to what had happened everything would start to change. I have heard a great many things has happened, and I am seeing the changes happen live. Anakin said as he got some reports and reviews from multiple sources, whilst also making use of some droids within multiple areas to record things as well. Specifically droids within the Jedi Temple to record the tragedy of the Jedi and evilness of Emperor Palpatine, with what he is willing to do. Well yes. A great many things have changed, and because of this I had to use the device you had given me. I thank you for it, Doku said in a grateful tone. I foresaw that you would be needing it, so of course I had to hand it out. It isn't complete anyway, and just a small prototype version of what I wanted to create anyway. Anakin left out that it would probably never be able to be precise because it was too small and compact. The level of technology either had to increase, and something revolutionary needed to appear within the field of technology related to teleportation. Yes, I am thankful for that. However, I would like to request of your assistance once again, for I have been stranded on a planet that I believe to be called Lotho Minor. Dooku responded, Lotho Minor, eh? Anakin remembered that more should be here, and the only real reason Anakin hadn't done anything to save the guy was because it was not his place. He would get nothing out of it and the guy was someone that had gone through things without Anakin helping. Maul would continue to survive ever after as well, and with Anakin's interference, that would place a bad taste in his mouth. Anakin didn't want to help someone like Maul, as he was also someone that had done evil. Rehabilitation is what Anakin would have tried to do if he got his hands on the man. Yes, and I am with someone else that I did not know if you would recognize Dash Doku continued only to be interrupted by Anakin. Is it Maul? Darth Maul? Anakin asked, already knowing that Doku had probably come across Maul. Never mind that. I will send a ship there to pick you up, and maybe you can come to the Emperor to meet up with your old friends within the Jedi. The Jedi are coming to the Emperor to seek shelter. Dooku was not surprised that the Jedi would try and rely on Anakin. Yes, I will send a ship straight away, and if you really want to, you can also bring with you Darth Maul as well. Anakin stated, Yes, I think I will take you up on your offer, Dooku replied. After Qui-Gon had left, now it was Anakin and Shmai left within the throne room. So, did you have fun? Shmai asked, having a feeling that she was in for a surprise. Yeah, you could say I had fun, Anakin replied thinking about the time spent on the now non-existent Mortis. 
That's good then. What happened then? Did you guys do anything special? Shmai wanted to know more about what happened on Mortis, as it seemed like she was sensing some sort of surprise. Well, Anakin would go to explain some things, and talk about what happened, where the girls started to pile into the throne room as well. Isla, Shark, Barris, Padme, Ahsoka, Xana and the last person that would be completely new in the eyes of Shmai, Eve, who was once known as the daughter. Eve still had all of the looks of the daughter and everything else to go along with it, but due to the factor of Anakin, the connection between Anakin and Eve along with the transformation Anakin did to her, she had changed a bit visually. She was no longer taller than Anakin, and had been shrunk down to his height, but nothing else had really changed. Who is this? Shmai asked as she was greeting all of the girls, specifically by giving nice big hugs, because this is what a mother-in-law would do, right? Eve looked at everything for it was new to her, and she was surprised that her presence within the galaxy didn't immediately destabilize the galaxy. It only made sense because Anakin had transformed her using her brother's energy within the dark side and made her become balanced herself. In fact, the only reason this was possible was because of her thoughts and feelings towards Anakin once he showed up. It was the entirety of who she is, and what she is was changed, the timeline and the subsequent events to come. I am the daughter. However you may call me Eve. Eve didn't hate Anakin for his actions. However she knew that it was wrong for her to be alive. She knew that what happened on Mortis was probably the Force's will, and because of this she couldn't hate Anakin. Of course, if she knew that she was also supposed to die, but Anakin had stopped that from happening, she wouldn't know how to feel. Eve. That is a nice name. You are from Mortis then? Shmai asked Eve as the other girls were there listening to the conversation. Yes, I am. Eve replied, I sense that you are connected to Arnie. Shmai said, Eve seemed to be conflicted on this subject, as she wasn't supposed to have a connection like this ever. Romance was not a part of her forte, especially since she was never meant to be touched by anyone. However, she so easily allowed it when it came to Anakin. In fact, she had a lot more experiences when it came to touching Anakin in any manner other than her own family, whom are dead. Shmai seeing that Eve didn't want to say anything anymore, turned her attention to Isla, for she was probably the most important of the girls right now, with Isla being pregnant and all. Anakin seeing this went over and started to have a conversation with the girls himself, and intentionally drew in Eve, so she could get better acquainted. Most of the time she kept to herself during their stay on Mortis. Of course, Anakin would constantly pester her to stop mourning over the loss of the son, her brother and the father. Her, uh, well father. Eve didn't have proper close relations with anyone, and if there was someone within this group that had close relations with, other than Anakin that is. It would be Ahsoka, the peppy apprentice of Anakin's. She had grown a little herself, as she would still pester Anakin even more so as time passed, so she could become an official wife herself. Ahsoka was coming along nicely, and due to the passage of around two years with Mortis, she was now close to an age that she thinks Anakin would accept her as a proper lover. Ahsoka had her own plans lined up, so she could start her aggressive attack on Anakin to steal away some love for herself, some romantic love that is. How are you feeling Isla? Shmai walked up to her daughter-in-law that was pregnant with her grandchild. Shmai was excited for this meant a lot of things were probably going to change. It would probably be the start of Anakin having many children, which would mean that Shmai would have many grandchildren herself to look after. Of course, Anakin is going to be there as well. But he has things that he wants to do, and so does others. When it comes to raising children, it takes effort from the parents, meaning that they would have to compartmentalize their time and manage it well. However, Shmai and Isla never had to worry about Anakin not having enough time in the day, because he had never needed to fret over or worry about time before. I am feeling great. Isla was happy as well. Since coming out of Mortis, she could start to sense the child within her was starting to develop again. It was a strange occurrence. But the reason for the fetus to stop development was because of the energies of Mortis. It was a completely separate realm or dimension within the Force and galaxy at large. The cycle of life and death was not good for a fetus, so it stopped developing during their whole two-year stay. It was both good and bad, as Isla was worried due to not experiencing the usual symptoms that came with pregnancy. However, she was reassured by the fact that she could sense the life force coming from the baby developing within her. That's good then. I can't wait to see just how the child comes out. Shmaya exclaimed with her own excitement, wanting to see the first child between Anakin and Isla. Anakin probably already knew the gender. But that didn't mean Isla or Shmai or anyone else did for that matter. In fact, there wasn't even that many people that even knew that Isla was pregnant. While usually something to be celebrated, 
There was just no reason to have so many people know, especially in the times that was happening. Having the child secretly first would work better for the position everyone is inches yes I am of the same opinion. Shark came up from behind Shmai and Isla, and added her own thoughts. Shark, you are just jealous you aren't pregnant yet. Isla said to Shark, maybe, I would be lying if I said no, for I also want to know what it is like to experience the joys of being a mother. Shark said, it is very joyous. It is also very hard and laborious. You shouldn't have children because you want children, but should have children when you want to be a parent. There is a difference. Shmai spoke up from her own experiences. What was Arnie like? As a child I mean. Isla just had to ask if she had no reference for what motherhood would be like. And given that the child she carries is between herself and Anakin, there is some wisdom to be found from asking Shmai. Well, Shmai would go on to say many things from her own experiences to the way Anakin was like, and this would deepen the relationship between Shmai, Isla, and just about anyone else that wanted to join and listen in. Anakin had already left the throne room, seemingly having already talked or discussed things with the girls before leaving. Everyone else however wanted to stay and listen to what Shmai had to say about being a mother, and what it felt like to raise Anakin, to see him grow into the person he is today. All of the girls wanted to have similar experiences to Shmai when it came to having children. However, Anakin was unique, in that he was never really a child right from the start. That didn't matter however, because everyone was not only listening to Shmai for her motherhood advice, but also listening because of the stories she told about Anakin, before he was the person he is now. Even Eve would stay behind, not only because she had nowhere to currently reside, but also because she was interested in this concept as well. She had at one point in time had a mother, and she likened Shmai to the mother that she once had, before she seemingly left and never returned. It was a sad day for Eve, for her brother and her father as well. If there was anything to take away from what currently just happened, Eve would admit that it seemed like Anakin is a good person. At least when he was a child, he did many things, and his position now is the result of those good things, done for innocent people. At least he's good. I think, Eve thought to herself. Qui-Gon was waiting at the Emperor and Order's main headquarters as the base of operations was starting to expand past just being an academy on Tatooine. Many more academies based off of and being branches of the Emperor and Order was being set up on other planets. The way Anakin made up for the lack of people to teach others about the Force was through the use of himself. Specifically he was using his multiple thought processes to be there for his students in the bodies of machines of course. Qui-Gon was awaiting the arrival of the Jedi to come, for some accommodations had been set up for them within the Emperor in Order. While there were students that had families and places to return to after learning within the Order, the building was also outfitted with rooms that would allow one to stay within. There was even the whole kitchen and mess hall set up so people could play, eat, sleep and live within the Emperor in Order's temple. The Jedi would be arriving soon, as a few days had passed, and the Jedi didn't have the fastest transports themselves. They had to leave in a hurry. However what was important is that the Jedi survived, and the children most importantly survived. Maybe I should wait for them at the spaceports here Qui-Gon thought to himself, and then agreed with himself, that this was probably the better idea. While a few of the Jedi had come here before, that didn't mean that they would be able to direct everyone to the Emperor in Order's temple. Qui-Gon left the temple and headed towards the spaceports, where the Jedi would most likely land. After a while, the Jedi were finally arriving, and Qui-Gon had called out some others to come help him direct the Jedi towards the Emperor in Order's temple. It was a massive undertaking with a lot of people arriving. There wasn't a whole lot of people within the Jedi that came, especially since a few of the Jedi had died on Coruscant due to Palpatine's plans. Luminara and Julie, Quinlan Vos and Jedal all came along as well to help along with the process. After a while, all that was left was the main starship that carried the Grand Master, Yoda, and the other members of the Jedi High Council. They had decided to get everyone else settled in first, whilst having to wait for everything else. The High Council didn't come down to help out or anything, not because they were lazy, but because they believed that they should wait for everyone else to be first. By the time the High Council's ship landed, everyone else was gone, leaving Quiet gone there to see things through with them. Greetings. Kwai Gon did a small bow of respect towards the High Council members, for even though they are concerned refugees now, that didn't mean Kwai Gon didn't still have some level of respect for them. They were all powerful force sensitives in their own right? That was troublesome, Mace said as he got off of the ship whilst everyone else got off as well. Follow me, Kwai Gon said as they then began to follow Kwai Gon as he took them down the prospering streets. No, city of the Emperor's capital of Tatooine. Everything has been settled for now. And you know of the things that Anakin wanted, right? Agree, terms of stay, we do. Yoda replied as he seemed to have aged somewhat due to recent events. 
He was already someone very old. However, the recent events most certainly put a burden on his mind. There is one more thing you guys should know. It has to do with Count Duca coming to Tatooine or Emperor and territory in general wasn't that hard. Since it expanded a lot of hut space, and through that one is capable of heading towards the Emperor. The Emperor basically had control of the space in between the huts and the Emperor itself as well, even if it was not directly under anyone's control. Lotho Minor, also known as the Junk World or simply Lotho, was a planet located in the galaxy's Outer Rim territory. That was the home world of the Junker species. Used as a dumping ground, its surface was covered with junk and trash, amassed over a number of generations, which brought salvage operations to the planet to find junk that could still be used. Following his defeat during the Battle of Naboo, the Sith Lord Darth Maul went into exile in the bowels of Lotho Minor, where he lost his mind until he was found by Count Dooku, nearly over a decade later. Anakin sent a ship to Lotho Minor to pick up Dooku, and Anakin supposed that he would also allow Maul to come along as well. Anakin was of two minds when it came to Maul, as he didn't know whether or not he should be given a chance or not. However, he has given some people chances before, and if Anakin could somehow sway Maul from wanting to deal with Obi-Wan, then it should make things better. Hello. It would seem that it took you two a while to get here Anakin was standing, waiting for someone, and that someone was some someone's. Specifically Count Dooku and Darth Maul, for the Count is to convene with the Jedi now, and have a talk with them. When it comes to Maul, Anakin was going to heal him up first, and then send him on his way to Dathoma. Anakin knew that Maul would probably want some revenge and stuff like that, However, it wasn't like Obi-Wan was in the wrong when they fought. If anything, Anakin would side with Obi-Wan, and it was only because of Anakin's grace. That Maul was able to live with his legs, albeit in pain as he is now. Yes, there was a bit of delay. It is finally good to see you in person once again. Dooku greeted Anakin in turn, whereas Maul was silent and seemed quite unstable. So of course Anakin wanted to take care of Maul's problem first. You must be Maul I am not sure if you remember me. But I am Anakin Skywalker. Anakin greeted Maul, given that he was probably in need of some care now. You Maul clutched his head as if assaulted by something. I think you should sleep for now. Anakin waved his hand and forcibly got Maul to be knocked unconscious. Anakin then proceeded to use the force and catch Maul before he fell to the ground and started to life him up and hand Maul off to someone else. Specifically one of the medically trained, genetically modified, and created since that Anakin had gotten the Kaminans to create for him. Maul was going to be properly treated by them, and they would outfit Maul with a proper cybernetic implant, that would help him reconnect his lower half with his upper half, without the pain he has. All that was left now was to guide Dooku into the throne room, where the Jedi High Council had gathered to speak with Dooku. Obviously, Anakin would be acting as an intermediary between the Jedi and Dooku. That was quick. Dooku said as he watched Maul get hauled off, presumably somewhere that would make sure they were not disturbed. Neither the Jedi, those within the Jedi and Maul, would like to see each other. Specifically there is Obi-Wan, and that there is Qui-Gon whom lost his hand to Maul. Of course, one would also have to consider that there is Maul who had to suffer and lose his ability to use his legs without some help as well. Anakin explained that he wanted to keep a few people away from each other, as it wouldn't help him as of this moment. Neither the Jedi or Sith would benefit from conflict as of this moment, at least not physical or violent acts that is. They would probably just destroy each other. Maul would want to kill Obi-Wan, and the Jedi in turn would want to kill Maul. Hell, even Qui-Gon would probably want to kill Maul just because he is not only dangerous, but would most likely go on to commit many more crimes himself. Come on then. Anakin pointed towards the palace, and Dooku followed in turn getting a strange feeling just from looking at Anakin. It wasn't that kind of feeling, but one within the force that told him something was off. Something was strange and most certainly not what it was supposed to be. In fact, if people tried to sense Anakin using the Force, absolutely any and everyone would feel strange due to the energies that Anakin projected. It was an energy field like the Force, but it wasn't the Force, despite it being near almost the same. The probable only difference is the Source, as while the Force in on itself had no proper origin story, and instead was just something that always existed, it felt as if the Force originated from Anakin. It was the feeling most, if not all Force sensitives felt when it came to Anakin. Entering the palace, Dooku got another strange feeling as well. It was as if the palace in on itself was alive, which was extremely strange, weird, and given that he has never been to Tatooine, before he was unused to what one would sense here. Many for everyone else that wasn't new to this place, they too would be having the same thoughts, and it was true. Another thing to take a note of was that there was both the strange sense from Anakin, 
But there was also something else. Something that kind of contradicted the feeling Dooku got within the Force. He was reading that Anakin was both a Force-sensitive, and not a Force-sensitive at the same time. This was due to Anakin's new integration with the Sands of Time, making him something even more controlled within the Force itself. Of course, Anakin had and has complete control over the Sands of Time, but they were something he could manipulate and control either via the subsequent manipulation of the nanites within his body, and or the secondary effects of the Force. An example being his usage of air to separate the energy of the Force and the sands of time itself. When a grain of this sand touched the Force, it created a sort of no-man's zone, whereupon the Force would be unable to pass through a specific area. One could think of it as opposite gravity, where instead of the Force going into, it was more like the Force was being pushed outwards. It was perfectly controlled by Anakin, easily so that it wouldn't damage or harm him and he was already working on ways to better utilize this material. Considering that he had brought it along with him from the now non-extinct place known as Mortis, it was very likely there would be no more of this stuff in production. It is unlikely Anakin would be able to do the same to another planet and get the same results, because Mortis in on itself is an anomaly. Hello everyone, Anakin walked into the throne room and greeted everyone within, that being some representatives from the Emperor, the Jedi Order's top, top people, along with some others calling in through some video communication. Anakin took his seat on his throne, followed by Padme coming up to sit next to him, given she was the most knowledgeable and useful in a diplomatic or political situation like this. Dooku went over to find his own seat, whilst obviously looking at everyone here. Dooku nodded his head in the direction of Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, for they were kind of supposed to have some sort of connection to him. Even thought this was probably severed a little while ago, with Dooku having killed off the Jedi. It was something he believed was necessary. That didn't make it right however, and this was something Dooku would have to live with for the rest of his life. Greetings were exchanged, and the many, many independent factions that split off from the Galactic Empire, had also joined in on whatever this conversation was or is. At first, this was something meant to be discussed between Dooku and the Jedi Order. However, it would seem that somehow information had gotten out about this and decided to join in, especially since the Emperor is involved. Who wouldn't want some protection during these times? People were mostly here to request of the Emperor's protection, even if this would come at the price of having to give up whatever sovereignty they had. You can't be serious. We can't be Dash, of course you can. Giving up this would allow us to take up arms and fight back against the now Galactic Republic, now turned Empire. You can't be serious. To go so far and to give up so much would be a detriment to our economy, and would harm Dash many. Many voices were talking, speaking to everyone as they were discussing a variety of things. Anakin was starting to see that his throne room was becoming like the bloody Galactic Republic, the Senate with all of those senators getting in his way. Of course, his Emperor was not some sort of place that he would allow people to come in the way of his rule. He also understands that everyone right now is under a lot of stress, so of course he would be more lenient, especially because of the situation. If people were not afraid of war before, they would most certainly be afraid now. As the Republic grew more and more powerful, many of the bureaucrats and senators that ran the government grew increasingly corrupt or complacent. The bureaucracy that had grown and festered over millennia choked any attempt at effective government. Furthermore, patron politics and personal agendas also hampered effective governing, and due to the increasing collusion of decadent governmental agents and politicians with favored groups, corporations like the Trade Federation and Techno Union grew in power, and even formed their own militaries. It is likely, given the eventual result of this decline, that it was nurtured and accelerated, and perhaps even started by the Sith, during the centuries they spent in hiding after the Battle of Ruison. Everything lead to the downfall of the Republic, which in turn lead to the rise of the Galactic Empire, under the control of Sidious. Of course, it wasn't or wouldn't really be as strong as it could have been due to Anakin's influence, and would probably never reach that level. Not that Anakin was just going to sit back and allow Palpatine leeway enough to gather more power, as that would be silly. No, Anakin instead was more concerned about other things, outside sources of conflict, most importantly the Yuuzhan Vong. He had noticed some movement from them, and wanted to keep a close eye of them, while better protecting the Emperor and its people. It complicates things that he would have to do this, meaning that it would be harder and harder to have any influence on what is going on with Sidious. For even if the head of the snake is chopped off, the rest of its body could still move and cause some amount of damage. No matter how minimal it may seem, that was still risking the lives of millions, billions of people if not more. In the end everyone would seem to come to some sort of alliance-like agreement. 
The Jedi took along with his remaining forces and influence within the Separatist movement alongside any of the independent factions, all spread throughout the Galactic Empire. Arguments, agreements, none of this mattered right now, and instead the common purpose was for everyone to focus on the Empire. When it came to Anakin, he would just say he would not be getting involved for two reasons, one he couldn't tell them being the Yuuz and Vong, and the other being the Huts in their space. There was some rebellions specifically formed by criminals within the hut space due to new emperor rules and laws. They didn't take it too nicely when Anakin said he didn't authorize slavery and criminal activities anymore, which lead to one of the hut houses being dismantled. Not fully killed off, however one of their leaders was killed because he tried to rise up against the emperor and their enforcement. Anakin would usually be all for the freedom of the people and all that, but in this instance, it was obvious they would only revert and go back to their previous ways of enslaving others. Anakin gave people chances every now and then, and in fact there was this somebody living within some prisoner cells on Tatooine. It was the Viceroy known as Newt Gunray, and he was still alive for one reason. Because of Padme, and Anakin knew that she would be the one to decide this guy's fate. He would most likely die either way. But Padme is supposed to be involved with this as Anakin saw that it would be an important turning point for her. So Anakin kept Gunray alive. Padme probably had a lot of anger against this being Anakin would see what happens and plays out. Look at them. All of those machine-loving freaks go to war with each other. A voice said towards a group of people. These people having strange alien looks that, while not uncommon within the galaxy, it was what they were wearing, their armaments and a variety of other things. That would tell someone the strangeness of these people. Tall, muscular, and human-like, but their faces and bodies were horribly scarred and disfigured. They had no hair, and their noses was practically missing. They were a horrible to behold sight. Sloping, almost ridge-like foreheads. Several PF them had pointed ears, while just as many had been seen without them. These could have been ritual mutilations or a genetic variation. They also had short, stub-like noses, making their faces appear skull-like. Some had black hair, though in lesser amounts on both the head and body than humans but often wore it much longer than them, where in many cases, they were also completely bald. Small blue sacks could be found under the eyes of few, and they were often considered a mark of beauty. These eye sacks expanded and contracted to reflect to their mood as the species did not use the facial expressions preferred by humans. Through the blue sacks under their eyes, they were capable of telling if an individual was in delight or was suffering from rage. The most common skin tone among this group of people was grey, with the second most common being yellow. They are rather pathetic. If we were to strike now, to begin our attack whilst they were so divided, it would make it all the more easier for ourselves. What if they would try to band together and then try and create many of those metal abominations? That would get in our way. We must strike now. We must not hold back and strike while they are in strife. From what we can tell, that Emperor or whatever he is, is in control of a lot that is going on. His actions has caused the galaxy to go into chaos. Yes, I say that we go after them now. Why are we waiting? The Emperor and when the Yuuz and Von left their galaxy, how long their voyage took, or if they even knew what their destination would be, was unknown. At least one account spoke of their journey taking at least several millennia. However, within the next 40 years or so, one of the oldest worldships, old enough to be dying, and considered to be ancient, would be less than 1,000 years old. It would appear that 4,000 years before the current time, it was some time after Ixacum became the new Dark Lord of the Sith, the Praetorite Vong Slivalith probe creatures had arrived, and a few years after that, at least one scout had reached the wild space region of the known galaxy. In that year, a group of Mandalorian Neo-Crusaders under the command of Kandarus Ordo, encountered what would later come to be known as a Yorick Stronger, disguised as an asteroid in the Crispin system, while chasing a group of pirates in the system's asteroid belt. When Ordo used a thermal generator to melt the frozen methane covering the asteroid the Yorick Stronger, in Ordo's words, woke up. The asteroid began to spin quickly, and then proceeded to fire plasma at the Mandalorians. The extragalactic weaponry was able to melt through the Mandalorians' armor like wax. The attack on the Mandalorians became the first contact with the known galaxy. The probe fled soon after the brief battle with Ordo's Mandalorians. Ordo followed in hot pursuit, but was unable to keep up with the probe. The Mandalorians were able to track the probe's hyperspace wake to the edge of the galaxy, where the Neo-Crusaders turned back, apparently thinking that the mysterious ship was going on a suicide run into the Great Void outside the galaxy. Also in this general time frame, a female Shaper arrived in the galaxy in suspended animation, crashing on Lord and surviving there for several decades, interacting with locals who believed her to be a demon. Between 200 to 90 years prior to now, the living planet Zanama Seket, a seed of U.S. Hunter, arrived in the Gardaji Rift. 
Then in the year just before the invasion of Nabu, a Yuuzhan Vong was captured and ended up in Kog Hive 7, a prison colony wherein deadly gladiatorial matches regularly took place between inmates. The Yuuzhan Vong, who had already killed two fellow inmates in transit to the colony, quickly emerged as the station's most recent champion. For six months, the warrior systematically defeated every opponent pitted against the Yuuzhan Vong, until the champion was matched with Sith Lord Darth Maul, who was on an undercover mission on Cog Hive 7. After a brutal fight, Maul killed the warrior. As the Yuuzhan Vong had only spoken in the species' native language, the colony's systems had failed to classify its species, point of origin, or even gender, although some of the guards suspected that the individual was a female. After this, at the time of the invasion of Nabu, an advanced force of Yuuzhan Vong, termed far out Sidus by the planet's inhabitants, discovered Zanama, and noting the similarity to Yuuz Hunter, though not drawing the connection, attempted to colonize it. However, when the Yuuzhan Vong attempted to settle, Zanama's second biosphere killed off the Yuuzhan Vong flora and fauna, provoking them. Although Seket attempted to negotiate with them, they began an assault upon the planet. After two years of costly fighting, the assault was called off with the arrival of the Jedi Knight Virgu, who convinced the Yuuzhan Vong to leave on the condition that she would travel with them. This is where Anakin came in with Obi-Wan of the time and settled things there. But Anakin was of course the one to stay and help out with whatever happened there. Specifically with what happened to the company under Wraith Sienna. With their treachery out in the open, Anakin decided to swallow them whole under the Emperor and Skywalker Industries. They were no more and more specifically, those that were involved were killed off. Anakin didn't like that they went against him, and while murder may seem extreme, their punishments were justified by what they did and would have done. The Galactic Republic received only shadowy news at the attack even after Obi-Wan and Anakin went to investigate Verge's disappearance. All that they discovered was that an unknown race of biotech-based aliens from a distant place, and armed with weapons that the planet's inhabitants had never seen before, had attacked the world. Of course, Anakin knew what they were. Three years after this, after learning of Zanama Seket, Supreme Overlord Quarial's determination to invade began to waver. The Yuuzhan Vong soon learned that Zanama Seket was no longer in its original system, and there was no evidence that it had been destroyed. Worried about the threat presented by the powerful planetary entity, he announced to his people that it would be best to move on to another galaxy. However, Shimra Jaman, under the influence of a Nimi and with the support of some of the more aggressive domains, launched a coup, murdered Quarial and took his place, ensuring that the invasion would go forth as planned. But it would still be some time before they were ready. Information of Yuuz and Vong activity within the galaxy for the next few decades is scarce. It is known that at the start of the outbound flight project, Palpatine had somehow gained knowledge of the incoming Yuuz and Vong fleet though he planned to withhold it from the Republic until after his new order could be instituted. At least one of his subordinates, Kinman Doriana, was informed, however. The distant threat of invasion was also part of the reason Palpatine ordered the destruction of outbound flight in order to prevent its occupants from falling into the hands of the Yuuz and Vong, and also to eliminate six Jedi Masters and twelve Jedi Knights. Palpatine had already been pushing out some news of all kinds in relation to this potential invading force. Palpatine had a lot of worries himself, as he needed to prepare himself for the coming invasion. Anakin may have saved the people from the ship and those on the outbound project, however Palpatine was still able to find things out. Not only that, he was able to keep things to himself as well. Thankfully Anakin had been collecting as much information as he could, and used the outbound project as another chance to see more into the Yuuzhan Vong. One of Palpatine's official justifications for maintaining the Imperial Navy even after the war had ended was to ward off the threat of extragalactic invasion. Of course, there was also the massive civil war happening right now. But this fact that he would say this so openly and make sure it is known meant something. Palpatine was preparing and afraid of this attack, he would probably make mistakes. It was also around this time that another small advance force of Yuuz and Vong engaged the Chiss Expansionary Defense Force on the edge of the Chiss Ascendancy. Although the Chiss Admiral Aralani managed to defeat them, the Yuuz and Vong fought much better than the Chiss had believed such a small fleet was capable of. The appearance of the outbound flight shortly afterwards led the CEDF High Command to wonder for a short time if the invaders and the Republic were allies. Sometime between the start of the Clone Wars and up to five years before, it was speculated by some Chiss that the Yuuzhan Vong had made a pact with the Vagari against the Chiss. 
Anakin had been keeping up with the galaxy at large, and even had things connected to every inch of the galaxy. He may have very spread out products to act as his go in between everything he would need, and this is partially the reason he needed Siri to take some work off of him. He was splitting his mind many places at once, and it wasn't exactly helping that he wasn't increasing the amount of extra thought processes he had access to. He was still limited himself, no matter how many changes he has done to himself through the Force, or through genetic modification, his body was still limited. Every day he is trying and testing to improve his brain, if only by a small percentage of a percentage, just so he could have that one extra thought processor. Information is power Anakin would think this to himself a lot, for it is key that he knows of everything, or at least knows of everything pertaining to the state of the galaxy. Its politics, economies, laws, technological advancements, everything pertaining to what could affect the galaxy. Not only for himself, but for the state of his own emperor, because everything could affect everything, even the metaphorical flap of a butterfly's wing, that would cause a tornado on the other side of the world. In this case, wouldn't it be one small alien creature's flap of the wings on the other side of the galaxy? would create a black hole on the opposite side. The last activity picked up by the Yuz and Vong is their scouts returned dozens of kidnapped sentients to the fleet from the galaxy. Among them were humans, Verpine, and Touts. They were interrogated and experimented upon, with many dying and others being sacrificed. Those who survived, such as Virgie, were rewarded as familiars. Three years before the Clone Wars, the Yuz and Vong also established a small outpost on the planet Bimiel. That was about it for the history regarding the Yuz and Vong slowly making their appearance into the known galaxy. A galaxy that doesn't even notice their presence at all, for all but a few that are in the know of course. In fact, Anakin knew of the fact that the Yuz and Vong scouts were very active during the Clone Wars, and he knew that especially now they were starting to become very active. This showed Anakin the potential of two things, one being that the Yuz and Vong were close to preparing themselves for war, or they were starting to just take advantage of the chaos within the galaxy. Anakin had made sure that his own emperor and his own people are protected against such things, and this is also another reason why he is so focused inwards rather than trying to conquer everything. He knew that if he couldn't even defend his home, then what was the point in trying to bite off more than one could chew? This is why he would only help the Jedi, the independent factions and Dooku along with the Separatists, with only defense within his territories. There was only one way he would fight for them, and that was if they became his people, which was something all of them were against. Not because he was bad or anything, but because they all had their own interests and desires, along with culture, religion and whatever else that got in the way. Anakin had made his position clear, and they all respected that, so Anakin would continue to monitor the Yuz and Vong. And even if they started invading, he knew that sooner or later they would see him and probably hate him. He is kind of a combination between the flesh and the machine himself, so of course they would hate him, and by hating him, they would also hate his empire as well. Only time will tell many, many things were happening in the galaxy. Wars were being started, some old confrontation between long, long deep-seated enemies was playing out between the Jedi and the Sith in this mass civil war. People being greedy and wanting to break away from such a conflict because it could harm themselves or harm their loved ones. Selfish and selfless people were going at it as they tried to reconnect the dots with lines. Selfishness someone thought to themselves, within a dank place, that one could only consider to be of bearable measures or standards for one to survive within. The stone and metal was cold, cold as the deepest darkest pits of space, dark and deep like the darkest of nights. Where am I anyway? There was a person within this room, a place that would be considered a cell. A prison of sorts and this person was locked away within, awaiting whatever judgment is to come. With some small flashes of light created through the prison system now coming online, one would be able to identify this person within. A coward the Viceroy Gunray is, but powerful allies he used to have. A voice was heard somewhere far off from the cell the prison was within. It was Newt Gunray within, while the voices some distance off was speaking about him. Who is the Emperor and Emperor to lock me up here? The Gunray thought to himself. Newt Gunray was a Nemoidian male who served as a stint minister of the Trade Federation until he rose in power after the Stark Hyperspace War 22 years ago, eventually becoming Viceroy of the Trade Federation. It would be 10 years after his succession to power. Gunray participated in the occupation of Naboo with the Federation Army to settle a trade dispute that began in the Galactic Senate. With the help of Darth Sidious, Gunray invaded the planet to end the trade dispute and secured all facilities in the capital of Thede. He attempted to force the incumbent queen of Naboo Padme Amidala to sign a treaty to make his invasion legal. However, she refused, and the siege of Naboo continued. The Trade Federation soon surrendered to Naboo forces following the Battle of Naboo. 
Gunray was taken to the Galactic Republic capital on Coruscant to be charged with acts of war. During the Separatist crisis that following the invasion of Naboo, Gunray confronted former Jedi Master, Count Dooku, who began a Separatist movement that opposed the Republic. Dooku, who secretly was Sidious's Sith apprentice under the name of Darth Tyrannus, helped him through his four trials in the Supreme Court, and soon after the trials, Gunray retained his position as Viceroy. The Trade Federation, under Gunray's command, joined Dooku's Separatist movement, and Gunray was named head of the newly formed Separatist Council, and so formed the Separatist Army. What would have happened was, Gunray, along with Dooku and his master, Sidious, formed a confederacy of independent systems, which opposed the Galactic Republic in a three-year war known as the Clone Wars, that followed after two years of the Separatist crisis. Unfortunately for Gunray, he didn't last as long to reach that state during the Clone Wars, that had also come to an end. Viceroy, well, you aren't really the Viceroy now are you? A voice woke the Nemoidian up from his slumber. Who are you? What do you want? Newt exclaimed as he struggled to make out the person in front of his cell, but he was at least able to identify the person as a female human. Leave me alone I have nothing you would want. You have lost that ambitious and voracious desire to be above others. How pathetic, the female human said, stepping closer into the light to further show that she was wearing some rather elaborate clothing. Newt Gunray was born on Nemoidia, and like all Nemoidians, was brought up in the communal hive until the age of seven. At which point, he and the other grubs were deliberately forced to compete for limited supplies of food, a system designed to weed out the weak, while the most acquisitive thrived by hoarding more than they could eat. Of them, Gunray was one of the most successful. Gunray remembered what Darth Sidious had once said to him about his early life. I realize that your voracious desires stem from the cruel conditions of your upbringing. You and your fellow grubs in ruthless competition for limited supplies of fungus. But I understand. We are all shaped by our infantile desires. A longing for affection and attention, our fears of death. And judging by how far you have come, it's clear that you were unrivaled and continue to be. You don't know what you are talking about. Newt said back to the woman. I think I do. I have read up on the information Arnie allowed me to view which was pretty much everything on you. The woman said the nickname Arnie with a strange tone that Newt would not be unable to displace. W who are you? He had to know. Stepping into the light, the woman made herself know. It was Padme Amidala Naberi. Recognize me. W why are you here? Why D did you come? Did your husband Newt said the word husband with a seething tone? Send you here to deal with me. Gunray was extremely brought to his limits, both physically, mentally and potentially spiritually as well. No. I requested Arnie to allow me to deal with you myself. Padme replied as she leaned in, looking at the dying and decaying Newt Gunray, former Viceroy of the Destroyed Trade Federation. Requested. Yes. Requested. I went on a little trip with Arnie, and have learned some things with him there. Of course, most of what I discovered was about myself and my choices. Why I would do certain things and things that I would do again and again, if given the same choice over and over again. Padme seemed to reminisce about something. Something that Newt Gunray didn't seem to like as it sounded a little ominous. Ugly what do you mean? You see there is a balance to be maintained within the Force, and because of this balance everything works. Once becoming Force sensitive and learning more and more about the Force, more about Anakin and his role to play, and then the trip we went on. Let's just say that I have discovered a lot and that's it. Padme replied. My decisions could have brought the entire Galactic Republic to fall, but at the same time it would have very little impact as well. My decisions within another lifetime may have doomed the Republic, slowed its destruction, completely destroyed, or a whole list of things that may have happened, instead of what is going on now. Padme was monologuing. I am a creature that is selfish, whilst at the same time trying to be selfless. It is a contradiction, one that isn't exactly bad. Padme looked at Newt Gunray a little more before she opened the cell. Are you what are you doing Newt was fearing for his life now, as Padme didn't seem to be coming at him with the nicest of intentions. In fact, there was this veil of darkness that seemed to be around her, coming out of her and swelling around, creating this feeling of helplessness. Like it, I learned this one from Arnie. Padme stopped. In fact, I learned everything about the Force from Arnie. She started to lift her arm and made a grasping motion. Lifting Newt Gunray off of the ground, no one would be disturbing her right now, as she was getting her revenge. She held a grudge against the Trade Federation, against the Viceroy Newt Gunray himself, and now she has the chance to kill him once and for all. Some may even say it is a blessing dying here and now, because Gunray most certainly had to suffer within this prison. That was not like the normal prisons meant for rehabilitation within the Emperor. Stop Newt was struggling, grasping at his neck as he struggled to breath. E place he ace. Padme would have none of it however, and would instead continue to slowly increase the pressure. 
She had learnt some techniques from Anakin, especially in the regards of utilizing the emotions of the one she is killing to empower herself. She needed her own training as well, and where better to start than a person she absolutely despised. A thumping sound was heard. It resounded across the multiple rooms, cells within this prison place, and it was quite loud as well. Everyone within heard it, and scared of what this might entail, they didn't try to do anything. Looking at the corpse of the gunray, Padme had this strange look in her eye. I thought I would feel a bit bad she did get around the block, but most of the people she has killed before was non-personal and detached. This time, however, it should have affected her a little bit, and Anakin's words resounded within her head in this instance. Revenge is a powerful motivator. However, once the revenge is settled, one is usually left with emptiness I don't feel empty per se. But that is probably because I have fullness from Arnie's feelings, and my for him. Padme thought to herself, come and clean this up. I should get back to home now. Padme ordered some guards, whilst also thinking to herself, can't leave Arnie hanging now. It is my turn to be with him T-O-N-I-G-H-T tilde she giggled to herself as she was leaving, which unnerved the guards and prisoners alike. They most certainly didn't want to get on Padme's bad side. Are you going to talk to me now? Like properly, Anakin said towards a female. A particular female with very beautiful, pure-looking looks, green hair and green eyes. The woman, Eve, just glared at Anakin in a show of defiance. Why one may ask. Eve was a selfless being who cared greatly for her family, particularly her father. She was very concerned for the father's failing health, and looked after him when he was injured by the son. In her greatest show of loyalty and love, Eve would have even threw herself in front of the dagger, meant to kill the father, sacrificing herself to save him. This didn't happen however, because the son would die due to Anakin, the father would die due to his age, and the daughter Eve would be left to live because of Anakin. Despite their natures as polar opposites, Eve also loved her brother, the son pleading with him to stop his efforts to unbalance the force and escape Mortis, and asking her father, even as she died, not to hate the son. It has been two years now, or at least it has been perceived as such, Anakin continued to try and talk amiably with Eve, but she wouldn't stop glaring at him. She seemed to think it was his fault for what had happened even if this was kind of the way things were meant to be. It may have seemed like two years, however I assure you that it meant nothing to me. Eve finally replied, if only to be against him. Eve was also a very compassionate woman empathizing with the struggles of the stranded Jedi. She tried to help them as soon as they arrived by taking them to her father, although she later participated in kidnapping Ahsoka and Padme as part of the father's test. Eve's compassion would have also been shown exceptionally in her final moments. She used the last yoda of power in her body to heal Ahsoka Tano, and died content that she had saved her. This time she didn't get that chance. I won't apologize for what happened, Anakin said, implying things that Eve immediately understood. Oh, and what was supposed to happen then? Eve had a sudden outburst, specifically throwing herself at Anakin in some weird attempt to harm him. However, she just managed to land herself in a rather strange position, with herself on top of him and Anakin on the bottom. I didn't take you for a top woman, and what is that supposed to mean? Eve didn't get up straight away, and instead preferred to stay in this position. Not that she would say this of course, and she was also kind of oblivious to things to do with things that relate to the baser needs. I am sure you could figure that out some other time. Anakin replied as Eve finally decided to get up off of Anakin. Whatever. I don't want to talk with you anymore. Your daily talking limit has been reached. Eve said, still not over what had happened despite also being the one to foresee that she and Anakin had some kind of future together back on Mortis before everything went. Look, I know what happened is devastating and all. However, I would appreciate it if you gave me some sort of chance. You were the one to foresee this happening, and it isn't like I can take this back. Whatever happened disabled me from being able to block the connection as well, and now we are stuck with each other. Anakin said as he looked into Eve's eyes. I guess Emperor. The Yuz and Vong are starting to make a move, but they are not starting with the Emperor's territories. Instead, they are going after the Splintered Galactic Republic. Grievous reported to Anakin. Technically, Anakin never needed people to report to him. But again being social is important when you are in a position like Anakin's. His wives may not need to be like this. Because they don't really need to do anything because it is Anakin that is in charge. Going after the Splintered Republic is smart. They are opportunists. Someone else said this. One of the various elected representatives within the Emperor, a council was being held, where everyone gathers together to decide the direction of what happens next. Yes, 
I agree. What we should be doing is reinforcing our own spatial borders, so that those beings don't come after us. Someone else said, That is why I have decided to make sure that the Emperor is a very defensive empire. Anakin interjected, Your foresight is amazing, my Emperor. Another person bootlicked, because of course what Anakin had done was good and all, but they still would have bootlicked even if he made a bad decision. Unlike Palpatine, whom would wait to inform the Republic of the Yuuzhan Vong threat, Anakin had been doing so for a few years now. Why wouldn't he do so? It was better that people knew of things to come earlier, so that they may prepare earlier for it. The way Palpatine had handled this situation was not a way that Anakin would handle it, as there was a lot at stake when it came down to it. If Palpatine had actually won and survived for a long enough time, then he would most probably lose to the Yuuzhan Vong. There is no need to talk about my foresight. What we should be discussing is what has been happening within the Emperor and territories. The economy and military is relatively stable, now that we have grown independence. Anakin said, Yes, my Emperor. There has been progress of most epic proportions. Someone replied, Now that things had escalated to this point, the Emperor was able to expand some more, specifically into the sector housing the Kaminan species. Anakin's somewhat perfect species to use them for the scientific realm of things. With everything splintered now, this made it especially easy for Anakin and the Emperor to make a move on this sector, and all of the star systems within. The first one to become under the Emperor was Varistad, a small mining planet located in the Varistad system within the Abrian sector of the Outer Rim territories. Since the planet had no atmosphere, all of the inhabitants lived in a large habitation dome, owned by a rival of Offworld Mining Corporation. When the dome was compromised by Jemba the Hutt, over 250,000 people were killed. The company mining the planet went bankrupt, and the mining rights were cheaply obtained by Offworld. Varistad would become another planet supplying minerals and stuff like that. Next is Maleva, a backwater, desert world in the Outer Rim territories, with a number of seedy spaceports and low-income moisture farms. It was inhabited by beings of various species, but especially by the native Malavran race. Maleva for all its downsides also had some upsides, specifically in that it would now become somewhat of Tatooine 2.0. Specifically it would be a planet that created energy, and large amounts of energy, due to its star, or sun. After this was the next planet of Galpos 2, a desolate planet in the Abrian sector of the Outer Rim territories. It was suspected to be a base for pirate groups operating in the sector. The Emperor would turn this into a planet that would become another training ground, or academy of sorts for those interested in positions within the military. Next was a relatively important place, or at least it would have been important without the interference from Anakin. Scarif was a remote, tropical planet in the Abrian sector of the Outer Rim territories. Although a small and idyllic world, Scarif played an important part in the Galactic Empire's military-industrial complex, becoming a center for top-secret research beyond inspection distance of the prying eyes of the Imperial Senate. Among the projects stored here was the Death Star Battle Station, a construction so important the entire planet was covered by a planetary deflector shield that could only be entered via a shield gate, a Golan M3185 space station. Scarif was a verdant, beautiful if relatively small world, measuring just over 9,000 kilometers in diameter. It had a remote and isolated galactic location in the Abrian sector of the southeast Outer Rim territories. A deep blue world speckled with clouds, Scarif was comprised of tropical, volcanic island chains rising from clear, shallow oceans. Deeper oceans teeming with life were surrounded by rocky archipelagos. The planet's mantle was filled with dense metals that became valuable in starship construction. However, now it would be under Anakin's control, and he would also repurpose it into something else. Something similar to what Palpatine had planned out, but he wasn't using as a massive machine of death and destruction. Well, maybe it would be similar in that aspect as well. Since this planet was to be the place the official reconstruction for the Star Forge was going to take place. Within a few months on average, it should be complete. After the Star Forge, it wouldn't lose its purpose, and would instead become a place to create or manufacture technology. Tatooine was already starting to reach its limits, so another planet dedicated to the creation of tech would be of importance. Next was another important place, which was of very, very important status. Yukio was a well-known agriworld in the Yukio system of the Abrian sector, and the homeworld of the Yukians. It served as one of the top producers of foodstuffs for the Core Worlds. Anakin had a few planets already that could be considered agriworlds, but with this under his control, he would be hitting Palpatine hard. Their food supplies would be lowered, but it would also affect the rest of the galaxy as well. That was fine because Anakin and those working within the various sectors would also be able to regulate this properly. Anakin didn't like the idea of using the Emperor's resources to make innocent people suffer, 
which they were unfortunately under Palpatine. He knew however that this was probably the best option when it comes to restricting Palpatine. Not just that however, is the next step is to stop the Yuz and Vong from being able to take resources from them. Next was Kamino, called Big Stormy by some clone troopers, also known as the Planet of Storms, was an aquatic planet located in a remote star system in wild space, beyond the Outer Rim, and was straggled south of the Rishi Maze, a dwarf satellite galaxy. Due to its position past the rim of the galaxy, it was sometimes regarded as extragalactic. It was inhabited by a race of tall, elegant beings called the Kaminans, and the capital world of the ruling council, headed by the Prime Minister. Kaminans kept to themselves and were known for their cloning technology, and for the creation of a clone army for the Galactic Republic. Instead of cloning, they would be working for Anakin exclusively, specifically in the creation of his sense, special organ implants and other things like their current clones being grown. Instead of them going to the Republic turned Empire, they would come under the Emperor instead. Clones, covert technology, fish, military weapons and hardware. Things that the Emperor would no doubt benefit from. Next was Rishi, a tropical planet in the Rishi system which was located in the Outer Rim territories. The planet was the homeworld of the avian Rishi. Rishi was a planet located in the Abrian sector of the Outer Rim territories, along the Manda Merchant Route. It was also the end point of the only well-traveled hyperlane into the Rishi maze, the Zarika String. Rishi was the homeworld of the Rishi, a winged species, who lived in nests on the mountains of Rishi. In addition to the lush tropical terrain, Rishi's surface featured mountains, valleys, and swamps. Human and alien colonists lived in the deep valleys, while the Rishi lived in the high mountains. The planet was known for its rich fossil fuel resources, especially Exonium. This just meant more resources for the Emperor. Second to last on the list was Garbon, the homeworld of the Genet species, and the fourth planet in the Talsaker system. It was located in the Abrian sector of the Outer Rim territories, in the region between the Polinian trade route and Corellian run, known as the Slice. Many Genet community heaps were spread around the temperate world, that collected scavenged materials such as discarded food, tools, and household items. They were administered by the Genet's government. The planet was riddled with profitable mines. The planet was not part of the Galactic Republic, but was part of the Galactic Empire, under which the Genet were forced into the ore mines as slaves. Anakin says no to slavery, so that would not be happening, especially since they are not under anyone until they came under the Emperor. The last planet within the Abrian Sector is Hishim, a planet covered by a vast desert located in the Abrian Sector of the Outer Rim Territories. It would have been the site of an Imperial patrol station during the Thrawn Crisis. So, Hishim would also be turned into a patrol station, but instead of an Imperial station, it would be an Emperor station. Not every planet could have something extracted from them and used for something else. It was impossible to find every planet useful to oneself without having to take a lose to their development. The is the end of the report. The reporting official said as everyone went over all of this new information, and how it may better the Emperor's current state of being. If that is all, you are all dismissed. Anakin stood up as he left the throne room and went in another direction within. The officials, representatives and various other people, along with Grievous, also left as well. Getting back to other things within their lives, as they don't spend the entirety of their lives just dedicated to the Emperor, as they have families and stuff like that. So, you wanted to see me? Anakin asked as he nonchalantly stayed seated within his bedroom. Specifically he was sitting in a meditative position as once again, Ahsoka had come in to learn from him, but he knew better. Yeah, so when is it that we can start you know? Ahsoka seemed hesitant to say something that was on her mind despite being the very same person to arrange this meetup. I know. What? You want to be in a relationship now. You can't even wait a few weeks from now until I would consider you of age. Anakin replied, asking Ahsoka in turn what she thought about the situation. You're right. I am impatient. Ahsoka rolled her eyes as she got closer and took a seat herself. But instead on the opposite side of Anakin, she sat down right next to him. What are you doing now? Anakin asks, his eyes still closed. But he had a vague idea of what Ahsoka would do next. She hugged him, which would be disturbing if he actually needed to be calm to meditate. This is what I'm doing. Are you going to stop me? Ahsoka asked in return, her voice filled with mirth. Why would I stop you? You aren't going to do anything inappropriate, are you? Anakin replied, asking a question of his own. I inappropriate. Who do you take me for? I am not Shark. I am most certainly not like her, wanting to do things all of the time. Ahsoka said, still embracing Anakin. And how do you know that? Anakin asks. What do you mean? I most definitely wasn't doing anything like watching or listening, or anything else like that. Ahsoka put on an innocent looking expression. Yeah, 
I am sure you didn't do something like that. If Anakin had his eyes open, he would roll them. Patience is all I am going to say. Patience is key here, as you have waited years now. So what would a few more weeks be like? Anakin continued. I guess. How do you feel? Eve asked. All right. In a few months now, I might feel even better than I do now. Isla replied as she rubbed her belly. Being pregnant, stuck pregnant within Mortis wasn't exactly my plan, or anyone's plan really. I bet. Ahsoka interjected. The girls didn't spend all of their time with Anakin, and would sometimes be around each other. They had to get used to this if they wanted to be with Anakin, be with Anakin as not only he wanted it, but because of the diet. The multiple diets he has connected with all of them. You bet? Isla asked Ahsoka, whom seemed to be a bit snippy today. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Ahsoka seemed about ready to explode. Sky Guy rejected me once again. And here, I had thought he would indulge me. Ahsoka pouted here. Too bad for you. Barris had a mock-mocking expression on her face as she made herself known. Hey, you guys are the lucky ones. I only wish I was born earlier, Ahsoka replied. Why do you want to get together with him so soon? You cannot a few weeks. You can't change Arnie's mind as well, since he had already decided he didn't want to do so. Padme was also within the room with all of the others. What room specifically? It would be one of the private rooms within the Sky Palace, whereupon many rooms had been made and sometimes even expanded upon. Things didn't stay the same, and change is inevitable. So, with change within the Emperor and its technology, construction techniques, energy methods and all kinds of other things. So too did the palace have to evolve as well. The room the girls were in specifically doubled as both a living room where they could come and go, but also a place that they could eat. A dining room, where they could gather as a family of sorts and bond. It was lavish looking, because of course it is due to the palace being an important place. A place of worship, civil discourse between the Emperor's various vassals, officials and representatives. A place where the Emperor and family lives within, the Emperor, his mother, and his wives, and most hopefully his children as well. Well, I asked Ani if I could start early, but he seems set in the idea that he needs to wait for some reason, Ahsoka explained. I even tried to trick him earlier as well, which was not a success I am assuming. Barris had this cheeky smile on her face as she said this. Yes, Ahsoka replied with gritted teeth, seeing Barris's annoying smirk. I think that is enough teasing her, Barris. Padme, being ever the negotiator tried to dispel the tension within the room. Would you guys quiet down already? I am watching the news. It is so much fun watching all of the struggling. This time it was Xana who made herself known as she was the one watching the news. I don't think it is very nice liking the misfortune of others. Padme said as she looked at her fellow human compatriot, whom is also a dark side user as well just as Padme had discovered she is more in line with. In fact, despite Xana and Padme being different from each other, they could also appreciate each other's perspectives. Padme may be an optimist, but she is also someone willing to get revenge, usually not for herself, but for others. On the other hand there is Xana whom is not an optimist at all, and may very well be a pessimist, not willing to get revenge for others, but entirely for herself. These two were not the opposites of each other, However, they did share a similarity in that they both focused in on the dark side of the Force. Some would say it is also the more passionate side of the Force, and this could be viewed through what Padme is willing to do for Anakin. Miss Forum. I guess it is. However, without these people struggling, they would not be able to advance themselves. They would be unable to see that they need to do something, and without that conflict, they may forever stay as they are and wither away. Xana replied, explaining her thoughts. And where did you learn that? Ilala asked as she came up to Xana, sitting beside her, also tuning into the news. Here and there, some from my previous life, and some from Anakin. Xana replied before continuing. Conflict is the key to change, for without some form of conflict, there is no reason to become better than what you are now. That may be true. However, that doesn't mean with conflict can one achieve peace, Isla responded. That may also be true. However, everyone here and everyone out there are living beings, where we need resources to live. I think Anakin said something about microscopic beings living everywhere that have conflicts of their own without us knowing. Xana replied, it is the same for the false. Eve finally spoke up after a while. Everyone went silent at that as they started and continued watching the news broadcast with the also familiar Sky Industries marketings and labels. Of course this company, the news station was in fact just one of the many subsidiaries of Sky Industries, but that didn't matter much. Most people may worry when someone high up in a governmental body is able to control and manipulate the news that there is some form of corruption. However, it has been made very clear a lot of things. Some things are classified information still, but the public is able to view a lot of things. 
Anakin didn't even hide the Yuuzhan bomb from them, so of course they are also aware of these beings coming as well. Well, this is interesting Shark, being the most silent out of everyone had just walked into the room everyone else was within, excluding herself as she was tired. She slept in for a bit, and now that she is here, she sees that everyone was focused on the news. What is everyone Shark trailed off however, as she was also starting to be taken by the news. Now that the Republic has turned into an empire, under the rule of Emperor Sheev Palpatine, former Supreme Chancellor of the Republic, things have gotten out of control. There has been multiple reports and sightings of the Galactic Empire, trying to reassert its dominance and control over the known galaxy. There has even been reports of the Emperor, Sheev Palpatine, trying to get in touch with whatever rebel factions from with Hut space to try and rally them against the Emperor. Unfortunately for the Galactic Empire, they would not be getting any allies from within Hut space, as the Emperor is currently under lock and key. Our God Emperor has decided that we would support other factions outside of the Emperor, but focus on defense for now. Due to the changes in the political situation, the Emperor economy is really good, especially with being the only true safe place from outsider conflicts. Immigration has been increasing, but the Emperor is able to house them all because of the acquisition of new planets. The last thing to report on is the coming species and faction known as the Yuuzhan Vong. The screen switched to another view, a view of the Yuuzhan Vong terrorizing some local planets, kidnapping people, but also taking over and controlling these planets for their own benefit. They have started to make their move now, and it is only some time off now, until things start to really heat up. This is Cameron Parker, with Sky News. The reporter finished, strapped up, hooked and even kept in place by some devices to restrict his movement, Maul wasn't exactly having the best time. He struggled and struggled and struggled. Even with the force he was unable to break through, and he could only watch in horror as people. Humans that were extremely huge compared to himself or most other species that looked humanoid, started to go to work. He was awake for the entirety of the operation, and there was a reason for this. But Maul didn't know why, and started to gain more and more hate for what was happening to him. He started to hate the person whom had brought him here, Dooku, started to hate the person who had knocked him out, Anakin, and started to hate everyone that within transforming him. He was getting an operation to transform his body into something proper, but something that wouldn't cause pain. No amount of painkillers could be used however, to stop the pain from the operation involved, and would go go to affect the surgery success. In fact, it was even fleshy people doing the operation, for the success heavily relied on using the force as well. This large people were able to easily do things, and use the force at the same time to deal with all of the requirements. Maul tried to engrave the faces of everyone he saw, however he was unable to do so because of the toll his body and mind had gone through on that junkyard planet. Hate, hate, hate. Revenge, revenge, revenge. It would seem that not only the Jedi had to look out, not only Obi-Wan, but also Anakin and Dooku as well. Maul seemed to have developed some strange and complex emotion regarding Anakin, Dooku, the Jedi and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Maul's mind had been twisted, and the first thing the doctors focused on was his body. For without healing the vessel first, what was inside of said vessel would be open to leaving said vessel or prone to infection. Good. All done. The doctor said, and passed off something to someone else, as Maul is in a delirious state. Take him to ICU. Inform the higher-ups, so that they can inform our god emperor that he is ready for the next step. Yes, doctor. The other person nodded and walked outside of the room. After a long while, Maul stayed in bed, restrained because he could do a lot of damage, did a lot of time pass. Or at least for Maul a lot of time had passed since his operation, as it felt both like a long time whilst at the same time passing passing in the blink of an eye, a very bleary and blurred eye, but nonetheless it still passed, and it was then that someone came into the room, as his mind was starting to clear up from its haze. Hello there, a voice spoke, which instantly alerted Maul to the intruder within his room, that had none ever since the surgery. Trying to look over, Maul saw someone's face that he had started to hate. You, I'll kill you, I will have my revenge for keeping me here and experimenting on me. I know that is what you wanted to do to me. Can you feel the pain? It was Anakin, his purple eyes seemingly glowing with power as he looked into the depths of Maul's soul. Pain Maul laughed, laughed out loud, and seemed to be just on the verge of another psychotic break. You have caused me more pain than I have experienced in the time I have spent, isolated on that junkyard heap of a planet. Maul exclaimed and then started to cough. It would seem that I have done that. 
Yes, Anakin didn't deny as he looked more over, specifically where his waist is. I would think that you haven't experienced any pain so far because you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be feeling any pain because your body is healed. So the only thing left is the suffering of the mind. Anakin looked back into Maul's eyes, whose eyes were red, yellow, golden, glowing with hate. Healed, who do you think you are? Maul was about to start using the Force again, and this time he would be successful. The restraints broke loose, leaving Maul to jump up and create some distance between himself and Anakin. What are you going to do? Try and harm the person who has helped you. Anakin knew that Maul was not within an alright state of mind, so he needed to do something. Helped, I doubt it. But now that I am free, I can kill you. Maul jumped at Anakin, who seemed defenseless because he had nothing on him, which is untrue. Anakin stopped Maul, now making physical contact and looked into his eyes once more. You shall be healed. Anakin dived deep into the tortured and broken mind of Maul, pushing, probing and drawing out the chaos within, restricting and recreating order within. Maul may still be someone that could be considered evil even after this. But Anakin would give him a chance. A chance to return to his family. And maybe even a chance to resolve his conflict with the Jedi in some shape or form. Sleep now. For now, there is only light skirmishes taking place within the territories under the control of Palpatine. Nothing like a full-scale invasion or an invasion force at all from Palpatine, as he tries to regather and create an army from barely anything at all. His forces had been stripped from him by others, more specifically stripped from him by the Emperor. Anakin had decided that today is the day that the clones from the Republic may fully reveal themselves now, and choose to live freely within the Emperor if they so desire. In doing this, not only will the clones be free, but any remainder of clones left in the Republic turned Empire would probably abandon it. Palpatine has no control over the clones anymore, so he wouldn't care either way. What he would care about was the affront to his face as Anakin had destroyed his plans for the Galactic Republic as soon as they started. Coughing, a person speaks to Anakin. Sir, are you really sure about this? It was Rex, the person with whom Anakin had put in charge over the clones. They were and are basically all still children even when they are physically adults. And this could be seen within their mentality of wanting to play. Not that adults didn't want to play as well. But it was also the way some clones behaved. I am sure, with you taking to the stage like you were meant to, I would finally be put at ease. There is much within the Emperor and all of the clones can do if they so choose. But I am not forcing you guys to stay. Anakin replied. What will happen? I mean what will happen once I, you know, go on stage and speak out. Rex couldn't help but ask for this is an important event. What happens next could be something big or something small depending on a variety of things. Well, various factors included Palpatine would probably be angry. But it wouldn't change his direction for now. And instead, he would still focus on recouping the Republic into his empire. It would encourage others to seek refuge within the Emperor and to escape the war outside and all of that. Anakin explained. It would show the rest of the now independent systems, along with the Jedi and whoever else that is of importance that you clones are living beings, capable of your own choices and decisions, thus transforming you all, hopefully from indentured slaves to full-on free people. Of course you already have that here on Tatooine, but all of you would most likely be looked down upon anywhere else. Simply because you are a clone, Anakin continued. There may be a place that you guys could thrive on, that being Mandala with all of those Mandalorians. Of course, there isn't exactly a place I would recommend to anyone or even recommend to you guys, the clones, as there is a problem I foresee. Anakin was referring to something Rex didn't seem to understand. What problem? Rex asked, now confused about what problems there would be. Well, I am sure you are all aware of how genetics work and have even gone through some sex education classes I set up right. Anakin inwardly cringed at this, for it wasn't exactly something he wanted to do. But knowing the clones, he would have to be careful if they were not already sterilized by the Kaminans. There could also be mutations that occurred which would allow a few to be able to do things like that. Yes sir, you have allowed us to see that there is more things for myself and my brothers to discover. Rex replied awkwardly, knowing what Anakin was talking about. Then, you must know that all of you start wanting to have a family. The genetics of the situation would pretty much change a lot of things. Staying within the Emperor, things could be better controlled for those of you that are capable. Of course, this should only be for those capable, while everyone else can still do whatever you want. Anakin replied, right anyway, I think I can do it now. Rex finally said, really, doing this isn't exactly dangerous. But it would expose you and the clones to the galaxy at large. Some may even resent you guys for coming to the Emperor, or resent me, but I am okay with that. 
The problem is whether you guys are ready for whatever backlash there may be from the leftover people from the Republic, and even those within the Galactic Empire. Anakin replied, Yes, I am sure. Rex nodded his head in confirmation. Anakin didn't say anything else and let Rex go and do his thing. Specifically, he would be going towards a broadcasting station within the Emperor, announce himself, create a situation where he could be interviewed by anyone, whether that be reporters from Anakin's, Skywalker Industries subsidiary or someone else within the entertainment business doing news. In the end, it didn't matter who and only exposure mattered for this would be going out to everyone within the galaxy. Even the Yuz and Vong, as hateful towards technology, machine-based technology as they may be, would even know of this. In fact, Anakin is taking a small risk here. However, because of his current political and economical power, others would be forced to rely on him, just as people were forced to rely on the Republic before. There would probably some small outrage, but not from Anakin's people, but instead for those that are outside of his domain. Anakin returned to Sky Palace and had decided to watch everything from home, as he had no need to go out and do things, other than just watch what happened. He would also be looking out for the response from others, and more specifically he had also given Rex some rehearsed lines to say as well. Rex could say whatever he wanted as long as he said some other things as well to better promote the Emperor, but also because he wanted those in higher positions to see the Emperor as someone that wouldn't get involved in the Civil War. If Anakin or Emperor started to make moves, people would be suspicious of what he wanted to do. They could see it as a threat, and people may very well create a defensive pact against the Emperor, where he would be against everyone else outside of the Emperor. It was a problem that Anakin took into account and relied on Rex to perfectly create a situation where people would see the Emperor as strong enough to defend itself but not have the ability to take advantage of the situation. People were desperate, and desperate people are not the best to get along with in situations like this. Security and stability are important in times like this, so a lot of people would be coming to the Emperor in exactly for that. Hello everyone, Rex appeared on screen and started. My name used to be CT7567, and now I go by the name Rex. I am a clone, and this is my story. You didn't tell us this important and vital piece of information. Jedi Master Mundi, along with a lot of other high-ranking Jedi members, walked into the throne room. Anakin wasn't doing anything except going through the system, since he had a little bit of work to do. But he was also here, because he knew Rex would bring the attention of the Jedi onto himself. He had after all quite possibly harmed the Jedi and the Republic with his hostile takeover of their troops and their war against the Separatists. Vital piece of information. Anakin raised an eyebrow as the Jedi barged into his throne room, even if he knew they were coming because of Rex, they should have at least shown some level of respect. He had after all saved their lives, or more importantly gave them a place to stay safe for a while, as they tried to deal with Palpatine. Yes, you taking the clones from the Republic has doomed us all. Do you not understand the severity of your actions? It would seem that Mundy was mad, but going off of the looks from other Jedi within, he assumed they were mad as well. My actions? I am afraid I disliked what the Jedi and Republic had done at creating indentured slaves for themselves. Anakin replied calmly. Really you also compare them to how the Jedi work don't you? Mundy exclaimed. There was no one else within the throne room of importance other than Mundy along with other high ranking Jedi. No other council members. And this is when Anakin was surprised as he thought he could be confronted by everyone. But instead he was only confronted by the more zealous bunch of the Jedi. I would. The Jedi, all of you are kind of like indentured slaves as well. You just do not realize it. And even if you were free from the Jedi, you would all still be slaves to the Force and its will. You are foolish for coming here like this. Anakin replied. Foolish. Do we look like we care about any of that? We have seen what goes on in that academy of yours. And have seen all of the evil you are doing. You cannot fool us. Mundy still continued to shout aloud to make sure he was heard by everyone, specifically so he could rally all of the Jedi that he had brought along with him as he had a plan. A plan that involved multiple Jedi facing off against Anakin. How am I evil? What have you seen that would go against what you believe in? Anakin asked, knowing full well what may be irking them all. Are you playing dumb? Ignorant to the things happening with that academy of yours? Are you really the chosen one? Jedi Master Kwai gone no. He isn't a Jedi anymore. Qui-Gon Jim believed you to be the Chosen One, and so too did the others as well. However I am now certain that you are not. Mundy replied, igniting his lightsaber in preparation for what is to come next. Everyone was reaching their limit for how much talking they wanted to do, 
and Mundy didn't exactly come here to talk. Do you not know what the Chosen One prophecy is all about? Have you not heard about the variations of such a prophecy as well? Anakin asked, getting up from his seat as he knew that this would probably not end well. How about we go outside instead? I don't want to be damaging anything within here. Not that Anakin could really use the Force what with the sands of time interacting with his body, and further messing with his ability to use the Force. It is both a boon and a negative, because even though he doesn't lose the ability to use the Force, his very overpowered abilities to destroy planets using the Force alone, is tempered with the sands of time. Control is one thing, but if his energy field continued to grow without some measure against it, he didn't want to be unable to touch his lovers and family anymore. Damage. You are worried about the harm that would come to your precious assets more so than the damage done to those whom are innocent. Your actions has condemned many. Someone other than Mundi exclaimed from behind Mundi, and this lead to all of the other Jedi within also chiming in themselves. And so have the actions of the Jedi as well. Let's not play the blame it game anymore. Let us finish this here then. Anakin was still extremely powerful, and no one here would be able to even directly mess with him through the Force, exclaiming their agreement with this person's words. Surrender now, or die as the Sith you are. Mundy said the final words. Everyone else started to ignite their lightsabers, as if they already knew what Anakin's answer would have been, or is going to be. I refuse to surrender, and I also refuse to die. Anakin started to emit an energy around himself that started to shift and transform into lightning. Pure electricity started to surge, and it cloaked him before B sent a mental command to Siri 2. Let's go down. Anakin said aloud as he looked at everyone. The lights went off and the floor below everyone opened up, making everyone drop down. A few of us are missing. Mace said to all of the High Council members of the Jedi, within the temporary room set up by the Emperor and for their discussions. Does anyone know where Master Mundy has gone to? Mace asked. No. Some of the remaining High Council members said no, and some of them answered Mace's question with a shaking of their heads. Master Mundy, be here he should. Yoda replied. Has no one watched the news here? I saw that the clones from the Republic were in fact taken here by the Emperor. It was Master Plo Koon who interjected here and gave yet another piece of information for their proceedings today. Most of the Jedi had settled into the Emperor Academy, slowly being influenced by the ideals, culture and knowledge within. Surely there would be more and more Jedi converting into Emperor and civilians and learning from the Academy, due to proximity being no problem anymore. There is also the fact that the Jedi's influence is now reaching its minimal phase. No matter what rank of Jedi you were, here, within the Emperor and Temple or Academy, there is only so much for one to do. They could see the differences in treatment even when they also saw that there are students also learning the dark side of the Force as well. Something that they had learned to be evil by nature. Heard of this I have. Many others also agreed with Yoda that they had heard about this piece of news. So much so did this shock them that some Jedi Knights were sent out to investigate just what was going on. Specifically some Jedi had gone over towards some places to get information on where the clones were so that they could question them. At this point there was no point trying to force the clones to do anything, and they would also be able to discover the massive grand plot behind what Palpatine wanted to do. Of course, by having the biochips exposed, Palpatine should be in some deep water by now, but that is not the case. In fact, it pretty much increased the loyalty of those under him, the fear and the respect towards him. This may have been a bad move on Anakin's part, because it incentivized people to not disobey Palpatine. But at the same time, this was also cancelled out by the fact that the clones were able to escape in the first place. A lot of things is going on, and because of this ever factor needed to be taken into account. Whether this be positive and negative as everything could change at a moment's notice. Master Kenobi, you have arrived, Deepa Balaba said as she stood up, along with the rest of the Jedi High Council as well. Everyone had left Obi-Wan behind because they needed to escape. But now that he is actually here, that only meant he had completed what he said he was going to do. Yes. Masters, I bring some rather pressing news on what has happened. Well, what is it then? Mace questioned Obi-Wan. The Sith Lord, Darth Sidious, wanted some of the Jedi younglings. But also not only that, there are more of them. More Sith. Obi-Wan reported his discoveries, leaving out the woman that had come along and helped him save those younglings. More Sith. Tell us more. Mace said and got Obi-Wan to tell them more about his encounter. It was at this point that Obi-Wan started to divulge everything that had happened, even going so far to tell them about Jar Jar Binks and Ferris Olin. Two well-respected people within the Jedi, and one within the Republic. It was something shocking, but going by the events taking place across the galaxy, this was certainly not the biggest or most surprising thing to happen. Some of the Jedi within were of course against the idea that a respected Jedi like Ferus 
would become a Sith, especially since he had left the Order a long time ago. Becoming a Sith couldn't possibly be the reason for him leaving, and the High Council is correct in assuming that. Ferris had left because of the Jedi, and because of Anakin. This is a complicated topic in on itself, and then there is Jar Jar, with whom some of the Jedi had even met and conversed with. As Senator Jar Jar was, and because of this, the Jedi started to think more and more on the times they had seen Jar Jar standing side by side with Palpatine. It only made them realize this was also probably a part of Palpatine's plan as well. To use and bring Jar Jar over to the duck side of the Force, and none of them could even feel that he was Force-sensitive. Of course, this was mainly because of the Sith Temple underneath the Jedi Temple of Coruscant. However, after that was destroyed, they should have been able to sense Jar Jar at the very least. That was not the case, and instead it was because Palpatine wanted Jar Jar to focus on masking himself and the Force above all else. Palpatine couldn't allow the clumsy idiot known as Jar Jar get in the way of his plans for mass destruction, and then reformation from Republic to an Empire. And that is all, at least that is all for now. From what I have been able to tell there has been no other movements made by Darth Sidious in regards to this. Obi-Wan finished his explanation of everything. It would seem like Jar Jar has an especially powerful hatred for those that have seen his mess-ups. For those who have seen his clumsy little accidents, Deepa Balaba said as she contemplated the situation. Just as all of the other Jedi also contemplated the situation. Sith, more Sith and more. Humming Yoda then continues. Other accounts of Sith, there is. Speak with Count Dooku, we must. Yes. The Count may have some idea of just how many Force Sensitives have been trained under the guiding hand of Darth Sidious. Mace continued, We must also send someone to try and find Master Mundi, as I have a bad feeling about this. Master Mundi is missing. Obi-Wan questioned, surprised that this is happening for he had thought all of the Council members had escaped Coruscant. Yes. I also believe that you should watch the news as well. Mace got up and started to walk away. I will be meeting up with Qui-Gon Jinn, as he is supposedly control of the light side branch of teaching here within the Emperor and Academy. Humming, Yoda also stood up and started to walk away as well, meaning that this meeting is over. Everyone knows that not everyone needed to do something. Sometimes patience is key. However, Obi-Wan was tasked to head over towards and watch the news. The others would be doing their own preparations, for they would be starting to assault Palpatine and his forces. Mace would be staying on Tatooine for a little bit to discuss things with Qui-Gon and Count Dooku. Everyone had their own directions to go towards, and the person that is going to go after Mundi is in fact Yoda. No one else was going to track Mundi down, and Yoda had the faintest of ideas. Just where such a zealous person had gone towards at the news of the clones being a part of the Emperor now. Combine this with the fact that the Emperor practices both light and dark side arts within the Force, the clones had become an excuse for Mundi to go after Anakin. Hope, I do, Master Mundi, does not try. Yoda thought to himself as everyone went their separate ways. Back within Sky Palace, all of the Jedi within the throne room were exposed to something strange. Specifically the floor below them had a strange pattern to it. It looked as it was made up of some sort of metal material that can reshape itself as whatever it wants. It was like the palace in on itself was alive, and they had entered a place that they couldn't stay within. The floor opened up with no hassle, completely disappearing before their eyes, as if their foresight abilities couldn't work here. What is happening? Try and jump back. I can't. Multiple voices were heard as they started to fall into the abyss. But they would all safely land, while above them the light that they still had went completely black as night. There was no way for them to see now, and they could only rely on their lightsabers now, because of the uniqueness of the situation. Where are we, Master Mundi? I think that we should have waited for some more backup. Someone tried to say in the dark, as even though they could barely sense things, they are still able to do so. Usually other Force sensitives near Anakin would have their foresight abilities kind of muffled due to his energy field. However, ever since the sands of time, the energy field no longer affected other Force sensitives like that. It is okay. We will take down the Sith Emperor. Not just the false chosen one, but we will also take down the Sith Emperor back on Coruscant. Steady yourselves and be prepared for the trials to come. Mundi of course responded and needed his current forces to try to remain clown. Looking around, the place they were in was made up of mechanical, alive metal parts. Bits and pieces, and it seemed like this place was truly alive, due to the presence within the force they felt. Something doesn't feel right yeah. It was silent with only the breathing and noise coming from the lightsabers being heard. Everyone is on high alert, awaiting their opponent to show themselves. Be quiet. Mundi didn't want any of them talking aloud and would rather they stay quiet due to trying to sense Anakin. However, no one could sense Anakin even if Anakin was right next to them, they would be unable to sense it. 
This is because of the unique way Anakin had made his nano suit in combination with his very own stealth abilities. You all shouldn't have come. You should have just stayed with the rest of the Jedi. But instead you decided to come after me. Anakin's voice was heard, and everyone was spooked once again. They looked ever which direction it may have come from, as the place they were within didn't exactly have the best acoustics for them to pinpoint Anakin's location. In fact, the Echo, plus darkness and Anakin's ability to manipulate this underground living metal, allowed him to transmit his voice from anywhere he wanted. Thus no one would ever be able to find him if he stayed down here. Not unless they managed to destroy this place that is. But the Jedi here don't need to know that. Show yourself you coward. Mundi exclaimed trying to draw Anakin out of hiding. And so too did the other Jedi that came along. Also start to exclaim expletives to try and draw Anakin out. However it was useless in doing so. But what the Mundi and his Jedi band did not notice, was the fact some of their companions started to disappear. Their numbers were starting to be reduced, one by one. Hey, where did John go? John, I thought I was not seeing Billy. Billy, what happened to Hector, Yassel and Rina? As if realizing something was off, Mundi then exclaimed damn it. Is this how you do things now the Chosen One hiding in the dark? Just as the Sith would, whatever do you mean? Anakin responded, his voice grating on the ears of those still around, as they were especially annoyed if not angered at their comrades just disappearing left, right and center. Not a single noise could be heard, not a single breeze or anything that would indicate to anyone they had been taken out. Come out already, come and face us properly and stop hiding in the dark. Mundi was starting to get desperate now, as at this rate, he would have no Jedi army to back him up. In fact, he hadn't even told anyone he was coming to confront Anakin. So there was no way he would be surviving this encounter, unless he gets lucky someone. Mundi even had to leave all of his wives and children. Not that he actually cared about them or anything. But it is still something extremely distressing. Master Mundi. I think that dash this person voice was cut off however, as if something had taken them which only further served to freak out the rest of those within this place. That is it. Mundi exclaimed again. Start hacking at the walls and let's start running in another direction. There must be a way out of this place. Okay master. Several voice were still there, creating the illusion that there is safety in numbers. While things were happening on Tatooine, the Galactic Empire, under the control she Palpatine, was stockpiling resources and building an army. The Galactic Empire during this short amount of time, had already adapted many other names to call it by. The Old Empire, the First Galactic Empire, Palpatine's New Order, the Imperium or simply the Empire. The Republic, which had lasted for at least 25,031 years, ended following a period of intense political turmoil. All thanks to many factors. From the birth of the Emperor, the political situation within the Galactic Republic itself and the Separatist movement, we stand on the threshold of a new beginning. In order to ensure a security and continuing stability, the Republic will be reorganized into the First Galactic Empire for a safe and secure society, which I assure you will last for 10,000 years. An empire that will continue to be ruled by this august body and a sovereign ruler chosen for life. Palpatine had also gratefully thrown out these words for everyone to hear. Not only those representatives within the Republic of the time, but also towards everyone else possible. Making it known, that truly he is the one ruler, that ruler chosen for life. A quick summary of what influenced Palpatine and his subsequent rise, can be said to have begun with the scheming aspiration of the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, known as his alter ego Senator Palpatine of Naboo. He was inspired by the resurrected Sith Empire, which dominated the galaxy over three millennia earlier. He began manipulating pivotal events, such as instigating the Naboo Crisis, in which he used the Trade Federation, led by Viceroy Newt Gunray as a pawn, to lead Queen Amidala into calling for a vote of no confidence in Supreme Chancellor Finnis Valorum, effectively replacing him, and eventually winning the Battle of Naboo with assistance from the Gungans. When his first apprentice, Darth Maul, was defeated by Obi-Wan Kenobi, Sidious took on the former Jedi Count Dooku as his new apprentice. Then it would be a few years after that, where Dooku then helped found the Confederacy of Independent Systems, with the formation of the Separatist Council, led again by Newt Gunray on Raxus Prime, igniting the Separatist Crisis. Palpatine, at the end of his second term, was allowed to stay in power until the crisis was resolved. This would then lead to the Clone Wars, and as short-lived as it was, it was still more than enough to allow Palpatine to have the necessary power to control the entirety of the Republic and reform it into the Empire. At the beginning of the Clone Wars, Palpatine was an efficient and effective leader, who quickly brought to an end the corruption in the Senate. His authority was greatly increased even more so than at the start of the Separatist Crisis, via acting Senator Jar Jar Binks, while the Senate willingly furnished as they gave more and more emergency powers to him. 
Eventually, the Senate lost most of its power, and became little more than a formality that Palpatine had to go through to pass his laws. Yet the Senate retained some symbolic power, Chancellor Palpatine still hid behind the pomp and circumstance of appealing to the Senate, but his power existed in his control over thousands of senators, that he had brought into his own web of corruption. Truly, Palpatine is a mastermind indeed. After ordering the execution of Dooku, then the replacement and slaughter of the Confederacy of Independent Systems members, Palpatine began the process of converting the Republic into the Empire. How is the army coming along? Palpatine had relocated himself and his esteemed office from the Senate into the Jedi Temple. It gave him the greatest of pleasures to know that the Jedi had been reduced to but a fraction of its former self. He is upset that they still exist, but it was still an achievement for him to have taken them down. Not only that, but he has also managed to have people from within the Republic to see the Jedi as evil as well. One may wonder just what ideas he had used to make people turn on the Jedi, and it is exactly the ideas said by the Chosen One, Anakin Skywalker. I have to thank the Emperor and Emperor sometime for such brilliant arguments against the Jedi. Palpatine chuckled internally. Sir, we have recruited many volunteers, but also have forcefully taken some people and enlisted them as well. It would be a few weeks for them to be trained enough to be capable of combat. A commander had come in and reported to Palpatine, as he is surrounded by his Red Guard. Is that all? Palpatine asked in a menacing tone. No. Of of course not my Emperor. We also have access to many, many droids, and through them we are able to defend ourselves. What resources and droids we have collected from the Separatists, have now become a part of our own forces, plus all of the other droids we have access to. The commander most certainly didn't want to die. That is acceptable. Palpatine thought it over, and what he could be doing with their current numbers. Thankfully, it would seem that the Emperor would not be getting involved with the battling. But what is annoying Palpatine, is that he doesn't have enough allies. Or more specifically he doesn't have enough people willing to listen to him, despite the influence he has. Their economy was also starting to become strained. However, they should be able to survive for now. The Emperor really started to have a massive impact on the Empire Palpatine had formed through sanctions, and becoming a safe haven of sorts for the Jedi. He had found out the leftover and remaining Jedi had escaped to there. I need allies Palpatine started to think hard on who he could pull over to his side. He had already collected a lot of people from all sorts of places, so he could have connections. There is one thing that should be placed above all else, and that is connections. The people you know is more important than the amount of work that he puts in, and Palpatine had a few allies that could join and help him. What he worries about is what they would ask for in return, as he may have a lot of power now, but he has to deal with some rebellions from a few independent factions, some leftover separatists that refuse to come under him, and the Yuz and Vong already making their move. Wait, the Yuz and Vong Palpatine seem to have gotten an idea. You may leave now. Palpatine dismissed the commander, and the commander heaved a sigh of relief for he is now free from Palpatine. Or at least he is free for now, as he could very well still die due to Palpatine. It is no secret that Palpatine isn't exactly the nicest of people, especially now that he had become the emperor of a reformed republic. The Yuuzhan Vong may make an unlikely ally. Palpatine wanted to recruit the Yuuzhan Vong to his cause, but knowing how they were, he knows for sure he would have to be careful. He also doesn't know where they originated from and where exactly they are located. He may have to suffer some losers first, before being able to meet up with the leader or leaders of the Yuuzhan Vong. He may also not want to use droids or machinery, as that could come in the way of his wanting to ally with them to go against the Emperor. In fact I will use droids, but use them by showing the Yuuzhan Vong that their true enemy is the Emperor, and through this, I would be able to take away the resistance against me. Palpatine thought to himself, by distracting the Yuuz and Vong and the Emperor at the same time, Palpatine should be able to do everything he likes before going after the Emperor as well. Of course, Palpatine would have to play his cards right and say promises to the Yuuz and Vong that he doesn't really intend to keep because by then, he would be more powerful than before. The Yuuz and Vong should have waited to increase their army size before getting involved but it would seem that they were getting impatient. That or they saw this as an opportunity to start targeting and claiming star systems for themselves. Palpatine started to laugh maniacally to himself within the Jedi Temple he started to reconstruct in his image. I also think it is time to go after the Sith Temple hidden underneath this place. There is one thing about some of Anakin's lovers, and that is some of them are busybodies. Specifically busybodies in the aspect that Padme wanted to help others, where even Isla and Ahsoka also wish to somehow be involved to help. That passion is great and all, because Barris and Shark also wanted to help as well. They most likely wanted to do this for the Jedi if nothing else. 
which Anakin is fine with. But the way these five girls wanted to help is different from what he was expecting. They were helping the Jedi by making them become a part of the Emperor Academy. This was all Barriss's plan. As the Jedi arrived, they started to try and convert the Jedi into Emperor Academy people, which was in fact a genius move for them. By doing this, they in a way do help the Jedi but at the same time also help Anakin and the Emperor. Then there is Xana along with Eve, the two of ones out. Xana had no interest in the Jedi, while Eve did, but through her teachings was taught not to interact with the mortal world. So, Eve would be doing something as well, specifically she was also teaching within the Emperor Academy. However, she was not teaching the light or dark side, but instead stuff to do with balance, for she is the second most authority when it comes to balance, after Anakin of course. She took on students that was willing to try and balance themselves within the Force, which exposed her to the teachings of Anakin as well. Of course, she didn't need to or have to teach the same material, so she took it into her own hands. All of Anakin's lovers had their own things that they were doing. Padme was taking on a more diplomatic approach, where she best puts her skills, talents, knowledge and passion to full effect. Already, Padme is connecting to all of those within the Emperor and putting in the time and effort to calm down the people. Just as she is a popular ruler within her home planet of Naboo, she too is popular with the people within the Emperor as well. If there is a person that the public looks up to, after Anakin, Shmai, and Vader, then it would no doubt be Padme. There is another person that is special in this situation. That being Xana and her role to play as usually there is no way for some to be able to do some of the darker stuff. Xana holds that position of being able to do the darker stuff within the Emperor. Some necessary evil if you will. And she has taken an active interest in the intelligence agency of the Emperor. So Anakin handed over control of this department to her to handle. Seeing as she enjoys doing stuff like that. Grievous could take a break from controlling the entirety of the military anyway. As Grievous has been tasked with overlooking the huts and hut space. That is right. Grievous is in hut space hunting down criminals, rebellious factions and all sorts of other things. Specifically bringing up and propping up Anakin within the eyes of those within hut space. Building education centers where people would become more educated on why stuff like slavery is bad, and other such things. One doesn't just change people forcefully, but you change them through subversion and small acts of taking over silently. Control their cultural institutions and then start to brainwash people, or just teach them things that would open up their ignorant eyes. Anakin took this idea from the colleges and universities of his previous world, whereby controlling the cultural institutions, along with entertainment, one could direct what people like. Their beliefs and everything like that as well. Something that he had been trying to do was make sure the people didn't see him as a god. That was what he tried to do at first. But now he just used it to better guide the populace. Not control, for no one could control people like that. But he did try and make sure the society that had been created is a positive one. Back within the depths of Sky Palace, or more specifically the technological and mechanical depths of Tatooine, a small group of Jedi Masters, along with Jedi Master Kai Adi Mundi, have made their way through a maze. A maze in place keeping them within a tunnel of horrors. And that horror is Anakin, for he is slowly taking care of the Jedi that had deemed it necessary to come after him. Master Monday, we are missing more and more of us. We had around 20 of us here, and now we are left with 5 people. One of the remaining Jedi within this environment had been keeping count. Of course, if one was taking count of how many people there were and are now, there is also a person keeping an eye on the amount of time that has passed. Also, it has been around half an hour now. All words were exchanged through their normal voices, as it has been proven to them that Anakin could hear them whether they whisper or not. It is unfortunate that they couldn't communicate mentally, or telepathically like Anakin can with his lovers. What are we going to do now? There has been no way to get out, and most certainly there has been no clues as to where we are. We must still be within the Emperor, obviously, and we should also still be on Tatooine as well. I am guessing this place is some sort of special hunting grounds that the Emperor and Emperor has created for himself. And how do you know this? I am just guessing. That's enough. Your speculation is probably wrong. However, we must not dismiss the idea that the dark side can change someone, no matter their willpower or power. Mundy inputted his own opinion on the situation. Everyone went silent at this, and they would continue to move in another direction, coming across a wall and having to continue moving. At this rate they may start to die down here, simply because there is no way out, and a host of other things. Whether that be because of no source of sustenance or because of a lack of water, everyone still down here was a human, excluding Mundy. 
Out of the Jedi that was still alive, there are four humans and Master Mundi being Asarian. Mundi would then use his lightsaber against the wall, trying to burn a hole through this strange metallic structure. Unfortunately, the metallic walls would immediately fix itself after the damage was done, which is something that scared everyone here, because this is most certainly not natural. Just where are we? One of the Jedi was practically pulling their own hair out, with the others not so far out from the same state. You are nowhere special. Anakin's voice was heard as the five of the Jedi had let their guards down for but a moment. Anakin's voice scared them, waking them all to the very real threat of Anakin lurking in the shadows. He had been after all taking the rest of their comrades from them. But the reason their guard had been let down, is that Anakin hadn't been taking any way after a certain point. Of course, they noticed this and tried to sense why or even ask why. But Anakin wouldn't reply. That is because he didn't spend all of his time down here, and had left around the five minute mark to get some lunch. How could he not abuse his position of power now? And when it came to the Jedi, he didn't actually kill them. However, he would make sure to kill the Jedi Master, Kai Adi Mundi for his insolence. The others may escape, but Mundi may not. Will you just show yourself already? Mundi was starting to sound desperate, as if his energy was being sapped from him. The others of course noticed this but didn't put much importance on this and didn't say anything. They knew that keeping a calm and peaceful mind in a confrontation with anyone is of importance. The Jedi taught this is of importance after all, for emotions could affect their judgment. Given the Mundi is above the rest of them however, it is only natural that they don't question his state of mind right now, especially in such tight and confined spaces. The underground of Tatrayan was actually quite complex and different from a sewage system or anything like that. It is a massive network of technology all connecting together to create one massive satellite-esque technology. It is used to boost a lot of connections through the Emperor, and if it is taken out the backup networks and systems would have to take over. Tatooine's underground is considered the main system, with Siri and Anakin in charge of it. Master Mundi, I think trying to lock Skywalker out isn't going to work shut up. What do you know? Mundi seemed to be losing himself somewhat, and this is an effect of Anakin's plan. He wanted to create a reason for him to strike down Mundi, and even though he didn't really need one, he wanted one. Wanted one for the Jedi that is, as he no doubt would have to explain himself, if he strikes down Mundi without some sort of preempt. Of course, coming to kill him should be more than enough. However he wanted there to be no doubt, as he was trying to convert the Jedi into his own Emperor in academics. I think that is enough playing around for now. Anakin's voice all of a sudden sounded out, and the next second bright flashing lights started to assault everyone's senses. Mundi and the other four Jedi were blinded by the distracting lights, and thus the four human Jedi were gone. After coming to his sense, Mundi tried to look around as his retina were blasted with strobe lights. Now that it was no more, he had a short period of struggle in trying to see things. After this struggle, However, he noticed that there was no one else around. Hello. Mundi tried to use every sense available to him. Most of all he also tried using the force as well. Where did everyone go? Mundi is most certainly distressed now, knowing that his allies were now nowhere to be seen. Or sensed at all for that matter. And instead he now had to deal with things by himself. It is just you and me now. Anakin's voice is heard again. But this time it is only directed to the remainder of the Jedi within this metal tomb. Okay. Mundi started to still himself within the Force. But even this is not possible. Because Anakin was making sure that Mundi is not in his right mind. Not that he was in his right mind. But it is better if he records Mundi going crazy and possibly tapping into the dark side unintentionally. Damn it. Mundi exclaimed for trying the Force nothing happened. It was as if the Force had come to a standstill. Where he was unable to use it to look for some sort of answer. He could still use it to empower himself and other things. But trying to seek guidance wasn't going to help him here. Confused, alone and most importantly desperate, Mundi would do anything now. Even resort to using things that he himself would call out for being heretical against the Jedi Code. The dark side of the Force. Some lights turned on, finally exposing Anakin to Mundi, for he wanted to be seen now. Anakin is in his nano suit Jedip. But he strangely enough had no weapon. I knew that you were afraid of the dark, so I decided to turn on some lights. Anakin pointed towards the small lights fixtures placed throughout. It was something conjured by Siri and himself when they wanted. There you are. Finally. Mundi seemed mentally exhausted. However his body is fine enough for him to engage in battle. Just so you know I am recording everything that is happening now. In case my friends the Jedi ask me what happened, and why I decided to dispose of you. Anakin said, Kai Adi Mundi was a Serian male who had white hair, yellow eyes, light skin, and a height of 1.98 meters. He was a logical and methodical Jedi master who was well known for his wisdom, his noble thinking, and his courage. Like other Serians, 
He was highly intelligent due to his binary brain, which allowed him to observe both sides of a situation simultaneously. His wise way of thinking made him an excellent strategist. When Jedi Masters needed advice, they often sought Mundi's opinion. Of course, he is also a psychopath with no regard for the lives of others, especially beings like the clones. Mundi could be said to be the epitome of what a Jedi should strive to be, unfeeling and disconnected from things. I have you now. Mundi's eyes flash the Sith colors of yellow and red for a split second, before jumping towards Anakin and swinging his saber towards him, trying to take his head off presumably. Back with Mace Windu, the esteemed and probably one of the most important members of the Jedi in such times. In war Mace is important because of his experience, power and knowledge within things related to the dark side of the Force. Especially now that the dark side is now more prominent than ever. Master. Qui-Gon Jinn. Mace didn't know how exactly to address Qui-Gon, now that he was not a part of the Order. You may call me however you want. I am no master anymore of course, and instead I am but a humble teacher. Qui-Gon replied as he was approached by Mace. He was not currently taking any classes right now. Thankfully for he also had some things to think upon. He most certainly is not getting on in the years well. And as his body fails him, he is reflecting more and more as his remainder of his life passes him by. Not that he hasn't done a great many and deal of things. It is just he never had a chance to have stuff that normal people would have, and he is reflecting on whether or not his choice to stay with the Jedi was the right one. For now, he is of the mind that his choice was correct for if he didn't stay with them, he wouldn't have met Anakin. Right. I have come to talk more on some things and would like you to come with me when I meet up with Count Dooku. Mace most certainly would like a neutral link between himself and Dooku. Mace also was uncomfortable with getting Anakin, so he instead went to someone he both knew and is somewhat connected to. You wish to see the Count? Qui-Gon is interested. Yes. The Count has some resources, connections, allies, and some droids left over himself. The Jedi are ready to start a counter-attack against the Sith Lord, Darth Sidious. All we need to do now is try and get Dooku to coordinate with us, Mace said. That is a reasonable enough plan. However, I don't think I could do anything. I see no need to have me along. Qui-Gon is a bit hesitant to face his mentor now especially since the two of them are more and more similar now. Qui-Gon knows that Dooku was probably under a lot of stress, and seeing him would probably not help right now. Qui-Gon is but a simple teacher now within the greater scheme of things. Of course his position is quite high, but the Emperor in Academy is not the Jedi, nor the Sith. It is a school. A school that educates Force sensitives properly instead of enlisting them into a life of servitude for the Force. No. I think it would be best to bring you along. Negotiations would be much better. Mace said. Negotiations? Ah Qui-Gon said this to himself as he found a small joke within that sentence. In the end he decided that he would have to face Dooku sometime or another. Okay. I can't guarantee anything though. That is fine. Mace had a serious and contemplative face. I have seen this place. I have sensed this place. I have tried and tried to find flaws in what is being taught here. But even you think it is fine, right? Qui-Gon could see where Mace is coming from. After all he also had his own reservations about what Anakin is doing. The more I see, and the more I sense within the Force. I can't help but feel the harmony and balance here. It is not only the people and residents of the Emperor, but also the students here as well. Mace replied, speaking his thoughts as Mace and Qui-Gon started to walk away from this area, heading towards where Dooku may be. You would be surprised Qui-Gon left this statement off as they continued on their way. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.